Good morning, everybody. Let's see here. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Hey, let's hear it again. Good morning, everybody. That's right. Everybody get excited. It's 8.50 a.m., or as Stanford undergraduates call it, uh, 3 a.m. Um, my name is Alex Stamos. I'm the director of the Stanford Internet Observatory. I'm extremely excited to welcome you to the first, and hopefully not last, uh, annual Trust and Safety Research Conference. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so uh, I'm going to get us kicked off, talk a little bit about why we are here. So the Stanford Internet Observatory uh, is a cross-disciplinary program. We're here to understand and help mitigate the risks caused by modern communication technologies by the internet, um, to understand abuse, uh, and to try to help establish trust and safety as a academic field uh, with something really behind it that uh, lots of, that different disciplines find interesting and relevant, um, and to try to bring people together like we are today. Uh, we do that through research, we do that through policy interventions, and we do that by trying to create a space for academic and industry collaboration um, like this, this space today. Um, one of our theses here is that uh, trust and safety as a field is about 20 years behind information security. Uh, back when I was studying CS at a, a little public school on the other side of the bay, there is no class that undergraduate computer science students could take about security, right? You'd have to take a graduate seminar, you could go to a couple of talks, but security wasn't really seen by real academic CS folks as a real field, right? It was like a, a small little corner of systems, uh, some really weird people who were interested in security. Um, we didn't have the conferences, we didn't have the proceedings. Uh, it was not seen as like a legitimate place to get a PhD. These days, security is one of the absolute hottest parts of computer science. Um, and I feel like we need to have the same kind of transition in trust and safety, but we don't have 15 years, 20 years to pull it off. The incredible harmful things that are happening every day, which we're gonna be talking about over the next two days, really call for us to pull this together um, and to create solutions that are based upon research, that are empirical, um, that are based upon evidence to do that much more quickly than we were able to organize in the information security field. Um, and so that's why we, we have, we're here today. Um, that's why we started a class on this. So we teach a class on trust and safety, actually two classes, one for computer scientists, one for political scientists. Um, we have a journal, the, uh, the, the, on, the Journal of Online Trust and Safety, uh, which is where the uh, a number of talks that you'll see today were published in the journal. So you can go to tsjournal.org to see the proceedings of this conference. And we'd love for all of you to be submitting more and more talks to the journal um, after this. Uh, uh, we both do general issues as well as special editions on really specific topics. Um, and uh, you know, we're just really excited to bring you all together uh, in a physical space and to help people uh, meet each other who have never done so before. Um, so what we're gonna have today, so we're gonna start with a fireside chat, uh, then we'll take a break, and then we're gonna have our first of our panels. Uh, unlike other in, uh, conferences, this is not a panel where a bunch of people sit up there and just say they agree with each other uh, for, for an hour. Um, these are research panels. You'll hear from a variety of researchers doing 12-minute presentations of their specific research, and then you'll have a chance for Q&A. Um, we're gonna then, uh, in, later in the day, we're going to have a number of tracks. So this will be the main track, um, but there's two other rooms down the hall. We'll have signage for that, depending on what you want to do. We'll have lightning talks. We're going to have a workshop on the Twitter API v2, which is uh, an API a lot of people in this room consume and use, um, a number of breakout sessions during the day. Uh, tomorrow, more research, more breakout, more community. Um, we're going to have a session tomorrow during lunch on teaching trust and safety. So those of you uh, faculty who are interested in um, teaching, uh, we're releasing all of our content. We're actually finishing up a trust and safety textbook uh, that will be open, uh, uh, openly available. So we're looking for collaborators who'd love to work with us on teaching our students and trying to you know, my goal is that the students of today can make totally different mistakes uh, than my generation did uh, in Silicon Valley. Like, let them make their own mistakes, not the same ones over and over again. Um, and if you want to help do that at, at your institution, we'd love to see you tomorrow for that, uh, for that session. Um, so I just want to thank uh, you know, a huge group of, of, of staff uh, and students made today possible. Um, and I really appreciate everybody, but there's, there's two people I really want to highlight. Um, the first is Dr. Shelby Grossman. Shelby, you in the room? You want to wave? Hey, Shelby, you can stand up. Um, 
Shelby is our uh, research scholar uh, in really the intellectual heart of SIO. Um, she is the force behind the journal, and uh, you should definitely find Shelby during the day if you want to talk about uh, research opportunities in this area, collaboration areas, um, and the kinds of things we'd love to see in the journal. Um, and then Elena Christ, where are you, Elena? Come in. Um, Elena Christ, okay, well, Elena's actually doing work. Um, uh, while I talk, uh, which is the whole point. Uh, Elaine is the deputy director of SIO. I tried to get Stanford to give her the title Shogun. Um, uh, that turned out to be kicked back by University of HR. Um, uh, but uh, she's the real power behind SIO and the one who made this event possible. Um, so if you see Shelby and, and Elena, uh, congratulate them on, on being able to pull this together uh, because this has been incredibly, this is the first week of school for us. Um, and it's been an incredibly busy week and I, I, I'm so, happy that we were able to, to make this, pull this off. Um, cool, uh, we have a co-organizing organization, uh, the Trust and Safety Foundation. Um, so I'm gonna invite Charlotte Wilner to come up and, and say a couple words and then we'll kick it off. Thanks, yay Charlotte. Oh no, I forgot to grow six inches before this presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Charlotte Wilner. I am executive director at the Trust and Safety Foundation. Now I see a lot of familiar faces here. Some of you were just at um, a conference across the road, TrustCon, where I said I was the executive director of the Trust and Safety Professional Association. And you may be wondering, hang on, what? So I'd like to explain a little bit about our two organizations. Um, uh, my, me and my team, we work at two sibling nonprofits. The association, TSPA, is for uh, trust and safety professionals. That's anyone who is engaged in uh, the day-to-day -day work of making online spaces safe and uh, conducive to uh, a growing global society. Um, we are a community of practice, and uh, we, we really welcome anyone engaged in that work professionally to come and join our community. Now. TSF, the Trust and Safety Foundation, um, is about building a community of dialogue between everybody who is interested in the practice of trust and safety. Um, you know, people say, safety is everyone's job, but we really do believe that um, at TSF. Uh, we really want to be partnering with not just our own professionals, but academics, civil society, uh, government and regulators, media, and m most importantly, the public, which is, of course, all of us and everyone watching online. Um, we really uh, have three priorities for the foundation. One is educating uh, the public and people who are interested in it. Now, I understand a theme of this event is uh, maybe sharing some data. I feel like that's a popular topic. Um, and I'm a trust and safety professional myself. I was in industry for over 15 years and um, that scares us sometimes, right? That's a little, little nerve wracking historically. Um, and I think a big opportunity that we have as professionals and sort of being this, this bridge between communities is to help illuminate, here's what it looks like on the back end. Here's what's actually happening behind the scenes to give a better perspective on what types of data are meaningful? How can you be partnering to understand fully this field that's developing in new ways every day? Um, part of the way we've done that so far as a foundation is partner with the Copia Institute to produce case studies. Um, if you go to our website, we have over 100 case studies now on real world examples where trust and safety teams made certain choices. Some of them were great. Some of them we learned from. And all of those are now free and open and available for people who want to learn more about the practice Okay, how is this actually done? What are those trade-offs? How would we think about this going forward? Um, another pillar for us is data and research. Um, so obviously, uh, we are here to talk about research. It's on the signage. Um, but I also sit on the editorial board for the journal uh, on behalf of TSPA and TSF. And the reason I do is because we think it is really important to have data on our practice. Uh, tech, as you know, is a very data-driven field. And one of the things we've always felt in trust and safety is there's not a lot of data we're working with when it comes to what actually works on interventions for uh, user experience. What actually works on interventions for wellness and resilience for our moderators? There's so many questions we really want to have answered and efforts like the journal are really uh, such an important way for us to fully understand the choices we make and the implications that those are going to have, not just tomorrow, but way, way, way down the line as the field develops. Um, 
tomorrow, uh, to give a plug for tomorrow, uh, you, you actually have the opportunity to come and hear about the research coalition that we're standing up within Trust and Safety Foundation. Uh, it's industry to start with. We have a subcommittee starting on psychological health. But the goal with that research coalition over time is to invite every sort of stakeholder in to be able to say, okay, you know, how do we build this together? Um, finally, we believe in facilitating dialogue. Um, we are so excited to be partnering with SIO. And here's the origin story, friends. Um, it was what, January, February? We got a call from the wonderful Shelby and Elena. They say, hey, we were thinking of doing a trust and safety conference in the fall. Would you, would you like to participate? And I was like, oh no, we were thinking of doing a trust and safety conference in the fall. Would you, would you like to participate? And we talked it through because this was the first conference either side. And what we realized is, okay, listen, we could like put them on different weeks and we could cannibalize each other's content and participants or, hear me out, we could work together, right? And that is what I think we've been most excited about in this partnership. We partnered with you on the CFP. We've really been sort of uh, looking forward to this as a continuation of a lot of the conversations we had this week at TrustCon because this is about working together. And if we can model that as organizations and really structurally build that into the way we think about our work, we think not only our field benefits, but actually the entire public uh, under benefits from that understanding. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Really looking forward to an incredible two days with you. And I'm going to turn it back to our Master of Ceremonies. Charlotte's never used the six-inch joke uh, before, ever. I've never seen that before. Uh, in every talk she's good. <laughs> um, OK, uh, so we're going to get started. Uh, I want to introduce uh, the person who I'm going to be chatting with during our fireside, uh, Julie uh, Cordua. Uh, Julie is the CEO of Thorn. So for those of you who don't work in the child safety world, um, Thorn is, I think, the most effective NGO I have seen in any safety field. Um, she helped found it in 2012, uh, and we'll talk about both their research and their direct interventions, um, but a really unique uh, set of things that Thorne does, uh, and I think it's one of the reasons I wanted to bring her up here to start, is I think Thorne's an excellent model for the kinds of stuff that we need to think about in other areas. When we talk about suicide and suicidal ideation, um, when we talk about bullying and hate speech and NCII and all the different things that happen online, child safety is a little bit ahead, and Thorne is one of the reasons why that's true. Um, Julie came to Thorne from Red, um, the, the uh, brand uh, you know, campaign um, to raise money uh, in Africa. It was incredibly effective, um, and she has a uh, BA from UCLA and an MBA from Northwestern, which due to uh, powers that nobody understands are both Big Ten schools now. Um, so now she gets to see them play uh, every other year and then enjoy her trips to Rutgers uh, for volleyball games or whatever. So anyway, I I'm not, not mad at all about conference realignment. Um, let's uh, welcome uh, Julie up here to stage. Much more about conference realignment than I ever knew, but. <laughs> no, right. Do you want to, do you want to just do an hour on college football? No, oh, no. Okay. I, I, um, okay, so uh, Julie, like I said, uh, for those, you know, there's a lot of people here, especially in the academic side, I think who have not been exposed to the child safety world. So why don't you just give us an overview of Thorn and, and what your mission is? Sure, so uh, we are an organization that builds technology to end online child sexual abuse. So we start, when we started 11 years ago, um, we, we've actually evolved. So if you only met us eight years ago, you may think we did something different. We started focusing on the intersection of child sex trafficking um, and technology in the United States, and we thought we were going to drive technology innovation um, by gathering people, by talking about it, by illuminating best practices, and we quickly learned that there was no one in the field who was building software on behalf of the child only. Um, we were working with a lot of tech companies, and tech companies were building great software to protect their platform, but not for the industry as a whole. Law enforcement was dreadfully behind in building software that worked on behalf of the child, um, and we, we were drowning in data. I, I said to Alex this morning, it's, it is actually amazing to be here and have two conferences going on about trust and safety, because when we started 11 years ago, that wasn't a thing. Um, and so. Uh, we evolved about five years into the organization, and we said we're actually going to become a product organization. Um, so we build software that scales 
um, to, on behalf of the child, with the end goal of eliminating child sexual abuse material. Um, so we serve law enforcement, we serve the private industry, and more recently, we're standing up, um, we're seeing this incredible rise, as most of you probably know, in self-generated content. Um, so we're actually standing up an entire unit focused on youth and caregivers, um, trying to incorporate prevention, uh, technology interventions for prevention as part of our work as well. Where, where do you guys get your funding from? How does that work? <clears throat> so we are a nonprofit. Um, the bulk of our funding is individual donations. Um, three years ago, we won something called the Ted Audacious Prize, which was a five-year significant, think of like venture funding for the private sector. This was venture funding for a nonprofit. Um, and as part of that, we're actually burn it, building an earned revenue model into the nonprofit. So the software we build for the private sector, we sell. Um, we're not a for-profit, probably won't ever generate enough to become a for-profit, but it makes us a stronger nonprofit to have a diversified income stream. Um, and I, I personally think we're building world-class software in the detection of child sexual abuse material. Um, Do you want to talk about like just one example of a product you guys? Yeah, so, so our product actually for the private sector is called Safer. And um, it is essentially a specialized content moderation system for the detection of child sexual abuse material. Um, and so a lot of, you know, Facebook and Google and some of the top companies have their own content moderation systems. But what we learned in the field is that once you get past that, the medium to small companies it wasn't an area they were going to invest. Um, and so we built a system that scaled and um, was accessible for these companies, and also they could share information. So if you find it on one platform, you can share intelligence and find it on another. Um, and we've gone beyond just the image and video hashing. We're introducing things like classifiers, so you can detect never before seen images and videos. And we actually had a customer this spring who used our classifier um, and identified an eight-year-old girl. Her father was abusing her. He posted the picture on a very well-known photo sharing site. Our system caught it. Um, they opened their content moderation system, opened it up, called the police immediately, submitted it to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and that eight-year-old was recovered. And so we are very clear in the ecosystem what the job is of each player. It is law enforcement's job to find kids. It is the company's job to keep their platforms clean. But if in, find, in keeping your platform clean and safe, you have the ability to stop the abuse of a child, um, it's a pretty powerful moment. And you work with Nick Mick on the classifiers and training sets, I'm guessing. We, we work with a variety of partners in the field, but we do work very closely with Nick Mick. So Safer's fully integrated to report into Nick Mick. We partner with them on um, data science to improve cyber tip line yeah. analysis. Um, I mean, they're a critical part of the ecosystem. Uh, we should talk to you, because one of the things we'll be talking about at the conference and some of the other talks is we actually had to establish a child safety scanning you know, I'm eventually going to get fired from, by Stanford. It's just inevitable. But I want it to be like a real cool academic freedom issue. I don't yeah. want it to be because a 19-year-old saw CSAM because we were pulling down from one of these horrible platforms. Right. Um, and, 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 like the, and like when we, we establish this pipeline to look at every image that we're pulling down uh, for other research purposes, for disinformation and such, and we found uh, we've made, we, we are now, I don't know, I don't think we're the only academic institution that's made NCMEC reports, but I do think it, you know, we're somewhat unique as like a research group that now has like a regular pace of NCMEC reports because unfortunately like the long tail of these platforms have nothing usually. Right, well, I mean you've, my argument is that anywhere that there's an upload button, there is most likely child sexual abuse material. Right. You will find an image. And um, for the number of customers that have turned on safer, that is held true. Yeah, um, it's the water that finds every crack. It, right? Everywhere. And, um, and, and also, I mean, kind of a pivot, but to what you said is, I actually think one of the barriers to advanced research in this field is that, especially in child sexual abuse material, it is toxic and it yeah. is illegal. So how do you do research on something that you cannot see and you cannot possess? That is one of the hardest research challenges in the field that we work on and it's something our, our team tries to overcome every day. Right, which at least in, in, with my experience in industry, it is a problem in industry too, but you know, there has been changes to the law or at least reinterpretations that allow industry during the you know, 90, holding day. 90 day period. Mm -hmm. um, is this something that 
so we're gonna talk a lot about different collaborations, but like to start off, is, is there a need for legal changes here to allow more collaboration here and, and more access to material um, that nobody wants to have access to, but it's absolutely necessary to prevent this? Do you, do you think we need to uh, legislative changes? I think we should look at it yeah. um, because I think Right now in this field, the entities that can hold this content are the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, law enforcement, which has a function. They are right. supposed to be the clearinghouse that takes in all the data, packages that helps law enforcement. Um, law enforcement can hold the data for investigative purposes, and tech companies can hold it for 90 days. And so oftentimes they can use it to train classifiers. But where is the research team whose entire job it is, is to constantly look at the trends in this data, to build AI off of it, to help find new content, to um, build interventions that will stop the spread of it in the first place versus looking at it after. It is, I don't have an answer for how it should look because it is highly sensitive. We saw, there was an article that came out actually recent, um, a few weeks ago about a content moderation company that was training content moderators on children's abuse material. Yeah. That is ethically very right. bad. So if we were to change these laws, that would have to, a lot of due diligence would have to go into that to make sure that we are protecting children and um, doing it in an ethical manner. But I think we won't advance as a field unless we think critically about how we access that data for research and training. Right. Okay, so let's talk about your research because I, one of the reasons I want to talk to you is I, I feel like Thorne's research is unique in its focus on victims. Um, uh, so let's just talk about some of it. So, you know, uh, you and I, when I was at Facebook, uh, you were doing lots of work with the Facebook uh, safety team on sextortion. Mm -hmm. um, first, again, a lot of people here don't work in child safety. Why don't you talk a little bit about what sextortion is and, and the size of that problem? Yeah, so um, I think that our first research in that area started in 2015. Yeah. Um, and when we started that, so sextortion is when uh, anyone, it, children and adults, um, are extorted for sexual images. And it can happen, the, the reason we did the research is because we weren't clear on exactly all the levers, but it can happen, it happens to adults often, where, um, an example, a female poses as a potential love interest and uh, maybe a man sends sexual images to the woman, and then it's really not a woman, it is someone who is um, going to get money out of them and says, send me more, send me more, or I will release these to your wife because I'm your friend on Facebook and I know who your entire family is and I'm gonna get more and more money. Well, that is happening to children too um, and it presents itself in a variety of ways. It could be a scorned boyfriend or girlfriend, it can be a stranger online, it could be for more and more sexual images, it can be the an area we're seeing growing right now is 13 to 17 year old boys for money, um, but it, that's what sextortion is. Which has horrible outcomes. Horrible right? outcomes. Like, um, yeah, I, we had a young man when I first started at Facebook in North Ireland uh, yeah. who had you know, uh, a, a well-known situation that is unfortunately too common who took his own life because he was being extorted by a man who had you know, done that exact trick to him yeah. tricked into sharing images, um, was pushing for more and more, and then basically said, steal your parents' credit cards and pay me, and he felt like he didn't have any, anything he could do except take his own life. Right, um, and, and that is, happens frequently. Happens frequently. And, and, and quickly. We've seen, that it, we've seen cases where it goes from initial ask of an image to suicide within days. Yeah, and so we, we always have uh, specific cases that companies looked at that law enforcement looked at, but that's, it's not anecdata, data, but it's, it's hard to build like a really good vision of what's going on mm -hmm. just from those cases. And so you guys stepped in and you did something pretty unique in 2015. Can you talk a little bit about the research? Yeah, so, so we did two studies. We did one in 2015, then we did it again in 2017, um, where we actually went into the social media platforms and advertised for people to take this study. And the first one that we did was, you had to be 18 and, and um, we were looking for people who'd had an interaction like this within the last two years. So we were trying to get to kids, but wanted to understand um, more timely what was happening. We then redid the study a few years later and actually worked with children 13 and up 
Um, because what we are seeing, and, and this is some of the question, right, but it, we made a very conscious choice to talk to kids directly because the platforms are changing so quickly and the technology is changing so quickly and the tactics of the perpetrators change so quickly that by the time you're talking to an 18-year-old and they had an experience when they're 16 and it took you a year to do the research, the data that you're finding out really doesn't affect dramatically the interventions you should be um, implementing at that given time. So when we did it again, we wanted to get to younger kids. Um, and it was interesting, we found out that I, I think, it, and my, our research team is here, so um, I'm gonna say something and if I'm incorrect, they will correct me <laughs> later. But um, I think it was like 20% of kids 13 to 17 had, had had an interaction like this where someone was aiming to extort them or ask them for um, nude images. And so we wouldn't get to that, knowing that it was happening that young. Um, and today we just, did new research um, and found that I think it's 25% of kids 9 to 11 have been asked for a nude image. Um, and so just building upon like learnings over the last five to seven years of like we have to be talking to these kids because most parents or platforms are not going to think that a nine-year-old is getting asked um, for nude images and that that is a common thing that is happening. Also because these platforms will tell you that nine-year-olds aren't on their platforms. Right. But they are. A person under 13 has never used Instagram. No, is a, never. Yes, is what I've heard. And definitely not getting asked for nude images. Well, not so I, okay, because you brought it up, actually, I'd love to pivot to this. I do feel that there is like a basic problem here around child safety in that everybody kind of pretends that kids, that we can create rules like COPA mm -hmm. that have these hard cutoffs at like an age like 13 and that that is actually going to work. Yeah. Um, so there's finally, I think kind of, I, personally I think COPA is like a humongous failure, right? Like everybody in DC who was part of that law really needs to rethink, like, uh, you know, they really did not understand the kind of risks that kids were facing and the, the, the incentive structure they're building for companies to not actually study things like nine and 10 year olds, right? Um, so where, where you know, we've started now in the UK, there's some very draconian laws that are being thought about. We have the Digital Services Act in the EU. Here in California, um, we now have a, an online safety law. So where are you guys on the structure that needs to exist to incentivize appropriate design and appropriate research? Um, and do we, should we change kind of our model of the idea that kids aren't gonna use the internet? Is that something that like, we're gonna have to just grapple with much more aggressively instead of I mean, I have, I have a strong opinion about this. And yeah. it was interesting because someone asked me this question when um, they, uh, I think Instagram was thinking of making Instagram for kids. And I, I, I said, if you have an adult platform that you think is not you know, 13 and above or 15 and above, I can guarantee you there are kids there. Right. So you should design for that. And if you design a kids only platform, I'm gonna guarantee you there are perpetrators there. Right. So I don't care if you design it for kids or adults, there will be perpetrators there and you need to design for the most vulnerable, the population that's on it. So right. that's my two cents and I'm, and I'm not sure everyone will agree with me on that. But um, as far as uh, the, how, the legis how we have to think about legislation in this, um, in the United States it's interesting because it is all what tech companies are doing is very voluntary, right? right. And um, you only have to report child sexual abuse material if you find it, but you don't have to look for it. And so if you don't look for it, you don't find it. But if you look for it, I can guarantee you you're gonna find it. The EU is introducing some interesting draft legislation that will require um, tech companies to um, look for child sexual abuse material and put safeguards in place. Um, I think uh, I'm supportive of requiring companies to do more. Um, I think we need to be careful though how we do it in that um, that legislation is unclear right now. It, there is some confusion that tech companies can't continue to do the voluntary work that they're doing. Right. And that's a problem. Yeah. Because tech companies are doing a lot of great voluntary work and it is when you have companies that are bought in to doing research, to doing this type of detection, where new innovations come out. 
and um, these crimes evolve quickly. You, people from the outside, I don't think, can build as innovative things as people who are sitting on the data. Um, and so if that EU legislation can strike a balance where there is a requirement for companies to do a certain amount and we support all the voluntary work that's being done, I think that could go a long way in moving us to a better position. What's yeah, that? I mean, I think I have a number of problems with the EU legislation. I'm, I'm a little bit, probably a little bit more of a libertarian than you yeah, are on this well, one. Yeah, I think we're a little different now. Um, but, so, but one of the problems with the EU legislation, the EU does not have a Fourth Amendment, right? Right. And the entire kind of edifice of child safety in the US is this teetering legal balance um, of which the thing that might push it over is actually a case I worked on at Yahoo. Um, yeah, we could talk about the Ninth Circuit. Turns out sometimes uh, child abusers have good lawyers uh, it, yes. eventually and will end up spending years and years of, of money uh, going up through the Ninth Circuit. Um, but that is based upon, the entire edifice is based upon the idea that the companies having interventions are voluntary, but the reporting is non-voluntary, mm -hmm. right? And therefore it is not a Fourth Amendment violation for them to do a search of their platforms for content and report it to NCMEC, which NCMEC has been designated a, a, a government agent, which is not a crazy idea. Um, the person who wrote that uh, is now on the Supreme Court, right? So that's probably a, uh, something that will flow through the Supreme Court, that belief that NCMEC is effectively part of the government, and that we don't want tech companies to get labeled as parts of the government because of the you know 20 something million reports that happened to NCMEC already, mm -hmm. those, could not be used uh, for prosecution. Um, so, like, how? What do you see? I mean, are you? Do you guys think that there should be involuntary measures outside the U.S.? Is that something that companies should implement only in places like the EU, but keep it voluntary in the U.S.? Like, how does that even work? And as, uh, where do you well, see this shaking out of the U.S. being a, you know, having a particular legal and constitutional system that is incompatible with the way these other countries are thinking about it? Well, I think. I think that's why it can't happen in the US because yeah. of the Fourth Amendment and so why I think the EU legislation is interesting because I think we have seen that in Europe they are more willing to regulate tech. They don't always get it right, I'm not saying that, but they, but they are more on the forefront and I right. think this is an area, I don't think the way that we are regulating in this space child safety in the US is working, no. to be honest. Um, it isn't putting enough pressure. But we have the Fourth Amendment, which is a good thing. Yeah. And so we have this tension. And so I do think that we are leaning into the EU. You heard it here, Fourth Amendment good. <laughs> yes, go. yes, right. Fourth Amendment good. Which, which of the Bill of Rights do you like the least? Yeah, the well, let me see. We could pick <laughs> one that, where's, no. Where's Eric? Uh, that Third Amendment. Uh, yeah. I really want, actually, people to be quartered in my home. I feel like that's yeah, actually. Yeah, first, the first. As long as I, I get to charge like an Airbnb, yeah. It's questionable. Uh. Um, but I think we're leaning into the EU legislation to help them get it right. Right. Uh, because, so what were you guys in California? I'm going to be frank. Because yeah, well, California well, did not get it right. Okay, so we are uh, 90 people yeah, and no, no, just, mostly engineers. Yeah. We do not work on state legislation. So right. that um, so when we had to pick our battles, we're looking at what's happening in the UK. Australia is doing some interesting things as well. Right. But when we're looking at what, if gotten right, what could really help this field, we think the EU is interesting. But there's some things that need to be revised, and yeah. they need to get it right. If it goes wrong, it can also have detrimental. Are you guys going to engage in Sacramento now, uh, um, do you think? Not right now. OK. Because we are, because just for those of you who don't know, California, you know, the governor just signed a law that I think is actually a disaster in a bunch of different ways, including from Fourth Amendment issues, including on requiring, effectively requiring um, you know, uh, everybody to prove their identity and to prove the, their age, mm -hmm. right? Um, which I think is very incompatible with the way a lot of people want the internet to, to work. Um, I think the only upside is it sets a deadline effectively, right? In that yeah. like January 1st, 2024, um, if almost everybody understands that California law is totally unworkable, but it does set a deadline for us to fix it sometime next year. Mm. That, yeah, that's interesting. So you guys might want to get engaged, because okay. we should talk about this, because we, we are definitely... Great. We, I mean, the problem with state legislatures is, you know, like everybody's paying someone. attention to D.C., yeah. and then, you know, people in D.C. are kind of famous, and like they got there, and you're like, you know who the personalities are. State legislatures, there's like a, a state senator, you know, who probably just owns like four gas stations in Turlock, <laughs> and then like was able Don't to win. Don't knock the Central Valley, I grew up Oh, in. I'm from Sac, I, I, okay. I, yeah. Sacramento, baby, it's a Central Valley. It's, Central Valley. It's where it's at, the Midwest of California. It is. Um, 
You can, bur you can learn. We grow all your food. Right, we grow all your food. Where'd you get your, where do you think the asparagus comes from? It yeah. was tomatoes. And, and you can learn to both duck hunt and ski in the same season. Which and is I pretty did, amazing. Yeah. growing yeah. up, so. So, um, but uh, the, the problem with Sacramento is like you have these kind of personalities where this stuff can bubble up yeah. and then make it to legislation incredibly quickly. Yeah. Um, and my, part of my fear is that now that California's moved, that you now will have states like Texas and Florida where perhaps the regulation is less, even less empirical. Um, that in California are going to make a move here. All right, so you just gave me work to do. I did, yeah. Okay, Great. got it. Um, Team? <laughs> They're taking notes, yeah, I see. Vigorously. Air notes, I feel very, yeah. yeah. So, taking it seriously. Um, so, uh, so other than that, so in engagement with the EU, uh, what does that look like? And, like, and who, who are the players uh, who are actually making these decisions here? At, at, is it all in Brussels? Are you guys engaging at the country level? Yeah, so it is mostly in Brussels, but um, what we there's a lot of tension um, right now, and we've talked to your team a lot about this, with um, encryption, yes. right? So uh, in our field, um, the bulk of online child sexual abuse material um, that is reported, I won't say that exists, because again, we only know what's reported, um, comes from Facebook Messenger. And that is because Facebook has great detection, historically has led the field in detecting and looking for it. But they're going to encrypt Messenger, and when they do, we will lose sight of millions of images and videos of child sexual abuse material. And what we know, we, we work um, in the dark web as well as the open web, and what we see in a lot of the chat rooms in the dark web is that a lot of perpetrators are moving to the encrypted apps like Signal and Telegram, because honestly, it's easier there um, to build communities around the trade of child sexual abuse material than it is in the dark web, because it's faster speeds and you can find more people. Um, and encryption is incredibly important. It is private communications. It also enables really bad abuse against children. The EU legislation is trying to figure out, like, should there be a requirement to detect for child sexual abuse material within encrypted environments? Right now, there is not a technical solution that allows you to do that in a privacy-forward way. Right now. There is not a technical solution that allows you to do that. So in Europe, so it's a long way of answering your question, no. yes, you're in Brussels, but then you also, Europe has, um, a, we have a very vocal privacy community here as well, but in Europe, you also, especially in Germany, right? I mean, you can understand why. In the very recent history of Germany, um, what hap happened with the Nazis and, and wanting to find out who everyone is and monitor everyone's communication. And so we are needing to engage in those countries as well. In, in Germany, we're in France, we're in Northern Europe. Um, not to say like this has to happen, but to have these really in-depth conversations to say, yes, privacy is important. And no, we don't want hundreds and thousands of images and videos of the rape of children being transmitted on our platforms. What do we do? And so that's the engagement we have to have. It's, it's not advocating like to do this. It's to say, we, and, and we know privacy you know, forward folks don't want that either. So how are we going to come to terms with what we've created on the internet and the fact that we need to balance privacy and safety? Yeah, and, and I do appreciate that you know, we've run four workshops on this and Thorne has, I think, been to all of them. Um, and so it's been great to see you, you know, I think the Nick Mick folks met the EFF folks at one of our events uh, with lots of alcohol involved. Um, <laughs> uh, and so I, I do think there is a conversation going on. I, the, the trends here, though, on the, I mean, to a lot of people, and the encryption is becoming more and more critical, is because right now companies are losing the battle around keeping data private from governments. And, yeah. you know, both globally and here, you know, especially post Dobbs, there's been a number of examples in the U.S. of, uh, private communications uh, being used in ways uh, that were not possible just even a year or two ago at the state level. Um, and so in a situation where the platforms that are represented here are more and more, have to be more and more responsive to legal requests, encryption becomes like a pretty serious part of, of people feeling that the, that the products they're using is working on behalf of them. But as you point out, that also means that there's this undercurrent of stuff that happens that uh, is not really discussed that widely. Right, and, and I just think we have to be making these decisions eyes, eyes wide open. I mean, in the yeah. field that I work in, people don't want to talk about videos of the rape of babies. Yeah. 
But that is what we're talking about. And we're not talking about one or two. We are talking about hundreds of thousands, right. if not million. I mean, the National Center received, I think it was 88 million files of child sexual abuse material last year. So we can have a discussion about privacy all day long, but let's make sure we're also having the discussion about what is happening to our children. And then we're making the trade-offs very explicitly. Um, and I, I'm, I, we believe in both. We, we need to have privacy and we need to have safety, but we can't have those conversations unless we're really talking about what is happening. Right. But I, I also feel if we're going to talk about the trade-offs with encryption, we also need to look at the weaknesses in the system right now, right? Like we're looking at something like 23, 24 million NCMEC reports. I think it's what, five to 700,000 of those in the US. And um, anecdotally, there's no, good, there's no good numbers on this. It's something we're, we're hoping to fix at SIO. Um, you're looking at like something like 1,500 to 2,000 prosecutions a year, right? So where is that gap that we have hundreds of thousands of reports of mostly online activity, but as you and I know, you often look into somebody who's performing online activity and they turn out to be a swim coach or a youth pastor or they've put themselves in a situation where they have physical access to children and mm -hmm. they are almost certainly, that is for abuse. Mm -hmm. um, why is there such a big gap there between what is currently happening in the tech side and then the actual law enforcement response? And do you, what can we do, I, maybe some of your products help with that, but what can we do to bridge that gap without then touching the very difficult privacy issues that right. exist around encryption? Yeah, um, I, I think they might, be somewhat separate. So there's a lot of weaknesses in the system because it's also a pretty uh, immature system, even though we've been working on this for 20 years. I mean, law enforcement is dramatically underfunded, is one. Um, right. Two is, uh, it, uh, I want access to data, not me. I want everyone to have access to data. I want to know in the 88 million files that come in every year, how many of those are um, what we're hearing is a lot more self-generated. Yeah. Um, so these are children who are being extorted or maybe they sent it to their boyfriend and it went viral on a junior high or a high school campus. Um, uh, so is that trying to arrest a perpetrator or is that trying to make sure a child is safeguarded and their contents taken down so they don't have to live with that for the rest of their lives? Right. Right. So that's a whole nother um, ball of wax. Uh, so how much of the content that's coming in is self-generated? How much is content where the child has already been recovered um, and is currently being safeguarded? How much of it is new children where you are trying to go recover a child and arrest a perpetrator? Mm -hmm. um, there are different types of prosecutions. You, you, you can prosecute someone for the abuse. You could prosecute someone for possession and distribution. And so really breaking that down and understanding like what are we seeing on these platforms um, it's also why I think moving to more proactive detection is important because even though we're drowning in data right now with 88 million um, files, it's only the tip of the iceberg, right? Like so many companies aren't even detecting this. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, a few, the access to data, the understanding what's in that pipeline, the, the self-generated I think is a whole nother ball yeah. of wax that's, that's increasing um, and, and then under, funding of law enforcement. Yeah, so on the, on the companies doing proactive detection, this has been an interesting year for kind of the incentive structure that's built for that, right? Um, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, the New York Times had, I think, a really good series of articles by uh, Gabe Dance was um, yes. on, uh, which they focused a lot on victims, uh, and I think you were quoted in a couple of those, and I was, I was too, but I, I really liked that they, they talked to actual victims um, uh, but they talked a lot about the ways in which companies were not proactive. Mm -hmm. And then this year, you have a New York Times article by Cashmere here, who, who I also really respect, and I think is a really good reporter, but that took the completely opposite tact, that then when Google was doing proactive detection using ML in uh, photo backup, um, that a guy, it sounds like an image that legitimately was a borderline image of a child and perhaps with an adult in it, um, uh, was reported and this guy lost his account and, and got investigated and such. Um, so what, how do we build like, part of the problem here I think is that these, dis these decisions are all being made in secret, very nice, you know, light wood paneled boardrooms within 20 miles of here, of where the, the line is. How do we, to me, like one, the New York Times needs to kind of have an idea of what their editorial position is on this, but 
there, also, this is a reflection of the fact that the conversations about the balancing acts here, mm -hmm. and what are the downsides of, in any of the situation, you have a precision recall trade-off, mm -hmm. you will have false positives and false negatives, that you have to have these trade-offs, and that that will have human impact as mm -hmm. well. Um, that all these decisions are made privately. So how do we get that discussion to be public, so that as a society, we can decide how we want this trade-off, and it's not just kind of dueling New York Times articles and right. the comms team at Google, then putting pressure on the child safety team to go one way or another. Right. So I read that article, the most recent recent one um, a little differently. I read it that Google's content moderation system worked and yeah. their account recovery system didn't. Right. And which was not what the article said, but, yes. it, but that's also a gap in um, people understanding what this field is and the trade-offs that have to be made. Um, so uh, I think transparency is key. And that's actually going back to the EU legislation. There's a lot in there about transparency right. and, and companies having to share what type of detection systems they have in place. Um, here's the thing. Almost every platform that we use and everyone that I've ever looked at in their terms of service say you cannot use their platform for not just illegal activities, but they usually call out by name child sexual abuse, which then says that they have the right to imp or to enforce those terms of service on their platform, which means they can use detection mechanisms to detect child sexual abuse. So when we get up in arms about, oh, they're looking at my content to find child sexual abuse, you signed up for that when you signed up for your terms of service. But it shouldn't be hidden. Like, can we need to put out yeah. in the world what are the detection mechanisms that are being used for image, video? If, they, if a company decides to look at text, they need to say how they're doing it. Um, what are they finding? How can you, what's the recourse if your account gets taken down? Um, and I think sharing that uh, uh, out will help us identify what are good practices, what, where are the mistakes, this isn't black and white, where right. are the mistakes that are being made? How do we improve as a, um, Field by public. What kind of rights do people have for restoration if they are What are your restoration yeah. rights? And, and doing this kind of work, it also can't. I don't think we can get to a place where it is all automated. Yeah. There, there is human judgment. Uh, the automation can help you sift through a massive haystack. The, the human part has to, judgment has to come in. And then there has to always be the, um, if, if we get it wrong, what do we do? Right, yeah, the automation thing. I mean, I feel like that's somewhat of a, the amount that we've leaned at ML, a lot of that comes out of like tech CEO sitting in front of the Senate and their answer to everything being like, well, we're working on ML Senator, which every time Mark Zuckerberg says, I've got AI for that, there's a, a Facebook uh, engineering VP who has to do a shot back home, right? <laughs> I'm like, oh, here we go. I have to now solve another AI hard, you know, AGI hard problem right. uh, by, by Q4, right? Um, so, uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, so just some other quick things, and we'll we're gonna open up for questions in a couple minutes, but I had a, a couple quick things I wanna hit on. Um, you, you, you're not part of a university, but you guys do work with academic researchers. Mm -hmm. How do you handle the ethical and data access issues here? Like, me saying the phrase, surveying minor children of sexual extortion, just me saying that, somewhere here on the Stanford campus, and assistant vice dean felt a disturbance in the force <laughs> to run and to stop the ability for us to do any research, right? Like, um, in, the, in the university context, the IRBs, um, I mean, unfortunately here at Stanford we have a very aggressive IRB, partially because we have a history of locking undergrads in the basement. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, they're, they're, they're kind of super on top of things, but um, so you guys have the freedom to be outside of the academic system for that, but clearly you want to be respecting the same kind of ethical considerations that are considered for university human subject research. How do you guys balance that yourself without having an IRB? Um, how do you handle internally, and, and how do you work with your academic partners on kind of the ethical issues here? Because they, they really are thorny. Yes, they are thorny. I, I've been saving um, that. Had yeah. That <laughs> so um, a couple things on this. One is why we do research. So we are doing research at Thorne to inform our programmatic and product, our intervention decisions. And so um, we are, aren't doing it for longitudinal studies on the most part, and so that kind of rapid real-time feedback. I was talking to, by the way, our team, Melissa, Amanda, and Tim are here, um, and they're uh, speaking later today too, but I was talking to Melissa about the ethics of this. And she said a statement that has really stuck with me. She said, the choice to not 
do research with children is just as conscious a choice as to do research with children. And given that I said in the very beginning that our mission as an organization is to build technology solutions on behalf of the child, if we aren't talking to kids about their experience and having that inform the work that we're doing, we're doing a huge disservice. Yeah. Um, and having done this for a decade and also having my own three kids now, um, I don't think we should underestimate kids at all. I mean, How they, old are your kids? I have 14, 11, and 9. Okay. And so they were three just born and non-existent when I started this work. Right. So I have grown up with like trying to protect kids on the internet while I've watched my kids grow up and also made all the mistakes about handing devices to my children. I have made them all. They have Googled, they have gotten porn on their device, and I'm like, why didn't I have child safety on? Um, <laughs> I have, I, I mean, I have but, 15, 13, and 10, and I think, uh, yeah. one, doing this work while having children, I mean, is the reason why I started bawling at the Crimes Against Children conference. Oh yeah, I cry all um, the time. It's, it's a tough, but. Um, but on, on the ethics, I, yeah. so I wanna answer that. So <laughs> we, um, so, so we made a conscious choice to talk to children, but then we do work really hard to implement the ethical um, guardrails. So, you know, consent for all the subjects who are part of our surveys, um, uh, support services throughout the process. So working with crisis text line, or if we're doing in-person interviews, having therapists on staff if they, you know, um, need to, they can opt out at any point in the process. We actually sequence the questioning so that if things will, you know, be, we think be triggering, that we, it is kind of you're graduated in. So if a child at any point is like, whoop, too much, wants to exit um, uh, stage right. Um, and the, putting those safeguards in place is just really important because our entire mission is to reduce harm for kids and you don't want to have that reoccurrence through that. And then we work with um, researchers either as advisors, but also we've recently had some of our work that we have done um, separately. It wasn't one of the, the, the child surveys, but um, post-research, some of that data was then taken and published in your journal yeah. um, with IRB approval. So we, we follow that diligence, um, but I think we could not do this work without talking to children. Yeah. Uh, great. So uh, we're going to start to open up for questions. For folks who are standing in the back, I'm going to invite you, go ahead and there's lots of chairs up here up front at the tables, so you're welcome to come up and grab a chair uh, so you don't have to be standing the whole time. Um, so. Uh, yeah, we'll start over here. Uh, Dan and John, you guys got the, John's coming with the mic. Uh, we'll start with Professor Goldman and then, okay. Sorry, Eric, I didn't get section 230 in, but this is your chance. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, Eric Goldman from Santa Clara University. Um, and thank you for your remarks today. Uh, one possible solution to putting kids at risk online is to take them offline and to simply create bars that allow them to access the internet. Uh, that can, is really, I think, the dynamic in something like 2273, the combination of mandatory age verification and extreme liability if you don't manage the best interests of the children, drives services to think, I want to close my doors to uh, kids. What are some of the pros and cons of making it harder for kids to engage with services online if that's one of the ways in which we might keep them safe? So one of the things that we've seen um, in our research with kids is that um, even for, so the harms are not limited to children who have the apps on their own phone. So kids will go to their friend's house and use their friend's devices um, and, or use their parents' devices. They do that in my house. They grab my phone when I'm not looking. Um, and so it's similar to, and, and, and this may not be an agreed upon position, but what I said about like Instagram kids or Instagram, like let's cordon off these spaces. Yes, you could do that to a certain degree, but um, I personally believe the internet is here to stay. I think kids crave, uh, another thing we find with, in our research is that um, 
for a lot of kids, they're making their friendships online. I think we, in our last research, 30% of kids who responded said that some of their closest friends are online only. And, um, and so I'm not sure we're at a place in society where we can pull that back from them. We tend to think about um, maybe some restrictions, but actually trying to make those spaces safer for children. So um, I, I think there could be some limiting, but I also just see the research and, and see the behavior of children that they will aim to get around it. Um, Let's do some human subject research. Who here, put your hand up if you're a parent. Okay, leave your hand up if your screen time rules were loosened during COVID. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I feel like, I, I, I've, I mean, my, my kids talk about me like I'm Darth Vader to their friends uh, around their access to social media and stuff. Um, and even with a dad who uh, is incredibly embarrassing in that way, um, I, I feel like we're kind of, both you know, from an academic perspective, but especially a social perspective, COVID permanently changed the way that teenagers interact and um, even younger kids. Yeah, I mean, and also this goes back to the um, rise of self-generated content. I don't yeah. know, they are correlated, not sure if they're caused, but um, <coughs> prior to COVID, what we were seeing was that the fastest growing portion of, of online child sexual abuse material was self-generated. Um, and now we're waiting for some of the data to come out. But anecdotally, if you talk to law enforcement and others who are you know, catching the floodgates, they are saying that the largest portion of child sexual abuse material that they are seeing is self-generated. Um, and, and that is coming off of the heels of two and a half years where we, we all threw our kids' devices. Um, they were online eight to 12 hours a day doing school. <laughs> school here, other device here. Um, and we put all the perpetrators online too. Then we put them in rooms and we locked the doors and we said, good luck. Um, and I, I think we have dramatically shifted the landscape. Yeah. Well, we'll have discussion during the conference of the, the Zoom team of like, as a company that was thrown in the middle of that, of both supporting schools, but then also all the perpetrators uh, being on. Um, so we had one up here, Dan, and then, and then John, can you get to her back there? Just raise your hand. Put your hand on my shirt. Thank you. Okay. We're holding on to the mics because Stanford is famous for this is more of a comment uh, than a question. So <laughs> they, they've, been, they've been told not to let go of the mics. I'll try and make it <laughs> um, Hi, Julie. I'm uh, Graham Francis from uh, a work on uh, online safety for the UK government. Yeah. Um, so you talked about the way in which uh, Thorn provide smaller, medium-sized companies with the, with the tooling to detect these down that they wouldn't normally have. Um, but I guess it, it's not just Thorn that does that, and there's a, a, a quite a growing market of, of companies of, across the world who produce, I guess, similar tooling uh, aimed at not just preventative CSAM, but healthy online communities. Um, but I think one of the challenges I've heard over the last few days is how, how do companies evaluate the effectiveness and the accuracy and the lack of bias and the quality of these products. Um, what, are the, what are the standards in a, in a market that actually doesn't appear to have standards? And I wondered if you had any, any reflections on, on, on that theme. Yeah, so um, our data science team is often, as we're trying to build, so um, you can measure effectiveness of like hash-based detection pretty easily, right? So SHA-5, MD, uh, MD5, SHA-1, uh, you go to photo DNA, you can change your thresholds. It gets more complicated when you start to build classifiers for the detection of images and videos or grooming. Um, and that's where I think we need better data sets and we need to be able to kind of do bake-offs between different types of classifiers um, to see which ones are performing well. Um, I also, you know, something that I do get concerned about that we have seen that's popped up in the EU is that um, there is a desire to kind of say, well, this classifier, this detection mechanism is only 90% effective. Well, that's a moment in time. 
right? So if we start to, it, to judge these types of detection mechanisms as a moment in time and not allow for innovation and constant iteration um, and say, well, that's not good enough, too many false positives, we're not gonna use that, we're shutting down the innovation that's gonna go into constantly trying to build new things. So I think we need better data sets so that more of these tools that are being built can be tested side by side. We can learn from the research that's happening. We can publish that and we can also create an, a culture of innovation and improvement um, instead of absolute like this, this is where we're at today and not good enough, so not gonna use it. Cool. Hi, Julie. I'm gonna get up so maybe you can hear me better. Um, Carolina Ares, Center for Digital Citizens, Northumbria University, so also from the UK. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about the classifiers and what exactly, um, what types of classifiers you use for child sexual abuse. Because I'm hearing a lot of platforms say that they don't allow nudity because it might be non-consensual or it might be child sexual abuse. But I feel like that's quite broad and I'm wondering whether, well, I'm wondering, I feel like it's probably a bit of a cop-out and I was wondering what your classifiers are saying yeah. in terms of that. So first I think every platform has to be really clear about what kind of platform they are and what they're going to allow. So an adult content platform is going to allow something diff very different than Disney Kids or Twitch even. But every platform should be really clear about do we allow nudity, do we allow pornography, do we, no one's gonna allow child sexual abuse material, right? Then you know where you're starting from. Every user can decide whether that's a place for them or not. And then the detection tools you put in place can be one that detects only nudity. But detecting only nudity is very, very different than detecting child sexual abuse material. And detecting child sexual abuse material is very different than adult pornography. And so we're actually trying to build classifiers that specifically find child sexual abuse material, images, videos, much more difficult, um, and looking at what does grooming look like, which is also much more difficult. Um, but those are different, absolutely. So we'll do these two. Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, thanks. My name is Courtney Raj. I have a question about the next generation of, um, you know, virtual reality and auto-generated, algorithmically created C yeah. um, child sexual abuse material. How are you thinking about that? If there, you know, one of obviously there's an inherent crime. Uh, involved in inherent human rights abuse in child sexual abuse material, but what happens when there isn't a real child involved? That's a really good question that I think we are going to have to deal with as a society. Um, we talk to, we're talking to a lot of the companies that are already like um, Dolly and what places where, you, who many of those largest platforms are ahead of the curve and saying like we don't want someone to be able to put in the worst world words in the world and um, generate child sexual abuse material so trying to get ahead of it but I don't know that our legal structure has caught up and um, I don't I haven't been in the rooms where we're having that debate and discussion around is this content illegal um, I have my opinions I don't think we as a society want even replicated images and videos of children being abused out there. Um, but we are going to need to have our technical infrastructure and our um, legislative or regulatory infrastructure protect against that as well. I mean, one immediate impact that we've seen is something that I thought was amazing in your second sextortion survey, which was, what, five years ago. Mm -hmm. You already had a, a certain percentage of people where the initial um, threat came with artificial, with them being faked into an image. And that yeah. is super early kind of in face replacement and yeah. um, other kinds of synthetic media. So I feel like that's where we probably need to start is on sextortion and others and effectively the creation of fake revenge porn and NCII. Um, because uh, you know, there, there's a situation in which you have like the real face of somebody um, and often you know, it is being used to leverage and to create more abuse. Right. Um... Yes, 
and my head goes other places as well, where often in the, um, not often, sometimes, uh, in abuse material because, you know, perpetrators know that um, you can use a face to run an investigation and find a child. The images will, they'll blur the face of the child, but you have the full abuse on camera. And, you know, people taking those and then actually putting faces on that. I mean, it's just, it's, um, yeah, not good. Yeah, so we, go ahead, Joe. Hi, thanks for being here. Uh, my name's Angie. I'm a trust and safety researcher. And I'm curious, do you have any thoughts uh, when it comes to the scenario where there's a bad actor and thinking through all the different steps of the process related to child sexual abuse and the concept of rehabilitation and interventions and also redirects? Yeah, so this prevention is really important. So in this field, because it can be quite emotional, people like to generalize and say, right, like all pedophiles are horrible. The, the research is like pedophilia is a real thing. Not every pedophile abuses a child. Um, and I mean, not, the numbers are like something, some of the surveys have been something between two and 4%, I believe. Of our society. Of adult men. Yes. Uh, yeah. have perhaps a predilection. And Dr. Cito is here, who I have learned a lot about this from over the last decade. Um, and every child abuser is not a pedophile. The, the reason people abuse children are very different. And Melissa on our team did a lot of research um, on this for us early on and when she read that out to our organization. Um, but we as a society, especially in America, we don't want to hear that. And we don't want to put the money behind the research to think about prevention, but I think it would actually go a really long way in addressing this issue. So Germany actually does some really interesting interventions where they, they have like bus advertisements and TV advertisements talking to people who may have an inclination to abuse children and encouraging them to go into these therapy centers in Germany to, to get therapy to prevent hands-on abuse. There's a few organizations, um, one in the US and a sister one in the UK called Stop It Now, that run um, a hotline for people who um, ha may have this and, and want to have anonymous uh, therapy conversations. Uh, we used to do some work with them where we would run ads, uh, deterrent ads on Google and other places where if people would search terms that we knew were associated with child sexual abuse material, we would feed an ad that directed them to stop it now to try to intervene before people went too far down the path. So um, it is really important. I think it's underfunded. Um, and I think it's under focused on because it's a really difficult thing for us because we're so emotional about we don't want to abuse kids that we don't want to think about how could we prevent it with people who may be struggling with this. But it's, it's a reality and it's an area that could use a lot more research um, and visibility. Great. Um, so, so we've had somebody waiting. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's try. Why don't you find somebody, John? Yeah. Hi, I'm Carlos. I'm a researcher with Meta. Um, I wanted to ask about actors also, and how do you navigate, you know, privacy and transparency and regulation demands with like tipping them off about what we're doing, right? Are we not giving them a playbook by sharing some of our practices and knowledge? And how do we, you know, how do we best navigate developing research and, pro and, and processes and systems without telling them how to skirt them, basically? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a balance. So um, there, I mean, it's judgment calls, right? So if there are certain techniques being used, um, you don't want to share that too much. But on the other hand, if we more deeply understand all the places that um, you know, people used to say, well, if we tell them what they're doing on the open web, they're just going to go to the dark web. They're already in the dark web. I mean, the dark web has dozens of websites and chat rooms just dedicated to the sexual abuse of children. And there's a lot of law enforcement there working on that. So um, 
I think if we get better in every environment, making the internet as a whole hostile to abuse, our goal is to just get it back, let's, let's send it back a few decades. Um, people often challenge us, because we say we want to end online child sexual abuse. They're like, well, don't you want to end child sexual abuse? Well, yes, but that's not, the internet has changed the game. It has made it easier for perpetrators to connect with each other, which normalizes abuse. It, it has enabled the currency of child sexual abuse material is not money, it is the content. So people abuse children so that new images and videos can get put into the marketplace for abuse. And I think the, I don't think doing this in isolation and kind of hiding our practices, maybe there are some really good ones that you might want to hide, but in general, the sharing of knowledge and us becoming an army of responders to make the internet hostile in all of the darkest corners will take this offline, reduce the amount of people who can participate it. I think of it like a market, like let's just destroy the market for this type of abuse. Um, and, I, and I think it requires us sharing more information with each other. I mean, look, in this way, we talk about 10 times engineers in Silicon Valley, but there really are 10 times abusers, people who are like the really good at figure, having good OPSEC of, of, and those people are already in discussion forums where they talk about this and they talk about photo DNA and they talk about yeah. different, they're reading the literature. So I feel like we're already there. The, the benefit of collaboration plus the benefit of the deterrent effect for the more casual um, offenders is perhaps, I think, worth it. I, I agree. There, I, a lot of offenders are casual and simple and we're gonna catch them and they're not gonna read all this stuff and we should. Right. Um, and then the really technical people, they're, they're gonna, that's gonna be the, the elite 1% that we have to constantly about. John, where are you? Did you find, okay, this last question and then we'll have time, uh, folks can chat with Julie later if they'd like. Hi, thank you for this uh, really important conversation. Ryan Williams, Global Disinformation Lab, University of Texas. I'm interested in um, how one aspect of, of this conversation connected with your introduction, which is conceptualizing trust and safety as a field that you can prepare people for. For instance, in the discussion of um, uh, encryption um, versus protecting children. These are contested values. How are you, how, how should we approach preparing people to enter this field where they're navigating these contested values and uh, also sometimes changing technologies and the incentive structures of their home organizations? It's a lot for anyone to manage. And how, what's the best way to kind of prepare folks for that? Uh, prepare your brain to do somersaults. So I, I don't know that I look at them as contested values. Like I, when I think about privacy, I think about um, the privacy of the children who are in, like a friend of mine's daughter um, is, her child sexual abuse content is some of the most widely distributed online. And she's trying to live her life but she knows that even today, 10 years later, people are watching her abuse. That's a privacy question. So she's had people come up to her in a coffee shop and say they had seen her abuse. That's a privacy question. So I would challenge, that's why I don't, I don't ever want to sit across the table from privacy experts and advocates and say we are at opposing views. We're not. We, everyone, I don't believe anyone wants child sexual abuse out on the internet. And I don't believe any of us want oppressive regimes to be able to take all of our data and use it against us to destroy democracy. Um, but I also don't think we, in a very complicated world, can think black and white. I think we have to train our young people and our researchers, please Alex, do this, to la allow our brains to do somersaults and, and like battle out the different elements of this and try things. And it's really hard to try things in this field because people's lives are at stake. But if we don't try things and, and be willing to learn what works and what doesn't, we're never going to be able to balance them. We're just gonna say, nope, encrypt everything. They, like, our democracy is more important than that child being able to realize that 100,000 people watched her rape when she was seven years old. 
I'm making that choice, black and white. I don't think that's the society we want to live in. So check, create those environments to have those really tough conversations, agree to move forward on something, agree to reevaluate it on a regular basis, and let's try to move our society forward because it's not going to get easier. OK, thanks for your questions. We're going to take a break for half an hour. We'll see you back here at 1030. Let's, thanks, Julie, for the time. Thank you, Julie.
years yeah. if there was a timer that was just like running and yeah. so you have Uh, momentarily. Thank you very much.
Good morning, everybody. If you could take your seats, please. We'll start the panel momentarily. Thank you. Okay. And I'll point to you guys, and then you. Yeah, and then ask. Okay. Make sure that the questions go across, but that's kind of random. But we'll, I'll try. I'll come up with some if somebody doesn't get it. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the first panel of the Trust and, Safety, Trust and Safety Conference. Please take your seats and uh, we'll get started. Hello, my name is uh, Jeff Hancock. I'm the uh, Norman and Harry Chandler Professor of Communication here at Stanford University and the founding director of the Stanford Social Media Lab. I'm also uh, the co-founding co-editor of the Journal of Trust and Safety along with Alex and Shelby. Delighted to be on the team with them. I've really enjoyed uh, working on the journal. Uh, the Journal of Online Trust and Safety was designed for exactly this audience. We believe that there was a gap where the kind of work and research and policy uh, and insights for industry was just missing. And so our goal was to fill that gap by uh, publishing really high quality academic research across disciplines, including computer science, the social sciences like psychology, and um, legal and policy work. So we publish articles in all those spaces and, and try to make the articles fit for those uh, different disciplines. Um, we are trying to uh, hit on three big main things. First, open access. Not everybody can afford the really crazy uh, publishing fees and, and access. We're trying to be, as I said, really cross-disciplinary, so we have an amazing editorial board that provides really expert uh, views across those different disciplines. And we're fast. I am tired as an academic of having nine-month to 18-month reviews and that timeline just simply doesn't work in industry and for civil uh, society organizations. So we publish articles in about three months, or we accept them in about three months. The journal is uh, only about a year old. Its birthday of its first uh, issue is next month, so we're really excited about that. And every time we publish an issue, we have uh, live interviews with the authors. And I've never seen any other journal do that, and I can tell you I absolutely love it. It's really fascinating, so uh, keep your eyes open for that. The journal already has made pretty solid impact. Um, our journal um, papers have been cited in, the NB in NBC, The Guardian, and covered in The Washington Post. When Twitter announced its plans to disclose more transparency data, it cited an uh, article from our journal. And um, an article published in the journal was, was included in Senate testimony about platform transparencies. So it's having an impact. We're also hearing from academics that they're reading it. We're hearing from industry folks that they're paying attention to it. Um, we're trying to do this quickly. We get you to submit a letter of inquiry, which is about a page about what you're planning to do. And we get feedback to you within five days. Um, the editorial team has been really fast and really great about that. Uh, we um, have accepted about one-third of those letters of increase, giving them the green light. So about 35% get the green light. And of those that are uh, given the green light, we have an acceptance rate of about 85%. So our goal is that if you get the green light from us and everything goes well and the reviewers judge it like we do, it's likely to get published. And as I said, uh, the average time between submission and acceptance is three and a half months. So we're trying to keep this really fast. In the panel today, you're going to get a really great sample of some of the excellent work that is been pu being published there. And we'll start it off with uh, Tom Tyler, who's the MacLean Fleming Professor of Law and Professor of Psychology at Yale. 
He's a social psychologist, and as I said, we're trying to make sure that we're getting multiple disciplines in here, which you'll also see in the diversity of authors today. And Tom will talk about self-governance and procedural justice on Twitter. Please welcome Tom. Thank you, Tom. We're not getting any, ah, there we go. Okay, perfect. Well, I want to thank all the Stanford groups for cooperating to bring us this incredible event and also for asking me to speak. Platforms have typically dealt with problems of content moderation using a deterrence model. They've combined different approaches to suppress, to restrict, to deter users, the question we address in this paper is whether a procedural justice approach might work. A procedural justice approach is a regulatory model that tries to build willing acceptance of decisions and willing compliance with rules by creating procedures that users experience as being fair when making decisions that affect users' online experience. The idea of procedural justice is pretty straightforward, although in implementation it would be more complicated. The idea is that if we create procedures that people think are fair, they trust decision makers, they view them as legitimate, they are more accepting of the rules and decisions of authorities, platforms, governments, any kind of authority. Procedural justice comes out of our understanding of how the people who deal with authorities interpret their experience, so it's about essentially the user experience. It has several different elements. People want voice. That means they want to have an opportunity to explain themselves, to present their evidence, to state their case before some decision gets made. Second, people want, actually I'm, Ah, I'm getting ahead of my slides. People want transparency, openness, neutrality, honesty. They want dignity and respect. They want to believe the people with, their, with whom they're dealing care about them, have their well-being at heart. All of these things are elements of thinking that you got a fair procedure. And that leads us to several research questions, which are the basis of the paper that I'm talking about. One question is, who are the people who break rules? And a second question is, given what I said about the normal approach, would it be reasonable to think we could change into a, an approach that emphasizes procedural justice? Well, who do we think are the people who break rules. There's a long history of seeing them through an image of bad actors, rotten apples, people who we think knew they were breaking the rules and did it on purpose, did it intentionally. If that's really true, then a procedural justice approach wouldn't really work very well. So the first thing that we try to do in our study is we try to ask who breaks rules. To do that, we rely on a cross-section of users of Twitter who were surveyed. So what we did is we identified a sample of people who had broken a rule. We ask them to be interviewed about their user experience, so the experience that they had through the regulatory process, which in all of their cases involves some kind of sanction or removal or something. And then their responses were connected to prior violations and then post-intervention violations. 
So that's the basic design that we were interested in using to address the two questions that I mentioned. OK. Well, so that first lets us talk about who broke the rules. Again, the image we have in the back of our mind is these bad apples, rotten apples, bad actors, whatever you want to call them. But what we found was really quite different than that. We found that many people who broke the rules simply hadn't read the rules. In fact, only about 30% of the people involved had read all of the, the rules. Among that 30%, only about half said they had familiarity with the rules. So what we had was a whole group of people who weren't knowing what the rules were and then deciding to violate them. They were people who were confused. They might not be thinking about the rules at all when they were acting and just their ongoing chats with other people. And second, when we asked people why they broke the rules, we got this blizzard of reasons for why people broke rules. And basically, almost all of these really don't show any motivation to break rules that you know exist. Mainly, people say they thought what they did was OK. They thought it was appropriate. They thought it was reasonable. They didn't know anybody would object to it. So basically, what we find is a large group of people who are not prototypical bad actors. They're rather people who are uninformed, confused, thinking about something different. And this is a pool of people that we could imagine could be influenced by a procedural justice strategy because they're not rejecting the rules. They're rather not paying attention to them. So a procedural justice strategy would try to treat them fairly, get them to see the rules are more legitimate, have more trust in the platform, and therefore make more of an effort to understand and follow the rules. OK. Well, in order for that to work, what we would have to do is we would have to have a strategy that varied the fairness of the user experience. So what we did is we asked about various aspects of the experience that people had. One was, did they agree with the decision that was made? Or yes or no, that would be a typical thing that we would think would be the driving factor. But also, we asked them about a variety of different aspects of the procedural justice of the removal process. Now remember, thinking that you got fair treatment is completely different than caring about or accepting the outcome. You can think you lost or you got a bad outcome or you, or you can think you got a good outcome, but we think what people really care about is not that, but whether they got fair treatment. So we asked them about a variety of different aspects of fair treatment. Remember, that's voice. Did you get listened to? Did you get a chance to explain yourself? Accountability and transparency, were the rules followed? Were you treated with courtesy and respect when you dealt with the platform? And then did you think that the people who were making these decisions were trying to do the right thing for you in your case? OK. Now here, I know there are probably variations in experience in dealing with regression. You could trust me, but I will try to explain a little bit what's going on here. It's not an experiment, so we can't randomly assign people to get fair or unfair treatment. But what we do is we assess their level of rule-breaking behavior prior to and following their experience, and then we interview them about the degree to which they thought that their experience was fair. And then we put those factors all into a regression equation to look at the weight of each factor on post-decision rule breaking. So you could say people who just break rules 
in the past will break him in the future. There'd be no effect of procedural justice. But there's a separate effect of procedural justice, and that's what our key point is to you, that if people felt they were fairly treated, then they were more responsible in taking on the obligation to obey the rules in the future. And this is, in our minds, an alternative way of thinking about how we might approach the issue of gaining rule-following behavior that would be buy-in. OK. So let me conclude, then. What are we really trying to say to you? We're saying that, like the legal system, which I see dealing, we're dealing with that a lot in the law school where I work, there's a tendency to think that everybody who breaks the rules is this bad actor who has no values, has no ability to connect themselves to things like legitimacy and trust. We see the same kind of metaphor here often in the online world, and it's just as wrong here in the online world as it is in studies of communities. There's a very large group of people who could be appealed to. Their values could be connected with, and we could motivate self-regulatory actions. And so the point to us would be, how do you do it? And that's where we show you that we have a model of socialization, and that is a model that's based upon procedural justice, and it works. So to me, we might first say, this is a new way to think about how to manage content online. But also, this can be expanded. You don't have to wait until somebody breaks a rule to introduce treating them fairly. You can introduce elements of fairness in the onboarding process. In a different study we did, we sent people periodic messages online just in their stream, emphasizing fair procedures. We also got an effect. So you could think of a whole socialization model where your goal from the beginning to the end was to create basically good online citizens who were willingly following the rules and didn't have to be monitored, didn't have to be sanctioned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. And I'll get you to hold your questions uh, for afterwards. We'll get all of the speakers up for a uh, question and answer session afterwards. Uh, in keeping with the journal's mission of deeply cross-disciplinary work, we go from social psychology to an industry team talking about how to spin up a Zoom a trust and safety um, team from Zoom. Uh, the speakers are Chanel Cornette, who is counsel on the trust uh, and safety team at Zoom. Before that, she worked in the California Attorney General's Legal and Policy Office. She'll be joined by Josh Parecki, who is the Associate General Counsel at Zoom and also their head of trust and safety. Before that, he worked in what seemed like every part of the judicial system except for jail, uh, which is good. And I get you to uh, welcome them about how to spin up a team on trust and safety. All right, how should we do this? Uh, let's see, you, Chanel, you take the mic, because I've got one of these. OK, well, hello, everybody. I think we'll skip right away into the presentation here. All right. So yeah, we're here to talk to you a little bit about how to build a trust and safety team in a year. But the first thing I want to say about it is um, this is sort of a, a unique experience for us. But what we found as we were building the team is it's not so unique. There are lots of companies uh, all over the United States and the world that are in the position now where they're, uh, on, they're receiving abuse or account takeovers or child sexual abuse material. And they don't know what to do because they're not, you know, Meta. They're not Twitter. They're not. They just don't have that level of experience. And so when we um, got to Zoom, as Alex hinted at, we had a huge problem. Um, and the huge problem came in the form of meeting disruptions. Um, and it followed from the fact that um, it followed from the fact that all of a sudden people were using Zoom all over the world. And and when I say using Zoom, just to give you an illustration, in about December of uh, 2019. 
which was you know, pre-pandemic, we were around like 19 million people doing meetings or 19 million meetings a day. And uh, by April, it was a little over 350 million. And in one day in March, we had over 2 million people download the app. Um, so that is scaling. Uh, and scaling fast. Um, and you know, really the credit goes to an amazing engineering team at Zoom that uh, kind of kept the lights on for you all um, as you used Zoom to connect with your families, continue to do business and so forth. But um, Alex had another quote that I love and I actually wrote it down, uh, something about like the water finds all cracks and holy moly, Zoom was a perfect illustration of that, not just in the context of child sexual abuse material but in everything you could imagine that could go wrong in a Zoom meeting. Uh, so before uh, I came and, and eventually Chanel and some of the other, other teammates that we built the team, there was really like two people working trust and safety issues at Zoom, uh, one of which did have some prior trust and safety experience um, and she did not sleep for days. Um, and another person that um, ended up becoming our chief uh, technology officer. So um, Karen Maxim, who's here, is one of a uh, per former person on our team, and Chanel went and interviewed some of these folks to get their experience, and this quote really resonated, which was um, uh, back before we started developing the team, uh, this, this person said, my boss asked me, do you have everything under control? And she, she was like, yes. Uh, but I was thinking, what if I'm out sick? Basically, while I'm on vacation, there's nobody there, it's just me, I'm it. How traumatic is that? Um, you know, and so for those of you that do research on things like content moderators and the impact of, uh, um, on their lives when they're dealing with just horrific things, this one person was like helping to um, hold the tide back. Um, and that, that is an experience that some of you in industry probably are living now, perhaps, um, and again, we wrote this paper for you. Uh, Chanel, go ahead and get started here. Yes. Um, so. Pre, uh, pre pandemic, uh, in around before May of, of 2020, uh, Zoom was primarily a business, uh, business software B2B company. Um, and, you know, our trust and safety team was a function of our customer support um, section out of Zoom. And there was a reason for that because, like, the cases were, the abuse cases were very, um, kind of predictable in a way. Uh, we had like a few uh, bad actors that we knew of. And um, so we saw that like the cases uh, stemmed from uh, ICS meetings, uh, which we at Zoom called sex and drug parties. Illicit content <laughs> and substances. <laughs> um, and so those, those cases were either, um, the reports that we got were from those cases and it would be people that we would kick off uh, that would uh, re, recreate accounts and get kicked off again, or it would be people in those meetings uh, reporting each other. Um, so, so we knew who the bad actors were and, and, and it was very manageable, but um, as, as Josh mentioned, uh, with the pandemic, like that just exploded, our uh, abuse cases skyrocketed, and now, you know, everyone was using Zoom, like everyone in here was using Zoom. Uh, as you see, they hosted the Emmys on Zoom. Um, all of the kids are on Zoom, and, and now, you know, we have to figure out, like, now we have all these cases and all, all of these abuse types that were unpredictable, and, and how, do, how do we manage that? Um, so Zoom implemented a 90-day uh, all-hands-on-deck uh, focus on our privacy, safety, and security functions, and the first thing uh, that was a priority of that was to hire Josh, uh, <laughs> who went on and not only, like, Managed the team, but like built it from scratch. And his first priority uh, was was to build the tools uh, to support our work. Yeah. So I'll switch now to safety by design. You all probably have heard safety by design in a bunch of different uh, settings. There's some governments that are pushing for safety by, by design, which I think conceptually is a really good thing. But let me talk to you about it real quick. For Zoom, what did that mean? Well, it meant that we had a huge volume problem, and you really can't deal with a huge volume problem like high touch. Like, you, it's just impossible. You can't do it through flat emails. It's just impossible, and it also puts a lot of pressure on uh, your analyst team that are dealing with very irate customers. Um, and again, Zoom is people's livelihood during this time, so people took um, their access to Zoom quite seriously. So we really had to focus on how could we design the system with the user in mind, so the user themselves could take certain measures to secure and make safe their meetings. 
And so we did that. We pushed really hard. So that's great. You did the front, we did the front end. We got some user features. We started driving down the meeting disruptions. But then the second thing is, is like how can people report stuff to us, not just so we can take the right action, but so that way we can learn from how those abuse types were happening and then think about how we can build new systems like machine learning and AI to sort of detect that information, surface it more quickly. So to do that, we had to then integrate all of our front end stuff with what, what, what we like to call the middle, right, which is the data. We wanted to be able to grab the data and link it up into our back end systems. Um, our back end systems are the systems that our analysts use, right, to make very quick decisions, like what happened, what's the evidence of what's happening, et cetera. And not only that, we wanted transparency. And you don't want to you don't want to develop a transparency report by reviewing a spreadsheet. For any of you that have developed a transparency report, it's miserable to do it by a spreadsheet. And we actually had to do it. Karen was on a call till four in the morning one night when we pushed out our first uh, transparency report. It's reviewed line by line by line. Not a good approach. So build your system such that you can pull the data in and automatically pass it through, um, and then do it in a secure way because we have to be concerned about things like data privacy. Um, so we focused on that. That was a huge focus, just getting our systems in order. And you'll hear a little bit later, and, and uh, Alex, I know, is a big champion of this. Um, a trust and safety team needs, needs engineers. Like, you just need engineers. Um, because all these solutions depend on engineering. Um, yeah, policy is very important. Policy mm -hmm. and transparency of process, very, very important. But without some really sharp and smart engineers and some product managers, you're going to have a hard time. OK, I think uh, this is me, right? Or is it the first? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. OK, good. Yeah. We divided it up ahead of time to make it smooth. <laughs> Uh, okay, so get involved early. So this is this was so fun um, and just also terrifying. So as all of you that know that you, when you're in industry, there's always a push, right? Like new feature, a new thing. You got to get it out. How are you going to drive growth? Um, and so one of the things that Zoom did was we started to push um, out a pro product called On Zoom, and we have Zoom events as well, which is a fantastic platform if everyone wants to do an event. Um, uh, but in any event. Um, once we did that, it sort of changed the way we had to think about trust and safety, right? Because it's a different product. And not only that, we wanted our product team and we wanted our executives to understand um, you know, what type of abuse could happen on this new, pretty, wonderful user interface that people were going to use. So uh, Karen uh, and I uh, helped create a bunch of different scenarios. Um, and we actually. Um, uh, um, presented the scenarios uh, to our C-level folks um, to try to calibrate um, what their understanding is or what their risk threshold or penchant for what they wanted on the platform or not, and to help us inform how we should be drafting our rules. So we actually, the buy-in, buy-in, buy-in uh, goes before the writing the rules in a sense because we help that to calibrate them. And not only that, to build the system, which we'll get it to in a minute, and we only have three, um, we needed to be able to get the buy-in in order for the executives to say, you know what, I trust you. I trust you, Josh, and my boss, Lynn. Um, you can write the rules because you've shown me that you're trustworthy and, and you'll do this the right, um, the right place. But you have to get involved early as well because you've got to be in there at the beginning of the product to understand how to design it well. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, so after you know, we figured out the rules, we had to figure out how we were going to enforce them and you know, what our analysts, how we were going to structure their decisions. Um, so we didn't want one person making all the decisions, so we developed a... Uh, tier approach where we have four tiers. Uh, the first tier, uh, we um, uh, work with a vendor uh, who is, specializes in trust and safety uh, decisions. And they handle you know, the cases that are very black and white, very uh, easy to decide. Uh, we have some analysts that review their uh, decisions as well. And if they can't make a, you know, a, a judgment on that, they escalate it up to tier two. And that, uh, that's ran by our core team. Uh, they're handling, you know, that's their job. They're uh, 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 making judgments on, on those report cases. And if they can't make a judgment, then they escalate it up to tier three. Uh, and that is comprised of uh, trust and safety leadership. Those are for those harder, you know, harder to classify uh, cases that, you know, we need a little bit more time to decide on. And then finally, uh, we put together a appeals panel, which is, uh, represents our tier four. Um, and those are our very, very, very hard uh, to classify decisions. And the panel is comprised of uh, senior leadership at Zoom, 
Uh, we selected them for their expertise, um, their experience with making really hard judgments, um, their you know thoughtfulness, and um, they they make those decisions. Well, let me let me jump in there real quick. So for that buy-in, buy-in, buy-in uh, thing, we created the appeals panel and got buy-in for it. And let me just give you a quick anecdote. Like, we use this appeals, it's not just senior leadership, sorry, Chanel, um, but our senior leadership is required to nominate across the organization folks to represent because they're stakeholders in the future of Zoom and they know how the product works as well. And so they get uh, brought in and they uh, help us make those decisions. But the buy-in is so important because we had a controversial decision once and we decided, oh, maybe we need to go all the way up to the C-suite and the board to make the decision. And we actually went to the board, and the board said, you have a process, right? And we said, yes. And they said, follow your process. Um, so that's the, the buy-in concept. Sorry, go ahead. No worries. Uh, and then hiring a good mix of people. Uh, you know, we have some folks that we hired that came from the industry, but we also wanted to ensure that um, we hired some really thoughtful people that we, you know, borrowed from government, borrowed from uh, not the nonprofit sector. Um, and, you know, we make sure that whoever we're hiring uh, is really comfortable with the gray areas and, and knows how to make those judgments. It's our time. I've, I'm told we're going to be a slave to this, but which is good. <laughs> but I want to leave you with this really fun picture because this is the our, our part of our just small, small part of our trust and safety team. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Josh and Chanel, for sharing that. I definitely do remember Zoom life deep in the pandemic, so much appreciate all the work you did. Next up, we have our very own Karen Nershi. She is a postdoctoral fellow at the Stanford uh, Internet Observatory. She's a political scientist that thinks about issues around new technology, especially cryptocurrency. She hosted a fantastic workshop in the spring uh, that included the Secret Service and learned a lot about crypto and crypto scams. Today, she's going to be talking about some of the political motivations behind ransomware. Please welcome Karen to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so today I'm going to be presenting co-authored work with Shelby Grossman where we seek to assess the political motivations behind ransomware attacks. Uh, and so um, ransomware is a type of malware that encrypts a user's files uh, and then the attackers behind these attacks will demand a ransom, typically paid in cryptocurrency, uh, in order to send a decryption key. And so uh, one major attack that really brought this on a lot of people's radar was the attack against the Colonial Pipeline in May of 2021, which disrupted the flow of uh, the supply of oil to the east coast of the United States and really highlighted that ransomware attacks can present a national security threat. And so typically people have thought about ransomware as just a form of crime in which uh, the actors are financially motivated. So one of the analogies that's sometimes given is that uh, it's as though somebody is trying the doorknob of, of a houses on a street, and when they find one unlocked, they're gonna go in and steal from that house. And similarly, in terms of uh, cybersecurity, at attackers are looking for vulnerabilities across computer systems, and when they find one, they're going to carry out a an attack. However, some recent developments suggest that there may actually be a political component in some of these attacks. So uh, for one, many of these groups are based out of Eastern Europe. This is in part because of the supply of uh, technically skilled labor. There are a number of uh, technical universities in the former Soviet countries, and a lot of these graduates then uh, have few job opportunities in the legitimate sector. Uh, there's also been historically weak law enforcement, particularly in Russia, which has generally refrained from uh, arresting individuals involved in cybercrime, including uh, ransomware, and refused to extradite these criminals as well. And so in a seeming detente, many of these groups based from this region will avoid uh, infecting, will, will avoid using malware against computers based in Russia or Russia's broader sphere of influence. So this is oftentimes written directly into the malware. Uh, so our research question is, to what degree are the actions of Russia-based ransomware groups connected to the, to the political goals of the Russian state? And so to do this, we collected data about the victims of ransomware attacks, 
Um, and in particular, there's been a recent trend called double extortion, whereby attackers uh, also exfiltrate data from their victims, typically companies, and then they threaten to leak the data online if the company refuses to pay an additional uh, ransom, hence the double extortion. So to facilitate these attacks, a lot of the groups involved will maintain sites on the dark web where they post about each of their victims and basically threaten them uh, with releasing their data. And importantly, they share information about all of their victims, including the ones that ultimately pay and don't have their data leaked. Uh, so in total, our data set includes over 4,000 victims, and for each, we located in which country it was. So uh, they're located across 102 countries, and it covers between May 2019 and May 2022. And so if you're interested in where these victims are geographically, and so again, most of them are going to be companies, sometimes government offices, uh, but as you can see, the vast majority of the victims have been in the United States, which accounts for just over half of all victims in our data set. Uh, but as you can see, uh, a number of countries have actually been hit with these attacks, and sort of the next countries after the U.S. are Canada and major European countries that have had the greatest number of victims. And so, uh, in particular, we analyzed six countries that had the most attacks, so the United States, Canada, France, Italy, Germany, and the United Kingdom. And in total, these countries account for uh, over three quarters of all the victims in our data set. And we're looking specifically at the timing of attacks close to elections. So we're looking at elections across these six countries. So uh, national level elections, the, the French presidential election, for example, in France, and the US presidential election in the US. And we estimate the following model, where we're looking at the number of attacks in a given country on a given day. And our primary independent variable here is an election dummy, which indicates whether it was in the period before an election, one month, two months, or three months before an election. We also include country fixed effects and uh, month year fixed effects because the number of attacks are varying across countries and over time. And so when we run that, uh, we look at this for both groups based in Russia and groups based outside of Russia. And what you can see is a coefficient plot after running this model uh, for, for various times. Uh, we're looking at the, the probability of attacks. And on the x-axis here, you have the number of months before an election. So starting at six months before an election, going up to one month before an election. And as you can see, right about around four months, we see a divergence in the behavior between these Russia-based groups and non-Russia-based groups, uh, non-Russia ones are in pink and the others are in blue. And you can see that there's uh, an increase in the, in the likelihood of an attack about four months before an election uh, from these Russia-based groups. And that continues for the remaining months before an election. And we, so we see, uh, well, there's no statistically significant increase in the number of attacks by non-Russia-based groups. So this highlights um, a clear distinction in the behavior be between these two types of groups, uh, with an increase in attacks by Russia-based groups before elections, which suggests that there's some kind of political connection here driving the number of attacks that they're doing before these elections. Uh, and so there are at least three possible explanations for this. One could be that these Russia-based groups are targeting election infrastructure, so voter rolls, things like that, trying to disrupt a country's ability to actually carry out an election. They could also be trying to uh, carry out a perception hack. So in this case, they wouldn't actually have an attack that's big enough to really disrupt an election, but they create a lot of fear and uncertainty around the outcome of the election uh, because there's been some type of hacking event. A second possibility might be that Russia sees, uh, because Russia sees these countries as their adversaries and the period uh, before an election is a politically sensitive time, um, the, the Russia, Russia might be trying to create some chaos, um, cause unrest in this politically sensitive time. And so in particular in the past, uh, Russian linked uh, cyber actors have attacked um, the private sector or the public sector in Estonia. Uh, so things like uh, government offices, but also financial um, industries and communications and technology and so forth. Uh, so this is one possibility as well. A third potential explanation is that what we're actually capturing is a sort of spillover effect. So we know that the Russian government has uh, prompted, has been behind other types of cyber attacks before elections. So for example, the DNC hack in the 2016 election, also a hack of Macron's campaign in France. Um, so it could be that if these same actors are carrying out these types of cyber attacks for the Russian government and also tend to do ransomware on, on their spare time, it could be that the cyber exploits that they generate for other cyber attacks 
are being reused to carry out ransomware attacks, which leads to an increase in the number of these attacks before elections as well. So to probe the pl plausibility of these three explanations, we look at the number of attacks by sector. And so in particular, what you see here are uh, in blue, it's attacks against election infrastructure. And we see that there's a slight increase in the number of attacks in the one and two month periods before elections. So it offers some support for this um, election infrastructure or perception hack hypothesis. Uh, we don't see support for this causing chaos hypothesis, which is the green color, uh, which are the communications sector, finance sector, utilities, and energy. Um, but we also see an increase in the number of attacks in all other sectors beyond the ones I've just described. Uh, so this suggests that there might also be some type of spillover effect happening uh, as well. And uh, so we also look at qualitative evidence. And in particular, there are a set of leaked chat logs from one of the biggest ransomware groups called Conti, uh, which received over $180 million in ransom. And these chats span between January 2021 and February 2022. And this group is based out of Russia. Uh, so the chats reveal information about the group's structure. It often has between 65 and 150 employees. They have differentiated roles, including HR recruiters, project managers, coders, um, researchers, etc. cetera. Uh, the chats involve a lot of mundane office chatter. Uh, so discussions about raises, requests for bonuses, times off, time off, uh, complaints about managers, complaints about employees. Uh, but it also reveals some interesting information about co connections between the group and its leadership and the Russian government. So in particular, uh, the FSB, the Russian Security Service, commissioned Conti to carry out a hack against Bellingcat, a journalistic organization. The group also received a payment from an external source, which could be the FSB or the Russian government. And top members of the gang had knowledge of national and international law enforcement investigations into, uh, into ransomware. Um, and this was information that they received from uh, members of the Russian government. So based on this evidence, we argue that Russia maintains loose ties with ransomware groups. So uh, these Russian groups operate as independent criminal organizations, but they'll occasionally perform favors for the Russian government. And in exchange, Russia generally offers these groups safe harbor from prosecution and refuses to extradite them. And so in exchange for this relationship, Russia receives plausible deniability from the group's actions on the world stage. So certainly things like meddling before an election is a highly controversial act, and they can keep a distance from these types of activities. And so uh, more generally, our research suggests that cyber warfare scholars should embrace a broader conception of international security threats in the cyber realm, including particularly threats from cyber crime and ransomware in particular. And uh, thank you so much, and I look forward to your questions. Karen. Thank you, Karen. Uh, next up, we have Michael Sato. He is a clinical and forensic psychologist uh, and is the research director at the Royal Ottawa Healthcare Group. Uh, he's also a professor in psychiatry at the University of Ottawa. His work focuses on pedophilia, sexual offending against children, and more recently online. Today, he'll be talking about parents' perceptions of explicit child image sharing. Thank you. Here, please welcome Michael. Good, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, I thought the order was a little bit different, so I thought, hey, maybe I don't have to get up and speak. I can just enjoy the conference uh, like the other participants. I, I, don't, I don't know how I felt about it. I was sort of disappointed I wasn't going to speak and then kind of relieved. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to talk to you uh, today. This is actually an example uh, of what Julie was talking about earlier in the fireside chat. This is a collaboration uh, between academic uh, uh, researchers and uh, nonprofits in this uh, online child safety space. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, the results of a survey that the Thorn had conducted uh, several years ago that uh, my PhD student Kaylee Roche and I were able to uh, reanalyze, uh, actually analyze in a different way, and uh, look at some uh, ideas that we had about uh, the role that parents can play in terms of keeping their kids safe online. So, um, I, I know many people in this audience would already be familiar with this, and there was a bit of allusion uh, earlier about uh, the role of self-generated image sharing. So I, I'm just going to call it sexting because that's the way the public usually refers to it. But by sexting, I'm talking about uh, the use of any you know, communication technologies to send sexually explicit images or videos, uh, nudes or 
you know, similar kind of content. Um, and so one of the things that I think we as a society and people involved in online trust and safety have to grapple with is that sexting is a thing now, right? It's, it, is, it is part of, uh, part of social behavior uh, among adults and young people. So for example, in this um, meta-analysis, which is a systematic review of uh, quite a large number of studies uh, looking at the prevalence of sexting by young people, you can see that uh, in 2018, across all studies, it was about 15% of kids had sent sex, uh, over a quarter had received them, 12% uh, of them had reshared them with uh, or without consent of the person depicted, and 8% of them had their own images or videos leaked without their consent. So uh, again, as alluded to earlier, it was actually perfect, and I didn't communicate with Julie at all uh, in terms of setting this up. That is a concern, right? It, it, is, it is a social behavior, it is part of relationship building, it is part of dating, but there's a risk involved in this behavior because those images can be shared without your consent. You know, so if it's an image sent to a, a boyfriend or girlfriend, that person they could lose their phone, they could be hacked, they could intentionally share it with somebody else, they could uh, share it with others as revenge because you broke up with them. And now we have the problem of that image possibly being new child sexual abuse material that enters the wild. That is one of the, I think, increasing sources of uh, child sexual abuse materials. Um, it can be used to bully and harass uh, the young person. And in some cases, it can be used to extort them for either more images or for sexual activity or for other things. So really, this survey, I think, helps look at this question of where are parents at with this, knowing that there is this behavior that their kids might engage in, uh, but that they might be at risk of. So uh, I'm going to frame this a little bit. The way we approach the data that were in this survey is in terms of parental mediation, which is a fancy academic way of saying parents matter. Right? With, with kids, especially younger kids, parents are the first line of defense after, arguably, the tech ecosystem in terms of the features and processes in place. But certainly within the family where that kid lives, the parents are the first line of defense. So parents can engage with this in different ways. They could uh, take a more passive approach where they may be aware of where their kids uh, are online. You know, I know my kid uh, uses Discord to talk to his friends. I know he's uh, on certain games online, et cetera, et cetera. Um, parents could take a more restrictive, a little more active, but restrictive approach, which is sort of the classic parental controls, screen limits, you can't you know, go on this or that app until you're at least 13 or 14 or 15 years old. Um, or they can take a more, uh, I'll describe it as active approach, which is talking to the kids about their concerns, talking to them about the potential risks, and talking to them about mitigation. And this is, uh, parental mediation theory is actually developed in terms of parent engagement with media, but for, from my perspective, it's basically kind of, you know, the expression of parenting, right? Par parenting can be more passive and it can be more active across more domains than just being online. Um, and also, I'll sort of put a side statement right here saying that I don't think talking to your kids about being online is sort of an option anymore because it's not like, well, some kids will or will not be online. It's built in. So to me, talking to your kids about being online is like talking to your kids about looking both ways before you cross the street, or talking about sex education, or talking about how to respond if somebody's bullying you at school, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'll try not to speechify too much, but that's one, one thing I'll, I'll stand strong about. So uh, the study is based on the results of this anonymous online market panel survey of uh, over 400 US parents, uh, where the survey asked questions about their demographic characteristics, like age and gender, sexual orientation, income level, and so forth. Asked them about technology rules, you know, screen time, parental controls, et cetera. Asked them about their own use and awareness of social media. So do the parents have social media accounts? Do, are they familiar with things like secondary accounts or you know, Finstas, uh, to use one slang term? Um, do they talk to their kids? about these things, and what are the parents' attitudes and, and perceived norms uh, about uh, image sharing? So in particular, what do they think their kids' friends and their kids' school peers uh, think about this? And we were interested in how those different variables relate to three particular uh, variables. One having to do with talking to your kid, so that more active engagement with your kid about image sharing expecting that your child has sent images, which is a sort of precursor of being prepared to talk to your kid, and also being prepared if that kid does share their image and that image is leaked. And then that last variable that we looked at is uh, the parents' perceived preparedness to talk to their kids, or sorry, to handle it, 
uh, the situation if their kids' images had been leaked. So as I said, a survey uh, of, of just a little over 400 U.S. parents with kids, at least one child between the age of 9 and 17. Uh, I won't read all these things out to you, but you can see this is a, a, a representative sample across geographic regions, across race and ethnicity, slight majority uh, uh, female, uh, the large majority cisgender and heterosexual, uh, uh, three quarters of them married, and on average with two children. Uh, I've already mentioned a little bit about the domains, but just uh, uh, again, so you can see the specific ones, things like age, gender, sexual uh, identity, gender identity, and so forth. Um, some examples of what I'm talking about in these uh, other uh, different domains. Um, and in particular, right, we're really interested in that last, uh, or at least I'm very interested as a psychologist in this last column, which is about the parents' added, own attitudes about sharing or resharing images and whether they had done it themselves and then their expectations regarding their kids, friends, and school peers. So this is the results of a regression analysis, which has been mentioned actually already in a couple of the previous presentations. So regression analysis, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is basically saying, is there an association between one variable on one side with the things that we're interested in trying to explain, taking into account all the other variables? So it's not just whether it's correlated, but that it's uniquely correlated with the outcome. So first outcome is talking to your kids about image sharing. Uh, I actually found this encouraging. I thought it was going to be a smaller percentage. Two-thirds of parents said they had talked to their kids about image sharing. As you can see, it's predicted by some demographic variables, like uh, female parents or caregivers were more likely to do this. Uh, the older the kid is, uh, in terms of uh, the child that you know, they're answering about, um, the parents with more rules were also more likely to talk to the kids. Uh, parents were familiar with secondary accounts where kids, you know, might just have a smaller account that's only known to their closest friends. Uh, and then the expectation that their uh, child's friends had sent images. The next variable we looked at is expectation that the kids had sent images. I found 39% of them thought their kids had already sent images which I found really interesting because in a companion survey that the Thorne had also commissioned, uh, another market panel survey of almost 1,000 children, um, it's about 15%. And I actually showed you the results of that review that it was about 15%. So parents overestimate the likelihood that their kids um, have done this. And again, it's predicted by a few things, actually not by demographics, more to do with attitudes and, and those norms. Uh, and then we didn't do very well in terms of predicting preparedness if your child's images had been leaked. And it was actually a weird result that I'm not sure what it means. Instead of it being more parents who are more comfortable talking to their kids or more prepared, it's actually the parents who are less comfortable uh, talking to the kids who are more prepared. So I'm not quite sure what that's about. Um, but I do think that it's important to highlight that uh, in particular, first off, you know, parents do vary in their willingness to talk to their kids or their perceived readiness uh, or um, um, expectations that their kids uh, had sent images. Um, I think that the, the fact that the attitudes and norms came out as consistent predictors, and by the way, I'll mention that companion survey of children as well, attitudes and norms were among the best predictors. So that's really important because as a psychologist, as a social scientist, I see those as potential targets for intervention, right? Like we can shift attitudes and norms. We did it with drunk driving, we did it with wearing seat belts, we did it with smoking, we can do it on this. Um, and of course then the question is, well how can we shift those attitudes and norms, right? How can we work with parents? Because, you know, we were looking at this parent-child communication in a very blunt way, which is, have you talked to your kid about image sharing? That doesn't tell us anything about the quality of that conversation. It doesn't tell us if the parents were helpful or unhelpful. It doesn't tell us if the kids found it helpful or unhelpful. There's a lot more to unpack there. But I do think that um, parents are the first line of defense. It's a really important target for online trust and safety beyond the you know, safety by design kinds of questions. I would say safety by design is not only about the child user, but about the parents of those child users. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention and time and look forward to talking to you. Thank you, Michael. Our last presentation today uh, will be presented by Himanshu Zaid and Morgan Wack. They're both uh, PhD students at the University of Washington and in the uh, Center uh, for an informed public. Himanshu is doing his PhD in the uh, human-centered design and engineering 
uh, department and focuses on design, affordances, and, and building better online platforms. And Morgan is in the uh, political science department, and he's focused on election integrity issues around technology, especially in the global south. Today, they'll present an audit of Google search results uh, with respect to misinformation pathways. Please welcome to the stage. Thank you. Important stuff. All right, hello everyone. I am Himanshu. Uh, and I'm Morgan. And we are excited to be sharing the results of our audit that we did on the Google search headlines. Uh, and let me see how this thing works. All right. Uh, uh, specific to election-related topics, uh, talk, we are talking about presidential election 2020. Uh, I do want to quickly make a note that the work benefited by some amazing collaborators, uh, Martin, uh, Kate, Ryan, Jason, Jevin, all of us at Center for an Informed Public at University of Washington. And I think apart from us, Kate is also somewhere in the audience. Uh, so uh, presidential election 2020, as we all know, was quite a historic one. While the election resulted in a clear, conclusive victory of one of the presidential candidates, uh, something which was validated by several American organizations, including the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency, and uh, also reiterated by the US General Attorney Bill Barr. Even then, there's a lot of skepticism about what the integrity of the election really was. So much so that about one third of American population, even today, uh, believes that the election was actually stolen. Uh, they refer to it as something called a big lie, which it was not. Uh, with that in mind, we wanted to investigate how does this big lie show up on the search bar. Now, there's a lot of research that has happened on social media platforms pertaining to the civic discourse about topics, you know, kind of uh, election, but not as much has been uh, seen on the search engine platforms. Now, uh, search engine platforms actually constitute a primary source of information for about, I think, 65% of the Americans, and that is huge. Uh, now, given that Google search, uh, I think, has a majority stake in, in, in that population, we wanted to determine what if and how the Google search service uh, might serve as a potential gateway to content which undermines public trust in election processes, election institutions, and election uh, uh, results. Uh, now, what you see on the slide is, let's say if you go on Google and if you just type in a search term, uh, in this case, election, you get back information in the form of like several snippets of uh, information it includes search results, it includes videos, it includes uh, uh, what other people asked for. And what you don't see on the slide here is like sometimes you also get advertisements. So that is what we really wanted to look into. And a quick note, we only looked at the headlines, so we are not really talking about the content of these articles or the videos. Uh, with that in mind, we started to investigate this question from four different dimensions. So the first one was we wanted to compare the different mediums of information. We wanted to compare how does the video, how do the videos compare with uh, the general search results, with the advertisements and the stories. Uh, we are talking about the amount of misleading content in the headlines from each of these. Uh, the second one was the location of search. We were curious what happens if, let's say, you're searching for something like, how do I vote from here in the Bay Area, versus, let's say, someone does the same search uh, in a small rural town somewhere in New York. Uh, to do that, we distributed US in five different zones. As you see on the top right of the slide, uh, the five zones where we went for the uh, Northeast, the Southeast, Southwest, Midwest, and the Western region. And in each of the, these zones, we identified four different locations. Two of them were major urban locations. One of them was a relatively smaller urban location. And the fourth one was a much, much smaller rural area. Uh, so that gives us like 20 locations, uh, Pan America. The third dimension was when we wanted to see how does the phrasing of what you really search for differs. So we had two different kinds of search terms. Again, what you see on the slide, uh, the bottom right, we had one which was general term, so how do I vote, where do I vote? 
versus the other kind where we are talking about someone going and actively searching for a more conspiratorial term, something like late ballots or election fraud. Uh, the fourth one was where we wanted to see what different media domains are involved in serving any kind of misleading content to the American public, if at all that happens. Great. So just a quick overview of the data and the coding process that we use for this. The data was selected, like Himachu said, on headlines specifically. And I know this might come as a shock to most of you, but not always do people who come across an article or a video, do they actually read the article or watch the video before you share the content. And so looking at this, there's a lot of evidence that people actually take away a lot of their perceptions about the underlying content from just the headlines themselves. And so we use this as a proxy, but also as a way of getting at the perceptions that people may have encountered when looking at this type of content. And so this data came from searches that we did a month before and a month after the election across the locations mentioned by Himachu, uh, four times a day across these states and across these regions. And so this brought us to our coding scheme. Our coding scheme was based on journalistic best practices in headline construction. And so these included uh, basically centering on facticity, so using terms like false accusations and misinformation to present uh, news stories, uh, narrowly avoiding kind of problematic groups or highlighting problematic groups, and also ensuring that headlines matched underlying content. And so with those in mind, we trained coders to look at two primary categories, the first of which was a stance category, which looked at whether or not uh, the headline itself could have affected perceptions of election integrity. And so we asked our coders to consider the headline the day it was presented, the day we captured it in our data, and to determine whether it could have sown distrust, imparted trust, or provided information about the election. The second primary categorization was about promotion. And so these were headlines that not only did one of these things, but also seemed to be deliberately attempting to impact perceptions of election integrity. And so for an example of this in the negative sense, instead of something like Georgia voters worried about voter suppression, the headline would read something like guns, lies, and ballots set on fire. This is voter suppression in 2020. We employed the coding scheme that Morgan just described on our data, and a uh, few of the things that struck out, one of them being that we found out that the video headlines was where uh, most of the misleading content was served to the American public when you compare that with other mediums of information, which was uh, the general search results, the advertisements, and the top stories, uh, something which you can clearly see in the bar chart on the top right. Uh, in fact, we found out that videos had as much as, th they were as much as three times more likely to have misleading content than the other mediums of information. Uh, again, highlighting that we only analyze the headlines and not the content. So uh, it might be that more damaging content in the videos actually was served under a relatively more innocuous headline. Uh, the other thing which we also observed was this differential between the amount of misleading content that appears in uh, videos as compared to other medium of information. That differential went on increasing as we started looking at the data from October 5th to when the election happened somewhere around November 3rd to till uh, December 3rd. Uh, one of the important takeaways that we have over here is that we know that videos are you know, accessible to a lot of people and platforms have been trying to involve like, more and more uh, platform videos within like, uh, the search engine. Uh, we want to make sure that we actually are more mindful and search engines are even more prepared in terms of discerning misleading content in, uh, in the video format if we actually want to involve more videos, whether it is from TikTok or Instagram onto the main search engines and give them a more higher visibility and access. Uh, Having said that, if we go beyond the videos, we actually found out that Google did an amazing job in terms of limiting the amount of misleading content that uh, comes up in general in the uh, search results. Uh, we actually started the research anticipating that maybe if you are located in a more urban region, uh, you might see different kind of information and your information ecosystem that was served by Google would be different than what you might get if you were located in a much smaller rural region. Uh, we were proven wrong and we are very happy about that. Uh, we actually found out that across Pan America at the 20 locations where we uh, did this audit, uh, the, search, the, the search results that they got were mostly similar. Uh, one thing I would highlight is that though uh, the 
number of campaign ads that were received in swing states were much more than what they were received in the non-swing states. Uh, that brings us to the other important takeaway, which is that uh, we just need to do a little bit better than what we are doing in terms of how we are coming up with our transparency reports. Uh, we know that Google already does uh, curate like a transparency report, but we did have some campaign ads, uh, a very few of them being political disinformation, uh, which because of how the idea of like what is political has been defined did not make it to the transparency report. All right, so I'll go quickly here, but one of the encouraging results was across the phrasing. So you may have mentioned earlier, you may remember that we split our keyword searches into two groups, one that's general election terms and one that's conspiratorial terms. And so the general election terms produced far less uh, disruptive content or content that had the pr ability to change perceptions on integrity of the election. So we think see this as a great sign. If you're an ordinary user and you're just searching for things like where do I vote, election results, these types of things, you are unlikely to come across content that could have altered in a negative way your perceptions of the election. On the other hand, if you were deliberately searching for conspiratorial terms, there was a much higher chance that you would come across this type of content. And we see this as a, a worry that's obviously um, understandable, but somewhere we, we think there can be more action done. Uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that the users searching for these things believe these things already. It could just be that they want to learn more about them. And since they're being directed to these types of sites, it's an area for improvement. A couple ways to get about this would be potentially performing autofill searches to lead people in other directions or to highlight legitimate sources on these types of issues in real time. And finally, looking at media domains, um, we did find a rightward skew in the domains themselves, uh, with some exceptions on things like voter suppression and other types of issues. But I think more interesting to this crowd is the, the role of legacy media. Although on average, or the particular headline, the percentages of disruptive content was very low for legacy media outlets, because they are so much larger, they have such a wider reach, and the headlines themselves are shared much more often than headlines from smaller organizations and outlets, there's a much higher chance, and in total, there were more headlines that reached uh, ordinary people from these legacy outlets than we would have expected. And we think this is an area for uh, improvement where you can kind of focus on headlines that are being spread far and wide, and it can narrow down while improving on costs and saving time. So just to reiterate, uh, I'm going to go through a few of our key points here. Iterating and, and improving the use of the search bar, the use of search terms to try to limit conspiratorial content and how it reaches individual users and how the headlines necessarily express that content. We find that as important. The capacity to manage video headlines, particularly in the aftermath of elections when a lot of these videos pop up with a lot of minimal content regulations. And finally, and a bit self-servingly, uh, cooperation with researchers to help limit the time necessary and the amount of these audits that can be done so that in the future uh, we can continue to improve these uh, for a number of search engines. Thank you. Thank you guys, really appreciate that. Um, can I get the uh, speakers to join me on stage here for our Q&A? Uh, while well, I'll do that, I'll thank you all for being right on time. Nobody went over, that's fantastic. While they're getting, yeah, yeah, I, I was very happy to not have to come down. I'll be, that's great. While they're getting set up, does anybody have any questions about the Journal of Trust and Safety? If not, now you can at, find me or Shelby uh, or Alex anywhere uh, in the conference over the next two days. And let's open it up for uh, Q&A. Dan, do you have somebody over on that side? Yeah, I think so. Oh. Sorry. Oh, it's okay, thank you. Uh, regarding the last lecture that we were just listening, where in the industry do we have an oracle that defines what's a conspiracy? So can, you, can you say that one more time? I think I missed it. Yeah, sure. Where in the industry can we find an oracle that really defines what is a conspiracy? Because it's a very silver lining between censorship and everything else. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're, you're right. We took the conspiracy terms essentially at the time of the development of the project. And so we took terms that were being used in conspiracies online prior to the election and used those to kind of iterate out. Um, I think being able to discern what is true and false information is a a very contested area for research and one that I think has grown and become a lot, a lot more robust in recent years. I mean, it's something that we do at, at the Center for an Informed Public. I think the recommendations for research that is explicitly false and research that may or may not be false and be more misleading are varied. And um, I think we're looking forward to working with, with companies to try to improve those things so you can address them in different ways. Thank you. 
Do we have anybody over there, John? Any questions on that side of the room? Hi, thank you all for the wonderful presentation. I have a question too for the last speaker. Um, so during your coding scheme, you mentioned that you were looking for things that actively promote distrust. Do you have any ideas or insights when something is not actively promoting mistrust but can still lead to misinformation? This is the problem with going last. Everyone remembers the details. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you for the question. Yeah, I think we, we mostly framed the paper around the promotion of distrust articles. We saw them as the most problematic, and we wanted to, to really narrow in on those. But I do think that there are a lot of takeaways to be had from the more the discussion with journalists and subject experts on how to construct a good headline. So that when you're presenting papers or when Google is putting uh, papers or any other search engine on their platform, they're presenting the content in a way that doesn't mislead or doesn't have people judge what is the underlying content prior to putting it up, even if it isn't necessarily trying to actively promote distrust. Thanks. John? Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Carly, um, and my question is for Michael. Um, your presentation was really amazing, very enriching. Um, one thing that came up during the opening presentation was that the abuse can come from the parent themselves, um, or one parent. And so I'm wondering, I know I don't, uh, want to ask outside of the research scope, but I was wondering um, if you encountered anything in that work of um, speaking to maybe one parent or about the, uh, the, the child themselves about that relationship. Sure, yeah, no, I, actually I, I love, I like the Q&A part better than the talk part because I hear myself talk in my head all the time. <laughs> uh, that doesn't sound right, does it? But you know what I mean. Um, so you can ask me anything. So there definitely is research on that. Um, if we're thinking about child sexual abuse materials, this actually is a, another collaboration um, that I had with the, the, our friends at Thorne uh, and also with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children where I believe this was the first time external researchers had access to NCMEC data where we looked at um, two of their data sets, one having to do with identified victims and the takeaway, which has since been replicated in uh, other research done in Australia and Canada, is that the younger the child in child sexual abuse material content, the more likely a member of the family was involved in the production of it. Because in my mind, it's to do with access and opportunity, right? With a teenager, you might talk them into sharing pictures of themselves on webcam, but with a really young child, we're talking about a parent or another trusted ad adult close to them. So that's a. That's one of the reasons I actually got into uh, my interest in research on online sexual offending is that it's not separate from what's going on uh, in physical space, right? It's uh, a lot of child sexual abuse, sadly, is committed within families. Some of that abuse is recorded and becomes CSAM and, and so forth. So they're, to me, they're all linked, which is one of the reasons that uh, you know, I'm very interested in the online space as well. Great, thanks. That one there. Side of the room. No, it looks like this side of the room is a little more active today. Good, good. Uh, great. Thank you. Uh, my question is also for Michael. Um, you talked a lot about kind of parents' perceptions and how they can be actively involved in talking about these dangers with their kids. But I was wondering about um, the inherent like tech literacy debt of a lot of parents of being able to talk about these things with their kids mm -hmm. and whether you saw any kind of sentiment from parents about that and if you have any recommendations of how to maybe help bridge that gap or how parents who don't feel particularly tech literate can still have those conversations effectively. That's great, thanks. Um, you're not a plant, I don't know you, so it's <laughs> such a great lead question. First, first off, it gives me an opportunity to realize, I, I, I sat and I realized I didn't mention uh, our collaborators at Thorne specifically, Amanda and Melissa, uh, who were involved in, in the research on the Thorne side. So I wanted to correct that. Second, I'm mentioning them because they actually just came out with the results of a new survey they did with parents um, that covered some of the same ground, also asked about the impact of COVID on it, and I think actually does a nice job of getting more into the nuance of it. So things like you know, the tech uh, awareness debt that you're talking about with kids and, and parents, um, and also some more about sort of like you know, the specific kinds of things to talk about beyond just, hey, we're gonna talk about online risky behavior, right? It's like, well, what, what do you say then? Um, 
with the tech literacy part, as a parent myself and as somebody who's been thinking a lot about the impact of, of parent-child communication and sex education, I actually am not as concerned about the tech literacy debt uh, as, as some people are because it's not really about the app or the platform, right? It's about the function. So, so if, and I actually don't know. What are, what are the cool apps now? I don't know. I'm old. I have no idea. But it doesn't matter because what matters is if it's an app that allows you to interact with strangers, there's a chance a stranger is going to ask you to do something that makes you uncomfortable. If it allows uh, for photo sharing, there's a chance that they're either going to send you pornographic images or ask you for images. So parents need to know about that, unfortunately. They need to know about these possible risks online. But it doesn't, it doesn't have to be, I need to know about the latest app that are cool with kids because Part of it is, um, you know, I'm, and I'm being kind of an idealist here, if you're having that communication with your kid, it goes both ways. If, if your kid feels comfortable with you because you brought this up, they'll tell you, oh, the kids at my school are starting to talk about this new app that does this. And you'll learn from your kid. It goes, it goes both ways. Um, yeah, thank you. Great, and I just completely agree with that point. To think less about the tech or the app and more about the functions that it affords. I think that's really important. Back there, Dan. Um, and my question is for Tom. Um, so I was really curious about the idea of um, that you kind of bring about bringing compliance into this space of trust and safety, which. Um, I know you've worked on a long time in the criminal justice system and all of your paper was excellent. What I'm curious about is this idea of kind of the, tr the transparency paradox. The idea that the more transparency you bring, the more withholding people sometimes are, knowing that they're being watched or knowing that they have access to some type of transparency. And so what I'm curious about is, do you think that there's any type of transparency paradox that like might be at play in the model that you're discussing as tr with transparency as a solution? to this kind of, to this construct? Or do you think that like, kind of by focusing on self-reporting of how people are experiencing the, the effects of trust and safety that you're kind of avoiding some of those difficulties? Well, I think the thing I would emphasize from the model is that transparency is really focused on the platform explaining clearly to people how they're making decisions like what are the rules, how are they applied, how is that related to your particular case. And all of the evidence that we've seen is that people feel that having that information reflects fair treatment, that they should, they should understand how the rules are applied, what the rules are, what part of the rules was re reflective of their particular case. So I think in that, instance, I don't see that it's a problem. Great, thank you. John. Hi, this is a question for Josh. Um, could you share with us a particularly tricky scenario that your department's had to get involved with? And can you share how the newly formed department was able to deal with that? So a particular tricky scenario. Um, Let's see, what am I comfortable talking about? Actually, so, <laughs> so usually what happens with us in the few scenarios, I'm gonna be a little general, but I think it'll give you what you want. Um, uh, a really good example of that is actually what uh, led to the creation of our academic freedom policy. So we had a, a series of events that involved an individual that was associated with a designated terrorist organization. And we had to make the decision, because a cer certain universities were hosting that person as a speaker using Zoom, uh, we had to make the decision as to whether we would uh, deplatform that event. Um, so that's sort of something that got us thinking really hard, right? Because you sort of do an analysis of, like, is that, from a US law perspective, material support of terrorism? Eh, it'd be a stretch, but possibly. Um, you know, uh, or do we, as in principle, want to allow this person to use our platform? But then that created some really sticky questions for us, like what are we, where do we exist in the stack, which is one of our favorite discussion points, and, and how should people view us? Are we dumb pipes? And there's some people in here that will appreciate that reference. Um, you know, and so what are our responsibilities in that context, and particularly given the certain types of uses of Zoom, and universities used Zoom. 
And so when we think about that, it's like, what, where, do, where do we want to be involved in that decision-making process? And it was really hard. And we took a decision ultimately to deplatform the event, as I said. But as a result, we started engaging actually with a, with a bunch of different universities and community college leadership and other academics. We had a great conversation with a few academics that are in this room as well on YouTube. Um, and we, uh, and Karen helped lead this. Uh, we developed our academic freedom policy where we tried to be, to your point, very transparent about um, how we think about those circumstances and, and when we may take that very dramatic decision to ultimately suppress speech in that environment. Um, so that, that's probably the best example and then all the work that we did to sort of be really clear how we think about it and when we would take this very, very drastic step. Um, that followed, uh, initially the first event, we didn't have our tier reviewed system. We developed our tier reviewed system after that. And as a result, in a sense of that saying like, oh, there's gonna be some really sticky um, uses of Zoom. And one more quick answer, which is, um, you know, during one of the discussions with the universities that were involved in sort of benchmarking our creation of the academic freedom policy, somebody asked the question, which was a really good one. They said, well, is Zoom prepared for the fact that universities may just default to Zoom because it's ultimately cheaper um, from a security perspective or otherwise, to host very controversial speakers <laughs> on Zoom. And so that was a little bit you know, scary for us too to realize that th that might be something we have to wrestle with uh, more often. Um, but the ultimate point that we tried to make is like we really wanna build some muscle and process transparency um, to note that, pe that you know, we have a process for this, we can rely on that process, uh, we have stakeholders that are involved in that process, and uh, and then build some confidence in it. Thanks, Josh. Hello, uh, my name is Arthur. I from Utrecht University. I work on ethics of technology, and my question is to Tom Tyler. Um, it concerns how you balance the values in ethics, uh, national law, and international law when you're in procedural justice, uh, especially the um, maybe rule of technology and rule of law uh, to make sure that whatever decision is made uh, complies not just with um, internal procedural rules but international law as well. Well, let's put it this way. I'm a psychologist and from the point of view of psychologists, what we're asked to do is to talk about how you can have a regulatory system that affects the behavior of the people who are within it. So to make an analogy to law, how can a judge make a decision that the parties to a dispute will accept and abide by? I feel like there's a completely separate but obviously equally relevant question, which is, are there other standards against which we should evaluate what the decisions are, what the rules are, what the laws are governing platforms. And I don't think that those are irrelevant. I think that it's difficult for behavioral scientists to address those kind of issues, and that's why we have lawyers, and basically, and legal scholars to talk about normative standards of appropriateness. And ideally, something would be both normatively acceptable to legal scholars and would be something that the people who experience a platform's rules and procedures would think themselves is fair and would be willing to accept and go along with. Thank you. John. Hi, um, I have a question for Karen. Um, really interesting approach and findings. Thank you for sharing your talk. Um, I'm starting to wonder about the possible extensions of this work. Um, and in particular, how this would kind of generalize to the context in Ukraine. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about specific ways you could extend the work in that context. Yeah, so thank you for the question. Um, definitely the sort of cyber attacks area uh, that's been happening since the invasion of Ukraine has been a really interesting space. Um, actually, actors on sort of both sides of the conflict trying to take actions against the other. Um, in particular, you see some hacktivist type organizations um, that are stepping in for Ukraine. You sometimes see the similar on the Russian side, but also some evidence of more coordinated attacks um, on the part of the Russian government. So, uh, so yeah, I, I don't currently have plans to extend this work in that context. 
Um, however, it's a very interesting space. One thing that also makes uh, studying it a little bit challenging is that you don't know what's happening behind the scenes. For example, like what kind of law enforcement efforts there are to offset these attacks. Or uh, So I, I think initially a lot of people fear that the attacks um, perhaps coming from Russia around this conflict would be a, a really big threat. But actually now we're sort of learning that there are a lot of efforts behind the scenes to address these threats and kind of minimize that. Um, so yeah, tricky to study in that sense, uh, but definitely it could be an interesting space to expand some further applications. Um, hi, this question is for Josh. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about like the metrics that you use to benchmark and track the impact of the trust and safety team at Zoom. Yeah, that's a great question. So. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, it, it took us a little while to get there. Um, and in order to get there, we had to build a lot of uh, the data pipelines around like our reporting flows um, and then a whole system in the back end where we could track what the uh, analysts were doing um, and then build our transparency report off of it. So right now what we do is we understand and we report on a monthly basis like all actions that we take against users. So our, our uh, report is actually you can download a, a CSV file if you want to go to the Zoom website on our monthly transparency report um, plug. Um, but we use um, that as a way to sort of understand the abuse types that we're getting and what we do with those certain abuse types. We also know, for example, how long you know it generally takes our analysts to tackle certain cases, right? Um, and then we've, as a result of that, structured our team, I think you saw the slide, structured our team in such a way that um, it's designed to sort of uh, work more and more complicated cases and have certain passovers, but we use all this reporting, all this data, all these metrics that we're collecting to then adjust how the team like is operating and how it exists. So we made very intentional decisions, like we have a core analyst team, like what's their work like look like? We always tell the analyst, carry a, I don't have it with me, a notepad with you and watch the trends that you're seeing, how long it's taking you, if you have any great ideas, like how could we improve it beyond just the data. And then the next team we created was our investigation risk management, which is more of a forensic team that does deep dive investigations. Then we saw an increase in fraud. So we said, oh, we got to have a specialized fraud team. We use the metrics to do that. And like I said, um, part of the whole idea of engineering the system from the front, middle, and the end is to be able to then learn from all those actions. And so when we're starting to think about what we can do both in the product from a user experience perspective, um, a reporting perspective, um, and, uh, and potentially the increase of use of like modeling and ML, um, we can sort of create a whole feedback loop. Um, so that's a long answer, but those, it was really sort of an important like focus of ours for the first year and a half because we felt like that was the only way we were ever going to sort of get, get ahead of the problem and then build a lasting solution to uh, keep our users safe. Thanks. We can squeeze in one more question, I believe. This side of the room has come alive. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Mariana from the NYU Stern Center for Business and Human Rights. And my question is for both uh, Professor Tyler and Josh, um, trying to simply place your presentations in conversation with one another. So um, Professor Tyler, um, do you have a sense that your findings might extend to other platforms beyond Twitter? And if so, what aspects might translate well? And Josh, um, do you did you imbue some aspects of procedural fairness into your trust and safety systems? Um, if you did, which ones? And if you didn't, which ones would you now apply? Thank you. Well, to the first question, we have seen that these principles go across pretty much any kind of an authority system that you might be interested in. In the particular case of online platforms, we've also done similar work in Facebook and Nextdoor. And we've seen that the same principles, people who feel fairly treated are more willing to trust and support the rules of the platform. And it's all over the legal system, the police, the courts, the prisons, administrative hearings, mediation. So I think we could say it's a very general principle that's likely to apply to any situation where some group or organization has rules that they apply to problems with individuals. 
Yeah, and I think, uh, so um, yes, uh, the answer is yes. We apply uh, process transparency, and I think there's going to be, there are more and more regulatory regimes that are requiring that. I mean, even the Digital Services Act is sort of uh, based in part on uh, creating some better process transparency or uh, procedural, procedural due process, basically, um, to use a more legal term. Um, I think actually that's a, uh, that's, for me, a critical thing for trust and safety is not just like transparency in terms of like what we've done to a user and why, but transparency in terms of our process and trying to communicate it really, really clearly. Because maybe people don't like our process, but at least they've seen it and we've been transparent in how we do it and we view it um, as sort of a very critical part of our, um, of our systems. Now I will tell you the real sticky wicket when it comes to um, uh, procedural due process and process transparency is, is scale. So, for example, you know, it's very hard um, if you have a, you know, let's say if you're meta and you have two billion users, right? Like, how do you ensure that if you take an action against a user, they get the right communication so they understand what, what happened to them and why? And how do you scale that? Which goes back to the earlier conversation. You work closely with engineering and you try to develop really good communications that are particular and served on the user and then clear appeal pathways for them. And then you start tracking that. What are you seeing and why? Um, but I view that for trust and safety and its future like that as a critical um, you know, area of focus for users. Great, thank you both and thank you to the whole panel. Before we um, uh, thank them together, uh, we're about to break for lunch and a few notes on that. Uh, you can sit anywhere, uh, including out in the lovely gardens, enjoy some Palo Alto uh, weather. Uh, you can sit here in uh, McCaw Hall. Each of these tables has a number on it, and you can see on the second page of your program, there will be topics for each of these uh, tables. So if you're interested in meeting new people that are interested in the same topics, then you can sit in here. Or we also have some seating out in the lobby. Our staff is positioned throughout the, um, the rooms to, to guide you. Uh, our sessions will reconvene at 1 p.m. Uh, we have three rooms going, so we'll spread out a little bit. Here in McCall Hall, we'll have lightning talks. You can see the list of them there. In the Fisher Con Conference Center, which is just across the lobby, there are two options. One is a Twitter-run workshop on the Twitter Research uh, API, the uh, version two. And over there, we'll also have a panel on trust and safety across platforms. Um, and as I said, we'll have staff everywhere to guide you if you have any questions. And now, uh, I just want to say a big thank you to the panel for representing the excellence and diversity and impact of the journal. Thank you so much. Thank you all. See you next. Thanks, guys.
Welcome. If you are here for the first ever Trust and Safety Research Conference Lightning Talks, please take a seat. Yes, round of applause. Thank you. The inaugural. If you're sitting in the back, there's lots of chairs up front. If you're standing, you are welcome to come forward, get the front row experience. All right. So hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Naomi. I run the data and implementation team at the Oversight Board. It is a pleasure to be here. Today, we're going to be hearing um, from an incredible group of researchers uh, at our first inaugural Lightning Talks. Um, there will be 10 talks. Each will be five minutes long. There is a clock right there to help you with timing. Um, there's also a timekeeper in the audience who will raise a, a one-minute warning for you. Um, there won't be questions immediately after the talk, uh, but panelists are here at this reserve table uh, once the session is over, and you're welcome to come over and ask questions. So today, we will be hearing from David Sullivan of the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership, Sujata Mukherjee from Google, Deepak Kumar from Stanford University, Kevin Aslett from the University of Central Florida, Amanda Goharian from Thorne, Jen King from Stanford University, Vanessa Moulter from Google, Catherine Townsend from the World Wide Web Foundation, Aaron Zellin from Brandeis University, and Inga Trouthig from the University of Texas at Austin. And those names and the presentation names are all in your program. We will be going through in that order. So first up, um, David Sullivan, kick us off. Hi everyone, I'm David Sullivan, uh, and I lead the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership, uh, which brings together technology companies providing all kinds of products and services around a shared commitment to a safer and more trustworthy internet. Uh, I'm here to tell you about the SAFE Assessments, which is our inaugural evaluation uh, of the trust and safety practices of 10 of our partner companies. You can see which ones up on the slide. And I should just note that companies that have joined the partnership more recently, including Zoom, Apple and Bitly uh, will be participating in future assessments. So uh, quickly on the partnership. So we launched in February of 2021, uh, releasing a best practices framework for trust and safety, uh, where companies providing different types of services and facing very different types of risks are aligning around a set of best practices and a commitment to evaluation through self-assessments and then ultimately uh, independent third-party assessments. So um, our best practices framework, rather than trying to align all of these companies around content standards, trying to say, here's what hate speech means across all of these different platforms, um, we're approaching this from practices. So we have a set of commitments and practices that companies can use to manage whatever content or conduct related risks they face, whether that's terrorism, whether that's Tide Pods or whatever the next kind of weird social media challenge may well be. Um, so here you have our five commitments are around product development, governance, enforcement, improvement, and transparency. And underneath that, um, we have 35 specific best practices. This is just a sample of them on the slide that range from using risk assessments to inform product design um, to under our transparency uh, commitment, supporting academic researchers, for example. So, um, uh, one, we think that this framework is gonna help formalize trust and safety as a discipline, uh, following a trajectory that's similar to frameworks that have been developed in fields like cybersecurity. Two, this is a living document. It can evolve as the field advances, um, and uh, critically with input from stakeholders from users of these services. Um, so this is just the beginning. Um, so uh, earlier this year, 10 companies performed self-assessments using this framework. Why start with self-assessments? Well, I think of it like um, a performance review at your job, where first you do your self-evaluation to sort of document where you're at, understand your shortcomings, and figure out opportunities for improvement. And that's gonna then help us drive those independent third-party assessments, which is our ultimate goal. So we collected insights from across those 10 assessments uh, and put out a report that contained aggregated insights. 
Um, why aggregate? We're an industry association, so it's not our role to stack rank our company members against each other, um, but to really set out a standard against which they can be held accountable. So what did we find out? So um, we looked at uh, using a common maturity scale, sort of looking at the maturity of these practices across different companies, different products, different functions. And um, what we found is the good side is that companies generally reported more mature practices when it came to things that we sort of put in the bucket of core content moderation practices. These are the things that trust and safety teams can often do unilaterally within the company or sort of with, with external folks. Um, so it's about constituting teams responsible um, for creating or updating policies and using combinations of people, process, and technology to enforce those policies. Where are companies in need of improvement? Where are things least mature? Several of those practices related to things about how uh, involving user feedback um, or uh, working with third-party groups, whether that's civil society organizations or academics. And in fact, the least mature practice across our framework was support for academics and researchers, which is why I'm so glad that we have conferences like this uh, and many initiatives from some of our members just in recent weeks that I think is stowing this is starting to move. Um, so this is just the beginning. You can go to our website, dtspartnership.org, to learn more. There's a lot more in the report. We're going to evolve this framework, we're going to build those third-party assessments, and we're going to try to inform the conversation globally about what trust and safety looks like, and I invite you all to get in touch and help us do that. Thank you very much. All right, next up we have Sujata Mukherjee from Google. Hey everyone, um, thanks for having me, it's great to be here. Uh, and it's also serendipitous to follow David's talk because he ended on this note of maturity of practices and platforms and I'm sort of gonna build on some of those ideas for my talk. Um, there has been this narrative that has emerged about a parallel internet, um, the so-called alt tech or alternative universe of platforms where fringe content and sub subversive ideologies might thrive. We found in our research that this is somewhat an oversimplification. First, this kind of binary classification between the mainstream and the alt tech uh, tends to consider platforms at this point in time and their current usage, which may or may not have any bearing on the future usage of that platform. Secondly, it doesn't seem to take into account uh, the business context and some of the design considerations or affordances that the platform decides to offer its users, uh, which may or may not uh, enable fringe content to thrive. And so we found that abstracting out of current use of a platform and thinking about these conscious choices that the platform is making either in response to their own positioning or their uh, uh, target user base, and also the business landscape pushing them in a certain direction, um, abstracting out of current use and looking at those kind of factors enables us to create a more nuanced categorization. Um, and so what, what we found is that whether fringe content thrives on a platform is really the result of these choices that the platforms are making on these factors. And through our research and our analysis of platforms, we've also found that a delayed attention to content moderation is not unusual. In fact, many of the so-called mainstream platforms today develop their policy stance over two decades, uh, and some of them are still evolving in response to events and emerging techniques. Um, and so it's important to keep, I won't go into each of the factors, I hope they are descriptive, but it's important to understand that each of these factors represents a choice, and that choice may also change over time as the capacity, capability, and resourcing of the platform also changes. Um, in fact, we've, we think that uh, many of our so-called all-tech platforms are simply too early in their content moderation journey to effectively keep fringe content out. And one may go so far as to say that any platform that seeks to gather global market share uh, and be a public, publicly traded, revenue generating, profitable organization will tend towards content moderation in the long term. So we also did a series of surveys and diary studies with users to understand what's driving user choices 
between all of these uh, multi-platforms that are available to them. And what we found is that while users rely on a core set of platforms for their life management and entertainment, many reasons exist that drive them towards experiencing less moderated spaces. These could be curiosity, it could be they're following a community, um, or it could be that their maturing understanding of tech affordances leads to a distrust of mainstream or traditional media sources, and they start to seek niche or unmoderated spaces. And so we realized this vision of this really dynamic multi-platform ecosystem where over time users' preferences expand and they seek out unmoderated spaces, so there will always be a demand for unmoderated spaces, but business um, and user feedback and uh, maturing capacity of platforms drives them towards greater moderation in the long term. And so we're suggesting moving away from this idea of a binary mainstream versus all tech parallel internet and beginning to situate users who are making rational, meaningful choices uh, and demanding non-normative content. And we've also found that non-normative content needs are not unusual. They're much, wide, much more widespread than you might expect. So how does a platform serve this non-normative content needs in a safe manner? Um, and, how can they, and how are we talking about them given their particular situation on this journey towards greater moderation? Thank you. Thank you, Sujata, really modeling the time, timeliness of your talk. Um, next up, we have Deepak Kumar from Stanford. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you here. Um, I'm excited to be here to tell you about a little bit of work we've been doing in uh, unpacking and understanding the accounts that engage in toxic content on Reddit. This is done in collaboration with some great folks here at Stanford and at Google. So look, toxic content is a big problem. Um, it affects 48% of internet users and social spaces. It's the top form of online hate and harassment experienced, and it's one of the number one, uh, one of the top digital safety concerns amongst internet users. So it sort of behooves us as a security community, as a research community, to sort of understand what toxic behavior is looks like online, how it's operationalized online. And a lot of prior work is focused on the experiences of targets, the characterizations of major events, things like Gamergate, uh, focused on how online conversations increase and decrease in toxicity, and the off-platform tactics of attackers. But what a lot of uh, these type of research haven't done are sort of understanding, you know, what are the longitudinal behaviors of the accounts that actually engage in this behavior? And so what do I mean by behaviors? I mean things like, you know, how, how frequently are they posting? What fraction of their content is actually toxic content? Where on the platform are they posting these things? And then ultimately for us is thinking about how those behaviors can actually then inform potentially nuanced defenses that can you know, be, uh, be interventions to actually impact the users as they're using the platforms. So um, how do we do this? Well, we went to Reddit. If you're unfamiliar with Reddit, it's uh, this platform, social, social platform conversation forward that is sort of organized into these uh, sub-communities or subreddits. Think about them as like little kingdoms where everybody is sort of self-governed and self-moderated based on their own um, norms. And what we did is we went to Reddit and we uh, collected every Reddit comment that was posted uh, on the platform from an 18-month period from January 2020 to about July 2021. So, for every one of those comments, we then ran each of those things through Google's, uh, Google Jigsaw's Perspective API um, and with some you know, basically fine tuning to make sure that we weren't getting too many false positives uh, and ultimately uh, came up with this data set that accounted for 929,000 toxic accounts or accounts that engage in toxic behavior, 14 million comments that were toxic over, over the period of time that we uh, studied uh, that sort of spanned over 100,000 subreddits. So what could we do with a data set like this? Well, we could sort of start to ask questions about the account. So we ask questions like, what is their aggregate toxicity as it relates to their overall posting volume? What fraction of the subreddits that they're participating in do they actually post toxic content in? For the subreddits that they engage with, how frequently are they violating the norms of those subreddits, right? So not every subreddit has the same beliefs on what is or what isn't toxic content. And then this is just a small list. The paper has quite a lot more. But given all of those features, those sort of behavioral patterns, what we did is we clustered them into what we call personas, you know, basically some sort of higher level understanding of what these accounts are actually doing on the platform, and we observe three sort of distinct personas. The first cluster, uh, I'll call them sort of occasional or just sort of one-off uh, abusive accounts. Really, this accounts for the majority of uh, accounts that engage in toxic behavior, about 60% of them, and really what we're seeing here is, you know, this is 
yeah, I got angry one day and I posted something really mean to somebody else, um, but it's not a large fraction of uh, their particular comment volume. Um, they're not violating the norms that frequently in their subcommunities, and they're not posting toxic content in that many of their subcommunities. The second cluster, which is a smaller uh, cluster, about 31%, I'll call them, you know, occasional abusers. They, they actually seem to equivocate based on the subcommunity that they're in. In some subreddits, they're really aggressive, and in other subreddits, they're not so aggressive, right? And so this, this sort of alludes to the fact that there's a, a, a lot more gray area here. And then in the third cluster, which is, accounts for about 6% of accounts, um, in my mind, these are like serial abusive accounts. So accounts that post a lot of toxic content, they violate the norms of almost every subcommunity that they're a part of. And each of these three clusters can sort of you know, lead to certain defenses that, you know, or at least potential defenses that lots of companies are thinking about right now. So for example, um, cluster in the first cluster where they sort of have one-off abusers, you can think about things like nudges. Um, so sort of like leading them away from the, the toxic behavior. In uh, the second cluster, you can think about things like more community-driven rules. So maybe something like Reddit or some self-moderated self thing. Uh, and then in, in the, third, the third cluster, if you've got really you know, abusive accounts um, that are posting a lot of toxic content on the platform, maybe you have to think about platform-wide bans. So ultimately, I think our work sort of alludes to this idea that there's a lot more gray here and that nuanced defenses could potentially help in addressing some of the toxic content on platforms. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Deepak. I'm always driving towards nuance. Next up, we have Kevin Aslett from the University of Central Florida. All right, first, a uh, quick shout out to my collaborators on this project, particularly, namely, Zeev Sanderson, who's in attendance. Um, so in response to rising concerns about misinformation following the 2016 election, US election, social media platforms, civic society, and governmental uh, agencies worked to develop these digital media literacy interventions that were designed to reduce belief in misinformation and the spread of misinformation online. What's really common among these guides is that they recommend people search online for for information about misinformation. So when they come into contact with suspect news, go search online, see if there's other credible news sources reporting the same story. Although this is incredibly popular to suggest, we actually don't know what the effect of searching online is on measuring belief in misinformation. So we set out to test this. Now, one challenge of measuring this search effect is that information ecosystems are constantly changing. For example, if I search about misinformation that's currently going viral today, I'm gonna to get different information than when I search a year from now. So we wanted to capture this search effect in the period that we're most interested in, when individuals are actually exposed while misinformation is going viral, in about the 24 to 48 hours directly after publication. So what we did, once we developed an, our, an algorithm that identified viral misinformation within 24 to 48 hours of its, its beginning, its publication, and then we sent the, this misinformation to individuals to evaluate. In one group, we asked them to evaluate it without being encouraged to search, for, uh, to search uh, online. And in another group, we did encourage them to search online. And when we, look, uh, when we look at the effects, the differences between the groups, the comparison of how many individuals rated misinformation as true, we actually found that 21% more individuals in the search group rated misinformation as true relative to the control group. So a pretty strong effect. Now, to test the robustness of this effect, we ran another experiment where we asked individuals to first evaluate misinformation without being encouraged to search, and then reevaluate it after going online. Again, we found the same effect. Searching online was increasing belief in misinformation at a similar magnitude. So then we wanted to test, maybe this is only occurring while misinformation is going viral, and months later, this effect dissipates. So we tested this effect, we, te we ran the same study, and we asked individuals to evaluate old misinformation, about six months old, and again, we found the same effect. And then finally, in our again, a final fourth study, we asked, in we asked individuals to evaluate misinformation about a salient topic. So we chose COVID-19, misinformation about COVID-19, during, while it was salient at the height of the pandemic, and again, we found the same effect. So why are individuals who are being encouraged to search online, why are they more likely to believe misinformation? Well, one possibility is that individuals are falling into what we some call data voids, and that when individuals use distinct terms from misinformation, search engines spit back out low-quality information corroborating that misinformation. And so we decided to look into this and test this. In a final fifth study, we asked, 
we ran the same study as prior, but we collected Google search engine results of individuals who we encouraged to search online. And then we, ra we, we, ra we ranked the individual's search, uh, search engine results by news quality using the NewsGuard news ratings. And what we found is that this search effect was concentrated among individuals who were exposed to low, the lowest quality of information in their search engine results. So individual, whereas the effect actually doesn't exist at all for individuals who were, who were turned where, whose search engines returned high quality information. So this would suggest that individuals who are being exposed to low quality information through search engine results are more likely to believe misinformation and this does provide some evidence of this data void effect. So in summary, we found that searching online, encouraging individuals to search online is increasing belief in misinformation and it's likely that exposure to low quality information on search engines is, is explaining this effect. And, um, yeah, that's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Kevin. Next up, we have Amanda Goharian from Thorn. It doesn't feel like that long of a walk until you take it. <laughs> um, just going to skip to that. But thank you for the intro, Naomi. Um, at Thorn, to understand existing threats, explore trends, and anticipate future exploits, much of our research is focused on capturing the lived experiences of youth today. In this talk, I'll be reflecting on some of the key learnings we derived from a 2021 survey of 1,200 American youth aged between 9 and 17. And the focus of that research was on online grooming, and it was really to understand what markers exist that, dis that are distinct between high value versus high risk relationships that kids form online today. A key question for many of us who work in the space to safeguard young people in digital environments is, how do we encourage safe exploration while preventing exploitation? After all, in the words of one 16-year-old respondent when asked about forming online relationships today, it's nice to meet other people who share your interests and you can talk to when you're feeling down. Everyone's a stranger at some point, you know? And supporting this, our research found that one in three minors reported some of their closest friendships had formed exclusively online. Um, yet, it's important to also recognize that individuals wishing to manipulate kids also exploit this, their openness to exploration as well. And our research found that one in seven minors reported they had told or shared something with an online-only contact that they had never shared with anyone else offline. And this creates opportunities for those wishing to abuse kids to connect with them, isolate them, build false relationships, and abuse them. It's imperative, and as a result, it's imperative that we recognize that technology has cultivated a fundamentally different environment for grooming to occur. While the process of grooming may look similar, it's the difference between it occurring in a physical environment versus a digital environment is critical. Child predators are no longer restricted to um, which children they can victimize by physical proximity alone. And as a result, many of the signals that we rely on to detect offline grooming are simply not present, not feasible, or not accessible as detection measures within our digital environments. We know from our research that two and three minors reported they had been asked to move from a uh, public forum to a one-on-one -on -one environment on a different platform by an online-only contact. This confirms the cross-platform nature of many online grooming experiences. And we also know that nearly one in four minors reported they had stayed in contact with an online-only connection who had made them feel uncomfortable. And the primary reason behind that was a, that a foundational friendship had been formed. And the, the, this is, illuminates a burden that we're placing on kids today, which is we are asking them to not only recognize, but to overcome attempts at manipulation in the moment and to report a user to us. 
It's really time that we reassess how we mitigate this threat landscape for kids. And that's well beyond what kids themselves are able to detect for us in their moments of crisis. We know that bad actors exploit our digital environments for their predatory ends. So a key question becomes, what new detection signals might exist that we collectively have access to? Envisioning our future shouldn't be difficult. Some of this data already exists. We simply need to work together as a collective to harness it. At base, our guiding question should be, what does a predatory account, or really a group of predatory accounts, how do they behave when they are actively targeting a child user? Can we build the tools that identify and detect the targeting, the coercion, and the threats, rather than waiting for a 10-year-old user, a 15-year-old user, et cetera, to report their abuse? We can accomplish this in a few ways. First, we can harness and learn from the experiences of, from the kids who have already carried this burden for us and who have diligently used our safety tooling to report interactions and cut off contact. Among those kids who had cut off contact, we know that their primary ways of doing so were to either block the user or to simply ignore them. And this means that bad actors are largely and ineffectively left to roam on each platform and across multiple platforms, largely without interference. Based on the ex historical reports that we have available, we need to examine at scale how known bad actors have targeted children in the pursuit of sexually exploiting them. We should also develop shared cross-platform intelligence on offender tactics, techniques, and procedures so that we can design and implement a solution that addresses an ecosystem-wide issue. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Next up, we have Jennifer King from Stanford University. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm Jen King. I am the uh, Privacy and Data Policy Fellow at the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. It's always a mouthful to say. Uh, but I am really actually pleased to be here as a former practitioner in the trust and safety space. Uh, in 2002, I was hired at Yahoo as their first customer trust manager, ma manager sorry, uh, where I built a content management system to detect CSAM, uh, as well as dealing with a plethora of other criminal and antisocial behavior that many of you are, are unfortunately familiar with. Uh, and that experience actually continues to inform the research that I do today, including the project I'm going to talk about now. Uh, although, I want to note that while I'm really unhappy that 20 years into this that we're still talking about the same toxic waste that these platforms have been generating all this time, I'm actually very happy to see that these issues are being taken seriously and that you who are dealing with this professionally, that you're actually give, be give, being given the respect that you deserve because you really do deserve it and this space has been long neglected. Okay. so. I'm going to talk to you about manipulative design in four more minutes. Um, so as you probably all have firsthand experience with, uh, you may have encountered the things we call manipulative design or dark patterns, even if you haven't heard that specific terminology. So these are the online design choices that uh, platforms make to interfere with your ability to make choices that benefit you. So deception and manipulation aren't new phenomena. They've been around, as I can tell you, for a very long time. Um, but in the last decade, we've seen manipulative design explode across all forms of online services. And while manipulative design is primarily focused so far on the static user interfaces that we see in e-commerce contexts, specifically decisional interference that is caused by deceptive, coercive, or manipulative choice architectures, it's clear that digital manipulation is rampant across social media, gaming, and other contexts as well, including content-serving platforms. But because of the barrier of Section 230, as well as First Amendment concerns, attempting to regulate content on these platforms has been, as you all know, fairly unproductive. So in the research I'm doing, uh, which is with uh, Caitlin Burke, who is a communications student, PhD student here at Stanford, we're asking, you know, instead of focusing on the content that is transmitted by these systems, can we instead regulate the algorithmic systems themselves? And so in the work that we're doing, uh, we're using what we know about manipulative design to really think about the question of algorithmic manipulation. We think that not only are the static forms of di digital manipulation ripe for being powered by machine learning, 
We think that, in fact, some of the existing forms of algorithmic design can be reframed as digital manipulation. And so our research is seeking to understand the cognitive mechanisms by which algorithmic manipulation succeeds, the harm it causes, and how behavioral manipulation differs from decisional interference. We're exploring how to measure the impacts of algorithmic manipulation on individuals, as well as at scale. And then finally, we're examining whether the means by which we presently regulate dark patterns can apply to some forms of algorithmic manipulation by focusing, again, on the design of these systems and the harm they cause, rather than the content. So while the consumer protection angle may hold some real promise here, because at the end of the day, these systems are largely all about engagement and clicks and making money, um, we also think that you need to think about behavioral think about behavioral manipulation that results in physical or psychological harm and whether that can be reframed itself as a public health issue and whether it has public health consequences as a way to regulate these issues. Uh, it's ongoing work. I'd love to talk to anybody about it afterwards. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jen. Next up, we have Vanessa Moulter from Google. Hi, everyone. I'm Vanessa, and I want to talk a little bit about the concept of multi-layered enforcement to you today. Um, so in any online product, you have good and bad users. And unfortunately, like we've seen today, in some cases, it isn't clear into which category a user falls. So for example, a good user might have their account hijacked and that account is then used for abuse. Or a user might not know that what they're doing isn't allowed. So no matter how much we debate where to draw the line, there will always be this gray area. And so the question is, is our only option to keep debating this gray area and to keep pushing for either reducing false negatives or false positives? Well, I want to tell you, obviously, <laughs> I think you've guessed it from that, fra from that phrasing, about a different way, um, about how you can use multi-layered enforcement um, on that, and I'm going to use Google Drive as an example. So this slide shows the different layers of enforcement for Google Drive, and the higher a layer, the more effective enforcement at that layer is. But that also means the more impactful any potential false positives are. And I'll walk you through those layers from most to least potentially disruptive. So let's start with the, with the top level, um, account level enforcement. Disabling a bad account is the most effective way to stop any abuse by that account. So if we're sure that an account is bad, disabling it is the best way to protect all the other users on the product. But if we're wrong, that can be really impactful to that user. So we have to be very careful when we disable an account. The next layer is service level enforcement. So enforcing on a user's service means they can't use Google Drive anymore, but they're still able to use other Google products. Third is feature level enforcement. So this is already um, a lot lighter enforcement. Enforcing at the feature level means that specific functionality for a user is disabled. And that's either indefinitely or for a limited period. And so for example, if we see a user that we think is spamming others, we could stop them from being able to share files for the next 48 hours, for example. And in the case of a false positive, this is only annoying. But if that user is actually running a spam campaign, Disabling their sharing functionality can successfully disrupt the campaign, assuming that most of it is happening on Google Drive. Fourth is enforcement for a specific item. So for example, a specific Google Doc. So we might find a phishing link in a publicly shared doc, and then we make that doc inaccessible to everyone besides the doc owner. And the last is notification level enforcement. So notification level enforcement is the lightest type of enforcement that we have. And that could mean, for example, um, we see a user that is sharing a doc in a way that seems spammy, and we don't notify the user who got the share. And that way, we can avoid showing users notifications that they don't want to see. But if we're wrong, the user who got the share is still able to access the shared doc. So now you might look at this and might wonder, why can't we just use the lightest enforcement types, so item and notification level enforcement, across all users, wouldn't that limit the impact on false positives but still be effective enforcement? Unfortunately, that is not a good option. Um, and there's actually three different reasons for that. The first one is efficiency. Um, so if you know that an account is bad, disabling the account immediately stops 100% of abuse by that account. Um, 
Another reason is that if you have a more complex system with different layers, it's a lot more challenging for bad actors to game that system. If you only have one layer, it's a lot easier for, for example, spammers to A-B test what you're gonna detect and what you're not, and then come up, go around your protections. And the third reason is that um, if you only had the lighter layers, it kind of brings us back to the initial problem of having uh, good and bad items and notifications in a gray area for those where we aren't sure. And so you have to remember, for each of those enforcement layers, we have um, a trade-off uh, along false positives and false negatives. And at the account level, we have a lot more information about whether an account is bad. Um, and when you look at notifications and items by themselves, we have a lot less information, and so it's a lot harder to make high-precision verdicts for that. So if you take away any of those layers, you're inevitably going to increase false positives or false negatives or both. So I gave you an example today of how Google Drive uses layered enforcement to reduce false negatives but still um, limit impact on false positives. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, next up, we have Catherine Townsend from the World Wide Web Foundation. Hello. Uh, thanks, all. Thanks for having me here, and good to be with you. Do I have slides? Oh, I do this. Play. There I am. Cool. Um, yeah, it's great to be here, and uh, thanks for having me on today. That's OK. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure out how to read that clock. Um, all right, so my name is Catherine Townsend. I am the current policy director for the World Wide Web Foundation. World Wide Web Foundation was invented about 12 years ago by this guy, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who 33 years ago decided to look at TCP IP and the internet and say, look, this is only available for academics and some military. Wouldn't it be great if this was open to everyone, if the web was for everyone? So he invented websites. And what we do at the Web Foundation is to try to take that original vision of uh, a space where everyone around the world can convene, they can create, they can uh, share their ideas um, in, a, in a public and open way. And we do that by having uh, four basic principles. Have a web that is open, safe, trusted, uh, and empowering. And based on how the web is now, we've spent a lot of our time on that safe and, tr and trusted side. Um, Everything we do at the Web Foundation is done in an open and multi-stakeholder way. So uh, a few years ago, 2019, we decided to bring together 80 different organizations around the world and say, well, look at the web of where it is now. What kind of web do we want? How do we make it more open, safe, trusted, and empowering? And we came up with something called a contract for the web, which has nine principles carved across government, private sector, and global citizens. And this is, you know, here's how we're going to work for a better web. Great. So those are big value statements. What does that actually look like? And we started something called Tech Policy Design Labs that tackle a specific issue area, similarly use that multi-stakeholder process, and uh, try to get policy interventions that are measurable and accountable. The first one we ran was on countering uh, online gender-based violence. And there's a few of you who are in this room today who are part of that. Thank you for working with us in your participation there. Um, yeah. So there's been a lot of talk about online gender-based violence here um, and a lot of stats that are shared. Just uh, two others that I'll share about the effect on um, politicians. So uh, in Chile, two months ago, we looked at the, well, not us, Cepesa looked at the uh, Twitter messages to Chile's female parliamentarians. 75% of them contained harassing um, or violent and abusive language. In Sweden, 41% of the female parliamentarians there have said that they've received a sexually explicit image of themselves, doctored, um, directed at them. And what typically happens when people get harassed online, there's different reactions. If you identify as a man, you tend to fight. You make a complaint to the platform, you can make a complaint to the police. And what we found, and again, this data is often uh, binary between men and women, but women uh, tend to remove themselves from the platform, other minoritized genders as well. And they say, let me not engage. They take the, their profiles offline. Some remove themselves from public office and public leadership. Um, others can commit harm to themselves and to others offline. And so this is really the stakes that we're at. What we're working towards is an online space that is devoid of women's voices and creative voices 
and it is providing support uh, for those who feel free to commit harassment and abuse. Uh, that is not just a very boring web, um, but it's a very dangerous one. And there's a quote that I love from uh, Hera Hussein, who's executive director of CHAN. If you don't know it, please check it out. Um, they provide uh, global support for survivors online. Um, we're going to lose female and queer voices and amazing ideas in public service because we didn't create an online environment to keep them safe. So what did we do? So we've been working directly with the platforms. Twitter, Meta, Google, and TikTok all said, here's how we're going to make a change. We're gonna make it easier to report. We'll make it easier to remove yourself from those situations. Um, and we're gonna be transparent about the work that we've done. We said, great, let's work together. One year later, and we've just published our accountability report on this, uh, there have been some changes that they've made. And they've asked us, you know, can you go out and tell everybody all the great work that we're doing? And we say, we don't actually know because you haven't shared any of your data. We don't know what you've done. We don't know the impact that it's had because we don't know the extent of the problem um, and, and, the, uh, and the, how, how any of the work that you've done has had any effect. So my request to you also, we continue to work with them. This is a big priority for the Web Foundation going forward. We see it as an existential threat to the future of the web is the prevalence of violence and harassment online. So for everybody who's working on trust and safety, whether you're in these companies, whether you're a researcher who's working in this space, I would ask you, look for the data, share it, make it public, and work with us and others who are trying to track the prevalence of online violence, how it affects people offline, um, and, the, and the severity impact it's happening in the real world. Thank you. All right, next up we have Aaron Zellin from Brandeis University. Good afternoon, everybody. So um, besides my hat as an academic, I also am founder of the website jihadology.net, which is a primary source archive um, that has content from groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda and the like. And it's been useful for many people. However, over time, it became a problem because of all the takedowns online. Um, and as a result, the issue of content moderation or regulations related to researchers focusing on extremist groups or terrorist groups is really important to me. Um, yet, uh, what we've seen is with the advancements of the algorithms used to take down content online is that it's becoming far more blunt and less discriminate in who's actually being banned. And one of the watershed moments, at least for people in the field, um, is, is that in uh, November 2019, a number of researchers, dozens, were taken down from Telegram while they're monitoring extremist content from groups like ISIS, Al-Qaeda, etc. Um, but since then, we've also seen, based off of my own research, that this now has occurred on other platforms like Twitter, WhatsApp, Facebook, Pastebin, YouTube, and Google. And it's not just social media platforms, um, but it's also related to file sharing platforms as well, such as Google Drive or Dropbox. Um, this is problematic because a lot of academic research is shareable and there's a lot of collaboration in relation to it. Um, and yet, unlike Telegram, which actually was the first one to get involved in this, they have a whitelist that has allowed researchers to continue on with this process. However, there are no other tech companies that have created a whitelist equivalent to help out in this because otherwise, without the research, um, it will really harm our understanding of what's going on in the evolution of these extremists and terrorist groups um, and what they're doing online. It's important to point out that this research and this problem related to banning and taking down of researchers is not specific to terrorism. It's also happened to those that have followed issues related to ad transparency or misinformation. For example, in August 2021, academics at NYU were banned from Facebook, for example. I wanted to share a caveat from my own personal experience back in the spring and summer of 2021. Um, I was taken down four times on WhatsApp while I was following different jihadi groups and their activities and what they're posting online. The first time it was fixed within, you know, a couple of hours, the next time a half a day, the next time three weeks, the next time three months. Um, obviously that can be problematic for research. Um, and it's a very odd ad hoc process, especially for a company like WhatsApp, for example. Um, but even for myself, who knows people who have worked at some of these tech companies, this will definitely hinder more independent researchers or those who are new to the field and younger in the field, or those that might not live in a Western or liberal context because of the authoritarian nature of the regime. 
Um, just as an example, um, Elizabeth Kendall, who's a senior researcher on Yemen, um, one day in October 2021, um, she said, uh, she told me that, quote, uh, her uh, Dropbox account was suddenly disabled with no warning, no explanation, no communication, and no response to her queries. And that undermines the ability for people in the field to do research. Um, likewise, earlier this year, um, Seamus Hughes, who's the deputy director of the program on extremism at George Washington University, um, he was actually reached out to by a prosecutor in the U.S. government um, asking him for a copy of the Buffalo Manifesto after the, you know, shooting happened there um, this past spring, and both times he couldn't share it on Google Drive. It was taken down automatically. So Hughes, incredulously, when I've interviewed a number of researchers related to this, said, quote, so you have government officials asking for stuff and you can't actually give it to them. Um, this is because the file was too la large to share on any other platform. And the thing, too, is obviously there are other smaller platforms that aren't as large as, say, Google Drive or Dropbox. Um, uh, but the usability and the shareability and the ease of those platforms makes it a lot um, quicker. Um, therefore, this hurts collaboration on many levels in the future research in fields that are very sensitive, like terrorism and extremism. Therefore, I think, similar to what you get with journalists with, say, press cards and them having accredited access to things, there should be something along those lines for people working on sensitive research topics on these platforms as well. And at least in the context of extremism and terrorism, uh, a consortium like the GIVCT or the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism could be a platform to be able to do this from um, so that, you know, everything works out well for everybody and that there aren't issues in hindering research going forward. Thank you. Aaron. So our last speaker will be Inga Trothig from the University of Texas at Austin. And because everybody was so timely, we actually do have time for audience questions. So we'll go to Q&A. I've been cut off. We'll go to Q&A after this. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have some good news to start with. I'm the last of 10 presentations. And I actually also asked the presenters earlier to please not go over five minutes, because I expected an empty room after nine presentations already. Um, so I'm going to comment on, for also a brief five minutes, hopefully, on some existing prerogatives that we have in the trust and safety space and how they clash with encrypted or partially encrypted messaging apps. And then I have some suggestions, and these suggestions are based on research that we've been doing at the Propaganda Research Lab at UT Austin. We focus on comparative international research um, and actually did 189 interviews in 14 countries. Um, just to clarify, 189 interviews were not done by Dr. Sam Woolley, like Sam, who I think is also in the room, and myself, but instead we have a really great team of researchers who are working with us on this. And we did these interviews because we were inquiring three angles. So how are messaging apps exploited for state propaganda? How do regime actors use them in authoritarian states? The second question is, what is the potential of messaging apps for what we call democratic pushback in hybrid states? So that can be organizing potential, but also just sharing anti-regime content, obviously. And then the third angle is, what is the political relevance of messaging apps for minority communities in the US? And this is what my suggestions later also will focus on since we are having this conference here. And Sam and myself, we're very happy to answer more questions about research methodology. So whom did we interview? Which countries? How did we approach this? But as an overview, I hope this is, this is good. And overall, this qualitative approach simply allows us to gain more working towards more in-depth insights on these like more hidden platforms or encrypted spaces around the world. And we simply had some counterintuitive findings for what we we thought would be like the implications for the trust and safety space. Um, two things I'm not going to comment on too much because I think everyone in the room is aware of that. The inherent ambiguity of encrypted messaging apps and the trust and safety space and then the different company structures behind obviously companies that, that uh, own develop messaging apps. So based on our research, what are some of the established wisdoms that exist and how do they clash and how do we think we uh, should potentially challenge them, or at least rethink them. So one of them, like especially when it comes to countering disinformation and extremism, right? Like that's what we focus on. Um, one of them, for instance, is an established wisdom that we need authoritative sources for countering disinformation. 
And our research has really foregrounded um, that authority and authoritative sources are like almost always exclusive and certainly always culturally biased. So for example, in the US, the promotion of authoritative sources, and that can be the platform itself, an established journalist or even an academic, and official narratives are likely not to be effective in messaging apps because those are more private spaces and they came to develop for some communities, especially diaspora communities in the US, what we call subalter counter publics, using terminology from critical studies media scholars here. In other words, so trying to rephrase that, deliberations of any type of interventions on messaging apps, for instance, to one Latinos who use WhatsApp, for instance, a lot about potential disinformation, can be counterproductive by, because minority communities who found a safe space to communicate detached from the majority-dominated public discourse are highly unlikely to be receptive by interventions of authorities linked to the former. Um, another established wisdom which obviously comes a bit more from the extremism space, but something that's still discussed, there needs to be backdoors into online spaces. Thank you. And our research has shown how the undermining of encryption and the use of privacy on messaging apps is harmful for democratic pushback. So multiple activists and journalists we spoke to in Morocco, for instance, were citing examples that were allegedly state forces in um, the Western world gained access to private spaces. So this means even if there's an even if their communication is secured by end-to-end -end encryption because they use Signal, for instance, deliberately, um, the existing examples of discussions and yeah, examples of invasion into those spaces in democracies are daunting for those activists who are already struggling with trusting their communication channels are not infiltrated by the local regime. So I just want to outline kind of like the international um, follow-up steps. So what we, um, I can really just briefly comment on this, but there needs to be bottom-up engagement, um, but more from a societal perspective than an individual user perspective. So for instance, Telegram in Germany has been asking individual users what they think about uh, sharing IP addresses with law enforcement, but this is like a sole crowdsourcing approach. Like we are arguing much more from a societal perspective that we don't need a consultation process, aka asking for opinions, aka asking for inputs, aka asking some minority communities, but instead we need a decision-making conversion because that would allow for building real spaces for solutions. Um, okay, thank you. So at this point, we do have time for some Q&A. I think what we'll do is if we have mic runners um, and then folks want to come up here and, and answer questions about your talk. Um, so do we have any questions? Hands? Yes, in the back. You, you have a mic. I'll, I'll hold it. Oh, okay. Uh, so my name is Courtney Raj. I'm at the UCLA Institute for Technology, Law and Policy. And my question was about the jihadology um, issue of you know, this type of material being online. I'm in the GIFCT, the um, International Advisory Committee, and I would love to talk more about how to protect that type of material and whether um, hashing, you know, I know they're developing um, the ability to share hashes on PDFs, and um, right now it's mainly on multimedia, but you know, we, I think we should talk further about that, and so I'd be interested in additional examples and knowing and, and figuring out whether there's you know, more that we can do to try to protect that. So that's for, that's for Amanda. Is that, that's question, that question is for Amanda Boharian? Oh, I'm sorry, Aaron, please. Please. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, so my website, Geodology, is now behind a password protection since April 2019 after engagement with the UK government, GIFCT, and Tech Against Terrorism. So you have to have an institutional affiliation to get access to it through an email address, so a .edu, a .gov, um, a journalist's email address, what have you. Um, uh, through my work on uh, jihadology, the, the database itself is actually used as a way to then go to other platforms to take the content down. So Tech Against Terrorism 
uses the whole archive on my website and anything that new is created, they'll then use that to then give a signal out to any other tech companies. Whether it's then hashed within the database, within the GIF-CT, or whether the tech companies actually act on it, I don't know, I don't work there, but um, there is a system where you know people behind the scenes have access to the content itself, even if I'm the only one that's running the website on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yep. Uh, my question is for uh, Inga from UT Austin. Um, you say we have to have a backdoor access from in end-to-end -end, uh, systems. How do we prevent, you know, governments or, or, yeah, how would we prevent governments just to start with from um, abusing these backdoors? Um, okay, I'm really glad you're asking the question because clearly I was rushing through my presentation. <laughs> Um, so basically, I'm saying we, that is an established wisdom that we still need backdoors to end-to-end -to -end encryption. Like, Aaron and I have been working in the extremism space for a long time, have heard this for a long time, and now we are, I've been hearing it more and more with regard to mis- and disinformation as well. And actually, what I, want, what I was trying to say is that it's an established wisdom that won't work in the ways that we anticipated in the mist info space as well because of like those international repercussions and implications for minority communities. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, over there. A uh, question for Vanessa. Um, uh, and I'm Brian from Patreon, on the kind of multi-tiered enforcement approach, what are some of the considerations of what level of that granularity you want teams to enforce on, and how do you essentially kind of operationalize those various tiers of enforcement? Um, so the first part of sorry, where were you sitting? Okay. Um, so the first part of your question, the on the granularity of the teams, is that right? Can you repeat the first part? And I think I got the second. What kind of determines what level of enforcement you're going to take at that first level? Got it. Um, yeah, I guess so. Um, I was trying to keep it to five minutes, but I think um, one one important um, additional like information I would have given had I had unlimited time. Um, I think it's like that consideration of like false positives and false negatives, right? If you're enforcing at the account level, um, it would be better to tolerate more false negatives because you still have other ways of enforcing. Like, if you're not 100% sure that the purpose of this one account is abuse, then probably you shouldn't be taking down the account. Probably you should only be taking down the actual abuse. Um, but there are like cases of abuse where you know, especially like spam. I think spam is like a great example because I think people don't think about it enough um, and it's a huge, con huge problem um, and it's a huge consideration for um, scaled uh, trust and safety teams. Um, you can have content that by itself is not abusive at all and it's used in an abusive context. Um, so for example, you can have an empty document that is shared in a really spammy way or you can have, um, you know, you, you, can, you can really, just by looking at the content, sometimes not know um, what the problem with it is. And so if you know that, for example, one account is a spammer account, right? If you try to look at all their docs, a lot of their docs are not going to have any, like, they might not have any content, right? Like, they might, they might not be doing anything with a lot of, with a lot of their stuff, but, but we can find out that the purpose of this is only to spam others. And so I think, I think like, the main consideration has to be, like, the false positive, false negative, right? Um, and then I think for the second part of the question, the way I understood it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it's about, you know, how should we build that into the enforcement system, like the different layers, or would you like to add something to the question? Then uh, is it essentially the person doing the moderation is suggested to enforce at a particular level, you know, based on the model score, other factors, or how is that kind of uh, operationalized? Got it. Um, so the, the different layers, like there's different protections built at every layer, right? It's not, we have like 
one rule that will trigger on the account level, and like if that one doesn't fit, then we already like move on to the next level. Like depending on what we've seen, what we anticipate, and like also what current abuse trends are, we can tell, okay, well, right now we have a problem with this type of abuse, and then the best way of enforcing on that will be like at this um, level. Like you try to pick a level that's least disruptive but will still actually stop the abuse, and then you build something that will be effective. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Oh, yes, over here. Um, I have one for Amanda. Uh, we've spoken at multiple places about how industry partners should be sharing um, what we are learning. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm touching from Meta. Um, so how would you encourage uh, these partners to share that information, and what kind of information would that be? And I think that's one of the intentions behind bringing everybody together is so that we can co-create what it looks like. We can have people from industry, academia, um, government, NGOs, et cetera, to decide what we want that to be. I think it starts with transparency and trust, much like what we want to establish within our platforms individually. And so the key would be at, at different points in the road that we're trying to build, what, where are people comfortable? Where are the limitations of that comfort? What do those limitations have an effect on? And then where do we want to move and how can we get there? Um, I think it was mentioned earlier that, you know, talking about sharing data, et cetera, you know, I'm sure any, anybody working on a legal team in here like tenses up and, and et cetera. So obviously there's a culture that's not yet established that supports that, but yet here we are and everyone in the room kind of identifying that that's the pathway that we need. So it's establishing some use cases and taking a little bit of risk in doing so for the first time instead of waiting for the next person or the next organization to do so. So I think keys are co-creation, um, and diligence in kind of committing to making a move towards that rather than saying, this is something that we need, but I don't want to be the first one to do it. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, well, let's give another round of applause to our speakers. I think we learned a lot, uh, especially I noted this sort of uh, countering of priors around there's toxic or non-toxic, there's fringe and there's mainstream, right? I think there's, as the field develops and as the research develops, moving towards a more and more nuanced approach and very excited to see what people bring to the lightning talks next year. Um, so we have a break now until 3 p.m. Um, and at 3 p.m. in this room, there will be a session on how streaming and short form video are changing trust and safety. There will also be a session on a research panel on moder moderation and harm reduction and a discussion session on younger users and child safety. Thank you all so much for coming.
hear me? Am I on here? Testing, testing, okay. Hey, everyone, we're gonna get started. Um, welcome back. This is the last talk before happy hour, so um, we're between you and drinks. Thanks for being here. Um, so yeah, my name's Alex Heath. I'm an editor at The Verge. I cover social media, uh, platform shifts in technology, things like moving from mobile phones to AR, VR, fun stuff like that. Um, we've got a great panel here today. To my immediate left, we have Eric Hahn. He's the head of safety for TikTok in the US and Canada. We have Emmanuel Saliba, who is an independent investigative reporter and host of Tracing the Truth on YouTube. And Renee DiResta is the technical research manager for the Stanford Internet Observatory. Um, we were going to have someone from Twitch here, actually, but they couldn't make it. Uh, but that's okay. We're still going to have a great conversation. Uh, the way we're going to do it is have about 45 minutes of just discussion uh, on this topic. And then we have some mic runners, and we'll have about 15 minutes for Q&A from you guys for the panel. So um, before we jump in, I'd love for each of you to just maybe give a little bit of background about yourselves and um, how you came to what you're doing now. Eric, we can start with you. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Eric. Uh, I got into trust and safety because I was applying to law school, and my friend saw that I was miserable and said, hey, be a content moderator. I'm like, sure. Um, <laughs> so started that 15 years ago and just kept taking the LSAT until I realized this is where I belong. And I uh, have worked at a vast array of different tech companies, all in trust and safety, policy, moderation, product. And now I'm here at TikTok talking to everyone here. So. Nice to see everyone. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Nice to see everyone. Uh, so I have sort of made a career out of being very good at finding things on the internet uh, and verifying it. So I started out by helping NBC News build uh, their user-generated content team and their verification team. And I did that in the US and in Europe. And the, what we were trying to accomplish is to bring verification to broadcast. Like, how do we explain to people what's real and what's not on television and online? And uh, then I recently became independent, and I started a YouTube channel to do exactly that, so help people understand how they're being manipulated online, how I verify information, and I try to be very transparent in the steps that I take to do that type of work so everyone can come away sort of learning a little bit more about it. Uh, and I'm Renee. I'm a um, technical research manager here at SIO. And you know, we study the use and abuse of current information technology. That's our mission. I feel like you've heard from a lot of people at SIO today. But um, my work, I kind of came to it by looking at originally online conspiratorial communities um, and how they were remarkably effective at using um, kind of networked communication techniques and things like that, using the internet as it was intended to be used for networked communication. But, uh, also doing things that involved a lot of uh, sort of more manipulative things, like in the early days it was bots. And I just got very interested in the idea of how you could take a system that was intended for communication and intended to bring people together um, and misuse the system. And so that was sort of my path into this was very much, uh, was very much kind of focused on that. And a lot of the work that we do at SIO does ask those questions, kind of uh, mentally red teaming out when a new feature emerges, how does that impact trust and safety? When a new platform emerges, what happens? When we think about social media as a system and there are new entrants into the system or new features or new techniques or new uh, platforms, uh, how do we think about the ways in which harm transforms uh, as actors who want to use the, those kinds of tools or misuse those kinds of tools uh, incorporate them into their toolkits? And so that's part of the work that we do at SIO. Awesome. Um, the subject of this talk, I think, feels very timely because video is this kind of, as everyone in this room knows very well, as I know in my coverage, is this kind of sea change that's happening where how people share online is shifting dramatically from text and photos to being more video. And it's been happening, obviously, but it's happening more dramatically right now. And I think TikTok represents that shift probably more than any other platform. So Eric, so glad you're here today. Um, it also, you know, video presents a lot of challenges on the trust and safety side, you know, which is what the, the title of this, um, that, that's different from text and photos. And I thought maybe we would just kind of start there at a high level. And um, actually, Renee, if, if you could start, I would love to kind of know from your all's perspective here um, at Stanford and what you're observing, what are the challenges you're seeing um, on the trust and safety side with video that's different from photos and text? 
So some of the work that we do involves trying to assess um, what is you know what is going viral, right? Where is there um, where is there either an emerging claim, um, or is there some sort of uh, brigading or call to action, call for violence, um, some sort of manipulative effort? Again, uh, kind of we focus on high harm areas. So we're looking at very particular things. I'll give a particular example. Um, you know, during the George Floyd protests, uh, there was a moment when a lot of the Facebook Watch tab consisted of videos of people who were at various protests throughout, um, throughout summer of 2020. And the question of were those people really there was a very interesting one, right? And um, we, we, we spent a lot, we engaged with a lot of other entities, sometimes media, sometimes other researchers, civil society, and we got a ping from a reporter at the Wall Street Journal who said, you know, there's this thing, it's live on the watch tab, um, but it doesn't appear to be live. You know, can you, can you take a look at, you know, what's, what's happening here? I think these are old videos. And so we went and, um, you know, we use a lot of kind of open source, uh, open source intelligence techniques to kind of see where did a video emerge from, where did it come from, where, you know, where is it, where is it going? And what we found was um, a collection of pages that were being run uh, primarily out of Pakistan uh, in which the, these, they're, they're financially motivated, right? They know that a lot of people are paying attention. A lot of people are searching for a particular keyword. They're searching for a hashtag with the name of a protest. They're searching for a hashtag with the name of an individual. And so if they can capitalize on that attention and make people pay attention to see their content, right? It's a game for, you know, to, to try to make their content the thing that's surfaced. Um, then they can grow followers for their page that they can monetize down the road, or they can push people to a website which is already monetized. And so you see spammers are actually remarkably innovative at kind of capturing, uh, you know, kind of working to capture attention in these, in these breakout moments. Um, and so what we were seeing was people who were using uh, gaming technology um, that makes it look as if a user is streaming live in that moment, and we're using the gaming technology and we're running old footage of, uh, of officer arrests, you know, particularly violent looking arrests, and they were running that through that, uh, the kind of like the gaming uh, software so that it was looking as if it was live. And so there were people all over the world commenting on this sort of like carnage in American streets as this was happening. Um, so this, this takes time to figure out like what is happening. You know, we, it took us a better part of a weekend actually to sort of sort out uh, what pages were likely involved, how many pages were in the network, what they had been before, whether they were economically motivated. Um, you know, why they were doing this, and then the Wall Street Journal wound up kind of writing this up, but um, it's very hard to authenticate video. It's, you know, there's so many tools, right click and Google image search is right there for you, right? There's TinEye, there's so many tools that make it um, fairly easy, you know, the Dali and some other things are kind of, um, again, in increasing adversarial uh, capabilities there, but with something like images or text, you can trace back a little bit more easily, whereas when something is a video, uh, it's a lot harder to figure out in that moment where it came from. And so there's just detection challenges for understanding, but at the same time, the stakes are quite high, particularly in a protest situation, um, particularly in perhaps an election, also the, you know, kind of calls for violence at polls and things like that. Um, as we try to understand the, the you know, working against the clock with these stakes, uh, it's just a lot harder to assess video um, rather than uh, other yeah. mediums. Emmanuel, you do this all the time. Um, <laughs> yeah. This is kind of what you do. Um, what do you look for? I mean, what, wh how hard is it to catch these videos when the intent is to deceive? Yeah. Um, what do you look for? What, are there patterns you, you've recognized over the years? I mean, it was so interesting hearing you talk because that's, yeah, that's what I've sort of spent the, the better part of a decade doing. And um, at least from the perspective of a news organization and a broadcast, news organization, we've always been focused on video uh, because that's what we're, we're delivering to our audiences. And uh, so as soon as video started to be a really relevant form of news gathering, we spun up a team that, that focused on video verification and we trained journalists around our news organization. And now so many news organizations have that, but when it comes to live television, you know, we have to be in the, on the air, especially with cable, um, fairly quickly. So a video, like you're saying, it would be coming to that team and we would try to reach the, the uh, original poster um, or try to find, use satellite imagery and identify markers in the video to see whether or not it was truly taken in that protest location. And those are quick ways that we do that. Um, but, you know, you've got all of the executive producers calling you saying, can we air this, can we air this, can we air this? So 
I mean, it's been something we've been working on for the better part of a decade, um, and it changes depending on which platforms are popular, right? So just like you said, now TikTok is something that the that I as a journalist and these teams and news organizations are starting to really try to understand how we can find these videos and how they should not end up on our air. <laughs> yeah. um, Eric, I was reading your all's recent transparency report that you just put out. Just some interesting stats I thought I'd give for folks who haven't read it. You took down over 113 million videos between April and June. That's just about 1% of the total videos uploaded. Nearly 96% of those were removed before a user reported them. So fair amount of automation happening there. Um, most common reason for removal was violating policies around minor safety. That was about 44% of the videos that were taken down. Can you walk us through, I think a lot of people here are probably really curious because um, we haven't heard from you guys as much on this, how you approach trust and safety on the platform kind of holistically and then what I just called out in the transparency report? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I think just to reflect on what you were saying in terms of the evolution of it's, it's wild to see like yeah. core expression is video these days, right? Yeah. Like I think when I first started, it was text static images and the main mode of detection was a user report, right? It was sitting there, Zendesk, whatever CRM tool you're using and someone's reporting something and you review text. And now we're at the stage where video, both short and long form, whether it's a minute to five minutes, has all these different signals in there. So reflecting on what both of you were saying, which is here's text, here's symbolism, here's iconography, here's a smash cut, here's a montage, here's juxtaposition. Yeah. It has an entirely new language, and everyone has it at the tip of their fingertips because they all have a phone now, right? So typically, most trust and safety teams and how they think about strategies or remedies are a combination of technology and people. The technology part is meant to detect and triage. Do I have a high probability based on the content that I'm seeing plus different behavioral signals to help triage that to the right person? Because you still need us, people, that understand language, nuance, and context to make decisions when it comes to enforcement but also to inform what detection mechanisms you're building so you have a predictive algorithm that's not biased. So you have something that is NLP that doesn't restrict certain uh, languages over the other. So generally high level, that's uh, how, we, how we do it and how I've done it in the past at different companies as well. But how does it work on your team? How are, how are you set up? Um, you're, you're over the US and Canada. How does that work inside TikTok and ByteDance more broadly? Like yeah. what's your reporting structure? How does your org, what does your org actually do to every day? Yeah, so most trust and safety teams have, are broken up by a variety of different capabilities and subject matters, right? So you have policy, you have enforcement, you have product safety, you have engineering, uh, legal policy operations, data science, et cetera. You have all those teams all over the world making sure that you are effectively handling and scaling to that point, uh, 113 million videos is 1% of all videos uploaded. I'm not good at math, but you can probably extrapolate how many videos are uploaded within that quarter. So I think the really great thing about uh, what attracted me to come to TikTok as well is at, at previous companies I've joined, it was very much centralized in one place, right? Here's your trust and safety team. It was San Francisco. Um, for me, going in and saying, hey, US and Canada, that's my purview. Then we have folks in Dublin. We have folks in Singapore that are also bringing in cultural norms and context around, hey, this is the type of content that we're seeing. Because when we have folks focus on hate or violent extremism in the US, we're looking at things like 3% are Oath Keepers, Proud Boys. That doesn't exist in, in Singapore. So it's a shared kind of mind meld in terms of the strategies we have and the type of people that are looking at what's happening in the so if, so if content originates from the US or Canada, it's going to be your team that's looking versus if it's originating from Europe or... Because it's a global platform. I mean, TikTok's right. in a lot of places. So yep. I'm just curious how that geography difference works? Not necessarily. I think it's more around when you have policy folks that are working region to region, you're thinking about within that scope. Okay. Um, but of course, there's always cross-border content that comes. Something, the one that comes to mind, I don't know if you remember this one, the German video with the, the kid on the street. Do you remember no. that one? He was, I forget. I'll send it to you later. Okay. But that <laughs> like, went bonkers in the US, and we were uh, just like, we don't understand what this that's means. That's what I was asking. So if yeah, it's yeah, a, yeah. something that happens in Europe, but it goes crazy viral in the US, how yeah. does that work? When, okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, Chris, do you have any kind of like purview, or how, do, how does trust and safety work with that for you page and the algorithm? Do, are, you more, are you more just on the kind of policy enforcement side of a certain video, or do you actually, does your, do your teams weigh in on how the algorithms work? Uh, so with regards to, I think, 
for, for us, when we write policies, it's meant to be, here are the things from our community guidelines that set the standard of what type of platform we want to be. That includes things like violations, removing from platform. But I think, and I actually give credit to Renee to this, I don't actually know if you coined this term, but I always credit to you as the difference between reach and speech. Is there asking and I? Yeah, it was, okay, so shout out to Renee. <laughs> okay. But I think in the, in the most recent years, so it's pertinent to your question around, hey, there are uh, policies that we have and enforcement mechanisms that should be proportionate to the severity of the violation. One of that is deamplification or reducing discovery of content. Okay. So to answer your question, there are policies in place of like that looks spammy on, our, on original, that might be implied nudity, so that how, how it gets affected within um, the For You feed. Got it. Um, so we have like long form video and we have short form and TikTok's increasingly doing both, going long um, as well. Um, what are the different like trust and safety problems between short form clips and long form? Uh, we'll start with you and then maybe just go down. Yeah, I think uh, first and foremost when we write our community guidelines and strategies, our hope is that they are holistic enough to be applied to everything. That's certainly not the case, which is why you have product engineering teams that are focused on different feature sets. Because for take for example, short and long or even live, your hope is, hey, we built this uh, model to catch for hateful iconography in video. And I sit down with people much smarter than me that have CS degrees, and I say, can you use the same model in live? It's like, no, let me explain to you sequencing. I'm like, sure, I'll pretend to understand what that means. <laughs> Thank you for educating me. So yeah, we always try to do that in terms of applying strategies that might work. But oftentimes, it's an evolution of those strategies over and over again, A-B testing, seeing what works, and then acknowledging that uh, different features and mediums had different exploitations. Do you do either of you have thoughts about this? Um, it, I think it, it it comes in a little bit in moderation questions around. Um, sometimes a short form video might be like the entirety of the video is focused on a particular harassment angle or a particular um, violative topic. Right, you've only got thirty seconds. You're trying to get a particular message across. Whereas the long form stuff, you'll see. Um, you know, people are just sitting there streaming for an hour, and so the question becomes like if the problem happens at minute 34, um, what should the action be taken? You know, what action should be taken on the entirety of the video? And I don't think that we've really seen a particularly strong set of policies emerge um, with regard to that. Yeah, we also don't seem to have consensus on live streaming and gating that. I was just researching, yeah. I was researching how each platform has different rules for who can live stream. Um, so for example, I think you all, TikTok, is you have to be over 16, in the app and have at least a thousand followers before you can go live. I think Facebook doesn't have a restriction. Um, other platforms have different ones. Snap approaches it very differently on their spotlight page. It's not live, but similar concept. Um, can we get to some kind of consensus on like when it's appropriate for someone to just be able to go live as, a, as an industry? I mean, I think, you know, Emmanuel, we've seen that in the, I think in the media of like the, the negative ramifications of like what happens when anyone can go live. Uh, and what gets streamed, and um, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of an open-ended question, but um, maybe Eric, how do you guys think about your live product and how that's rolled out and who can access that in what situation? Yeah, I think it's the same, as, same philosophy as how we thought about other features as well, which is what are exploits that could happen. So to Renee's point, if anyone could go live and it's five hours straight, then we need machine learning or technology to help us determine at exactly what minute something might happen, and also remediation steps to either triage for someone to review or even automatically do something, right? So to that point, that's first and foremost. To all our uh, product manager friends, include your trust and safety person at design phase, not implementation phase, so we have more time to actually think about these things. Um, so it always kind of goes through that, um, both with regards to content that might show up and, for example, text, right? Text has so, such a lower uh, entry barrier. So, and I think all of us can agree that when you look at comment sections, they can be quite toxic. So you have different strategies there and different high barrier points for safety. It's the same thing that we're thinking for live right now. And you also look at the behavioral aspect of it, right? So what's gonna encourage someone who just created an account, might have created many, many accounts on the same device using certain domains or uh, registries that are, might be associated with problematic content doesn't automatically mean that they're abusive, but it does give you a, a, a signal that they, there might be a probability that you should take a look at this and triage it to the right people to do. And Renee, you, you hinted at this earlier, like the idea that when live is not actually live, and that's, <laughs> yeah. that's deception. And I mean, 
How, how are you thinking about that? Well, that? I mean, that seems like a layup to me. This is one of these, you know, the argument that I heard when I, I did ask, um, you know, I did ask why, why, why is something that is streamed after the fact live? And um, the answer I got back is that certain, uh, certain times, sometimes people are in regions of the world where they don't have very good bandwidth, right? Or they are there, there's a, you know, they're, they're having bandwidth issues, they can't upload it, but they're filming it as a live, and then it goes up after, and they allow it to be uploaded as a live. Um, this is an interesting, you know, this is an interesting dilemma. I, I appreciate that. I think that you could potentially note, you know, maybe as, as, you know, on television they would tell you this was filmed at this time. Like that's actually considered part of the transparency of good reporting or the transparency, uh, you know, not just well, sorry, our internet went out, and so we're now we're just going to pretend that this is happening right now in the world, even though it isn't. So that seems to me like uh, like a fairly, um, you know, you could provide some more context around uh, around these dynamics. The, the other thing I would say is that certain platforms, um, as they try to compete with other platforms, um, uh, as other platforms you know, tend to be attracting um, more audiences that are producing good video or you know, producing compelling video, and then kind of encouraging creators to come back to the platform, um, there has been, you know, there is the, the recommendation engine component where uh, live videos are sort of privileged, right? They're, they're really, they want them. They want to be able to show them. This is like new and emerging and cutting edge and, you know, so, that, so some of the platforms are really sort of soliciting content creators to produce that kind of content. And that also, I think, is, is an area where at that point the platform is uh, exerting almost sort of an editorial dynamic in that it is not, you know, not necessarily choosing which specific video, but we see extraordinary views on things that Facebook puts out on the watch tab. And again, um, holding, uh, holding manipulation aside, people who are just financially motivated, um, you know, Rick Lax, the, I don't know how many, if you, you have guaranteed see this, you go to your watch tab and it's like, um, when she saw it, when he opened the door, right? It's these like very clickbaity type videos. And what they do is, um, again, they produce them, they run them, and then they rerun them as lives. And so you see that because the, um, because the way that the platform is trying to curate and serve up live video to have that for its audiences, that again is a policy area where you're like, this is not live. This is, it's just not live. It's somebody replaying it. And so I think that there is, um, you know, I think that it is somewhat deceptive to the audience and that, that could be an area where, um, you know, again, it's make clear to people what is actually happening, like what you're actually seeing on the platform. Why are people going live on TikTok? I mean, I, I've, I've, I've looked through it and it's, <laughs> it, it, it goes from fairly, like, very mundane, uh, someone sitting in their basement just staring into the camera to, uh, <laughs> to honestly, like, disturbing, like young girls that are, uh, and you can see what's happening there. Um, and I'm just kind of curious, like, what is the live product for TikTok supposed to be? What is it supposed to represent? Yeah, I think it's, it's, um and I'm, I'm not a, a core product person, but it, this is how I'm interpreting it, is in terms of TikTok as that core entertainment platform offering services in any kind of form of expression, right? I think we're all seeing, and obviously we're having this conversation, more and more platforms going live. And I think there's a, a attraction and a benefit anytime a new feature comes through of like, hey, this is a new space for me to actually very much own and set some precedent, right? So I think we've seen a lot of really interesting, especially when it comes to like music or entertainment, folks coming in and really uh, owning their brand within live, and I see there's a lot of incentive for that. I think there's just also a lot of curiosity as well, right, of like, what is this feature, which is why, to your point, we do have limits in terms of how old you are and how many followers you, you have, based on our own research and what we think is appropriate for a barrier of entry, as well as things that we do on our side to make sure that we are, again, detecting things that might be violative so we can make sure that we're responding to them appropriately. Yeah, um, I'd love to switch gears a little bit to this topic of kind of AR, AI generative content and deep fakes. Um, uh, I don't know if people saw today, Meta put out this basically dolly for video. You can just type in a prompt and it spits out a five second AI generated video. Pretty wild. Um, and deep fakes obviously have been a thing. Uh, I just saw one of Keanu Reeves in my TikTok feed yesterday and I swore it was him. Uh, I've interviewed him and I swore it was him. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe we could start with Renee and then go, and then Emmanuel and then just go down. But like, um, what does that? What kind of challenge does this pose? Both the AI generative, generative stuff and deep fakes for trust and safety. I th the um, so deep fakes are not new, of course. You know, the, now the uh, the um, the democratization of the technology is quite new, right? That that is what is different, right? We all knew that that was coming, and so I think one thing that's been interesting about deepfakes is the extent to which it's been communicated to the public that they exist and how they might be misused. And um, this is not something I, I think I, I was writing about deepfake videos like years ago, and then deepfake text in 2018, 2019. 
um, as a, again, as like the work that we do is saying when this new technology is democratized and everyone has access, what are the, you know, what are the vectors, what are the ways in which it's going to be abused? I think on this front, um, it's the challenge, and this I think you'll have probably the most interesting answer to this one, is um, how, do you, how do you detect, right? And it is, there are certain things, in some of the earliest deep fake videos, there were tells. Um, when a person's heart beats, their skin color changes ever so slightly, this doesn't happen in a generated video. There are certain ways in which um, the you know, kind of respiration doesn't match the speech. You know, there are ways in which, but again, that is like a very niche kind of form of authentication and like getting it fast, I think is, is, uh, is, hard, to, you know, is hard to do. And so um, I, we've seen a lot of platforms come out with manipulated media policies. Again, that's more focused on like almost the substance of the, you know, the, the fact that it is manufactured, uh, but also really related to kind of high harm areas in which there's a manipulative component that could, um, you know, be harmful to a person or, or, or something along those lines. But I think this question of, you know, how does, it, how does it make the world more difficult, it's really just that things are seen as very compelling, they go wildly viral, and the fact check takes, the fact check takes a long time to happen. And that's, I think, the, the, the bigger. Yeah, have you come into a lot of, like, have you debunked a lot of deep fakes in your? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, we've, we've been talking about it for a long time, but actually one of the, and I think a lot of media organizations have been sort of like obsessed with the headlines. Um, but one of the things we've come across more often than not are really cheap fakes. And those have a lot more of an impact than deep fakes so far on, on how the, you know, on audience perception and on. Can you explain on, that? Yeah, so, I mean, it's just, you know, a simple editing trick, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's editing out a portion of someone's speech or uh, just truncating a longer, a longer speech, that kind of very easy editing, that goes much further right now than deep fakes. Um, or, um, you know, pulling out like President Biden's audio and putting it on a different type of video, those sort of editing techniques. Uh, those are some of the things that in a newsroom and now as, as an independent journalist I'm really concerned about because that's what we see go very viral. But it's also what's sort of easy to explain to people. How do you verify something like that, right? You're going to go back and you're going to lurk for the original speech um, or the original rally and then you're going to kind of showcase the tools that you can use. I think now for the more complex stuff that's coming out, the deep fakes, um, that are very well made, it would benefit news organization and journalists to have those same tools of detection yeah. in our hands and to be able to do that quickly so we can come out to the audience. Because we actually may be able to do, we do it quickly, but then how, a, a big question you know, I've posed throughout my career is how do, you, how do you bridge that gap between what people are seeing on their phones and what they're seeing on television? Right, because they're seeing these viral videos, but on television, no one is telling them, "Hey, that's fake, and here's why it is." And so we need to to help journalists, and that's through researchers, and that's through platforms, to get access to this type of technology to be able to explain it to the well, public. You, you can, need, I, can I give yeah. one more like I'm just sort of um, thing that I was thinking about? I feel like I always have my like information integrity hat on, but on the trust and safety angle, it's actually the stuff that will not be debunked because it's revenge porn, right? And that's yeah. the kind of stuff that, like the debunking will never happen because the target is not the public, it is not the mass, you know, it's not the mass consumption of the video, that's one threat model, but it's actually the very personalized harassment and the vectors for very personalized harassment where the intent is to post a video of a person uh, particularly a person without a lot of Google search results so that it becomes a top search result for the person. And that, I think, is actually the thing where you're not going to have, uh, that, that is, a, it is a very different um, kind of harm than mass public delusions about a particular video that a journalist is, in fact, going to debunk. And celebrities have actually been yeah. dealing with exactly that for, for quite a while. I think I saw an article recently about it, about how there's just all yeah. of these, this revenge porn on using celebrities. Yeah, I mean, I, I think to what you were saying, Emmanuel, too, about the counter speech element, mm -hmm. you need it on the platform, too, because like do. people, like young people especially, are not watching TV f to get mm -hmm. like right. you know, the news check on this stuff. So like you're, you're posting to YouTube, you're posting yeah. to TikTok, like how do you see where you're going and the mediums you're going to 
in relation yeah. to that? Because are you just trying to meet people where they are? It's, it's, it's yeah, I, I mean, I'm doing it on every platform, and I. Do you mean in terms of, of like just 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 debunk? Yeah, saying yeah, like I this do, has been edited. Like you should. I mean, these kind of videos. You do. I respond directly to. I'm like oh, maybe a little aggressive, but I respond directly <laughs> to the uh, TikTok videos, and I say like this. Um, this is fake, and this is why, and here's how I know, and here's how you can do it in the future, and um, so I do like uh, yeah. stitches or duets, um, and I just tackle the really big ones that have like millions of views um, to really yeah. help audiences on TikTok become a little bit wiser on, on, on how to, like if they come across those types of videos on their feeds, to think twice, right? And yeah. um, there's a there's public schools in Virginia now that are using some of the videos that I've done to help students understand how to do that for themselves when they're online. So I think that's the step in terms of like audience information or, or helping audiences become wiser that, that we can take. And, and my gut is that this kind of counter speech should be as bottom up as possible. It yeah, should yeah. not be yes. top down. Uh, it should be coming from people on the platform. But I, Eric, I am actually curious as someone at a platform how should a platform like TikTok play a role in this kind of stuff? Whether it's, I mean, I think the stuff that Renee was talking about where it's you know, just more clear that it's revenge porn, for example, that's pretty clear, that kind of harassment. But when it's an edited video that's meant to just deceive, and it's, yeah. uh, wh what role does TikTok as a platform play in that? Yeah, I think and both, both you uh, made great points, right? Like cheap fakes. Um, is something that we spend a lot of time thinking about. So when manipulated media or synthetic media really started becoming a topic, mm -hmm. to your point, most people thought about the worst case scenario. Here yeah. is Joe Biden, no one understands whether or not that's the real Joe Biden. Right, but or the, the Pelosi drunk right. video. Well, the Pelosi drunk video, we would that's, actually consider cheap fake. Cheap fake, we thought yeah. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. so that was easier for us to detect in terms of like, you're using technologies that are really mm -hmm. readily available, Photoshop, Final Cut Pro, et cetera, right? Another one that came to mind where we saw go uh, viral on other platforms, for example, was Joe Biden in a bookstore, someone put the CBS logo on the corner right. and then put uh, dementia books, right? No one else can, uh, you see it on platform, you're, you're, those are the type of things where you can say, through our main mode of detections that we have right now in technology for video, hash technology, uh, machine learning, you can detect some of those things. So especially during 2020, and as we're obviously in midterm season, we're using those same strategies in place to say, mm -hmm. from that cheap fake synthetic media perspective, we can reuse that and we have teams that are, some of them are here right now, that are looking at these things every day. Just yesterday, for example, um, found, and we look at a lot of other platforms, right? Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. There's one we saw on Twitter that was going viral of a Russian talk show, and then people just replaced the sub. Did you see this one? Yeah, I did a piece on that. Yeah, it's right, the, right. The, the subtitle one. The body, body bags. Oh, no, the subtitle one. The yeah. subtitle one where they're all talking about getting mobilized. But getting right. drafted, and right. then, exactly. yeah, they, they basically, they, they changed the, the, no one, I mean, right. most people didn't understand what yeah. they were saying, so they, yeah. they invented this. I the saw the former English. White House correspondent um, speaker retweeted. Retweeted. I saw it, Rex yeah. Chapman like it, right? So you <laughs> see things like that, and then you see all the comments speaking of counter speech. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, I'm a Russian speaker. This, <laughs> this is completely <laughs> fake, right? Yeah. So we have teams like that where, where you monitor all of it and see where the conversation is actually happening. And then you can prepare both from a manual and operational perspective with your moderators. Hey, there are trends that are happening on this elsewhere or on platform and then work with your engineers or your RD experts to say, how can we detect this and possibly de-amplify it um, because we know it's synthetic. And I have a question because in that sort of same, uh, same theme, there is a video that kept going viral over the past two years and it was, for, it was it's an Austrian news reporter in front of a climate change demonstration and in the background it's people in body bags and one person is like moving out of their body bag because it's a protest. Um, and it was used by people online to claim that uh, COVID-19 was you know, a, an invention. And then it was reused during the Ukraine and Russia war mm. and even aired on Russian television. And this poor guy just like kept getting, showing up and manipulated a, um, videos, but they took out his voice and they replaced it by um, an NBC correspondent named Cal Perry who mm. was in Ukraine to claim that um, those were like 
the Ukrainian soldiers. Um, and so they were fake bodies, right? But I'm wondering, like, does your system pick up if something has been flagged in the past as, as being manipulated? Do you keep, like, an art, like, does that f keep getting flagged? Because it kept showing up, and not just on your platforms, but on YouTube and on Facebook. Um, and they just kept changing just, like, the lower third, uh, one yeah. image, the voice, and this guy for, like, two years has been getting death threats and he's like part of different conspiracy theories globally. So I'm curious, like how do you know, platforms tackle that? Yeah, I think that's a challenge, right? And they're, again, smarter engineers than, than me that can probably <laughs> explain it. But it's so easy, right, with hash ID and technology to just change one second of something mm -hmm. and then you just have to re-approach it again, right? I think obviously missing this information is something, a, a huge priority for us. But even when it comes to, we, we're just talking about non-consensual nudity and bullying harassment, violent extremist imagery. I think some of the more malicious things we often see is like, here's a three minute video at the last second it's a cat video and all of a sudden you see something Bad. awfully horrific, right? right? So the technology has to catch up to make sure, and this is the other part too, is like there is a world where over moderation is a problem, right? So speaking of when you doing, do predictive algorithms, making sure it's not garbage in, garbage out, because the further you go, I remember, I, I quote Alex on this all the time, Alex says 99.9% uh, .9 of the time when you think it's censorship is someone wrote a spam bot and forgot about it. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, that's very much true. It's yeah. like, you see a problem, you're firefighting. How do you approach it at the moment? And then technical debt. That, mm -hmm. per, that engineer leaves, gets promoted, doesn't look at it anymore, and all of a sudden, something happens, and you're like, oh, that thing from right. 2016. Let's take a look at that. Does anything exist to technically analyze this stuff at scale, this level? I mean, I, I did the math while you were talking, and you just add two zeros. I mean, you're talking over a billion videos uploaded uh, in three months to TikTok. I mean, how in the world do you computationally, like in, from an engineering perspective, begin to understand the contents of all those videos? You can't, right? I don't. It's like it's, you it, can't. it hurts my brain, right? Yeah. So yeah, but I think that's why detection and triage is so important, right? I think fortunately, thankfully, and this is something I truly do believe in, when most people post content, they do it with good intentions and they want to put joy out in the world, right? So I think within that, and I think the numbers do prove that, that the vast majority of content is um, uh, safe and, and good for a platform. So I think that's why you're focusing so much and, and the topics that we're talking about is, per, is uh, relevant or emblematic of that. It's like, here's hate, violent extremism, mm -hmm. synthetic media, misinformation. What are the high harm things that we see? And what is, it, what is actually prevalent platform to platform, right? Because each platform is different. What we see at TikTok, and in my, oops, sorry, in my experience working at places like Twitter and Google, they had different problems, right? That is different uh, forms, of, uh, forms of prevalence. So that's why you have to make sure that you're using your resources correctly and make the probable uh, a big bet to say, this is where it's going, let's focus on that. And then be agile enough to say when you are wrong and you predicted it wrong, which does happen, you could pivot and go over to that uh, issue area later. Renee, I mean, what areas of research need that? Is, are there more, is just there more research that needs to happen on this topic for the platforms and for everyone to begin to understand even more of kind of the harms that we I mean, we're I, uh, <laughs> I hear there's a TikToker, TikTok researcher API in the mm -hmm. works. You know? Yep, yep. I can talk <laughs> more about that. That'll be useful. That, yeah. Um, no, I think for some of it is, uh, it's access, you know, researcher access. That's, that's still sort of like a whole topic for a whole other panel, but um, kind of like uh, negotiating um, how to do things that are privacy protecting if that's a concern, but also that provide users, uh, sorry, researchers some more visibility. Um, and that I think is uh, an area where with more access, we can kind of come up with better, uh, you know, better models for how particular harms, you know, manifest. And, and that I think is where we have some work to do. Yeah, yeah, I'd say the same thing for investigative journalism. I mean, not being able to look back on certain accounts, uh, not being able to actually watch videos that are hidden from the public is ex extremely difficult for us to do our jobs and to understand events and to explain them to, to the audience if we, if we can't look at that content. Eric, you've been nodding. Would you like TikTok to be more, <laughs> to be more open? To yeah, no, we, are, we are very, very excited, as, as Renee uh, uh, just mentioned, that we announced recently that we're, gonna, we're working and hoping, hopefully by the end of the year, releasing a TikTok uh, research API for select researchers of uh, public and anonymized data. 
part of that is not just the content on TikTok. We're also trying to build a moderation API, something that's very close to my heart starting off as an investigator and moderator, which is not enough attention in terms of like the user experience for moderation platform tools. Um, the one anecdote I like talking about to show the difficulty of, of platforms and moderation tools is, remember that time when everyone in Hawaii thought they were gonna die because a missile was gonna hit them? Do you remember that? No one remembers that? I, yeah, a yeah. Bit, yeah. But, the, but part of that was because uh, it was bad UX. It was someone took a screenshot of the platform and the test button was right next to the action button. Mm -hmm. So that poor person that worked for the government was like, oh, I guess we're doing testing today. Pressed the button, walked away, got coffee. 15 minutes later, all of Hawaii thought they were gonna die, right? So I think part of that is also making was sure. Was this one like the phone alert went out to everyone? Yes. Oh yes, my I God, remember I didn't yeah. remember this. Right, wow. right, right. Yeah. So that's the anecdote I always wanna tell when someone's <laughs> like, hey, Eric, you took down, uh, your team took down someone's video. How can you let that happen? I'm like, well, Someone also pressed the wrong button and everyone in Hawaii thought they were gonna die. But that's, that's the point I'm trying to make in terms of like not just the content on platform, but also we should be opening up to look at tools and different structures in place for folks. So there are a lot of really smart PhDs that I've talked to around like this is where you use a rated button instead of a drop down. I'm like, oh, please tell me more, right? So mm -hmm. we're, we're very excited to do that. We've obviously, that's why we're here. That threat research intelligence team is here. Renee, I think they would love to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so please find them, talk to them. They're soliciting feedback. We have our own content advisory council that's been uh, managing and helping us do that as well. So we're, we're very excited. So you think research API by the end of the year? That's our goal, yes. That's what we said in our blog post. Yeah. But I understand it's almost October, so I'm yes. sweating a little bit. We're about to be in Q4. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, <laughs> well, we're approaching 15 minutes. Um, do we have audience questions? We, yeah, we do. Okay, awesome. So we have mics on both sides of the room. Um, we'll do right here in the front first. Hi, I'm Anatoly Gruz from Social Media Lab at Toronto Metropolitan University. I have a question for Eric. Uh, so you mentioned researchers API, which is an important step forward, to, um, you know, high transparency in terms of uh, trust and safety. But I was concerned you mentioned, and the blog post also mentioned select researchers will have access to it. It reminded me, the reason I'm concerned because it reminded me early years of the current social media giants releasing data to only select institutions, either industry friendly or insiders. So how do we make sure that the API is actually accessible to independent researchers and yeah. not just in the US? Thank no. you, Eric. Of course, no, that's a, that's a great question. And I was just actually talking to our, our head of research team around making sure that there's actual ethical guidelines and, and standards that should be uh, publicized. It's something that we're still working on. Um, I truthfully am not as close to some of that criteria, but it's something that I know those teams are spending a lot of time to make sure that it makes public and defensible sense uh, when uh, that eventually does become public. Next, someone over here. Do the front right here. We gotta hold the mic for you. Oh, sure, Justin Hendricks from uh, <laughs> Tech Policy Press. So I, I know that uh, TikTok is uh, the subject of a class action lawsuit by your moderators um, who claim you've created an unhealthy work environment. What are you doing to improve the water, uh, work environment for your content moderators? As long as I've been in trust and safety, and as I mentioned, I started off as a moderator. I think when I first started, there weren't a lot of well-being and resiliency programs. Obviously, for now, all of us that are in trust and safety have uh, programs both internally as well as external vendors coming in to make sure that we are providing a safe and um, resilient environment for all moderators to work in. Um, I started off working specifically on child sexual abuse material, and by the time of my tenure working on that, if I didn't have those resources both from internal and external and, and good management to help me go through that, I wouldn't be here today doing what I'm doing, so it's a huge, a huge priority for us to continue to do so. Do you all, I don't remember if I saw this or not, but do you guys disclose in your transparency report how much content is reviewed by humans versus just AI? Meta started kind of touting AI uh, enforcement on things like hate speech. Um, do you guys break that out? I don't know, it doesn't come to mind exactly if we break it out that way, but in our transparency report we talk about um, uh, time to first attack before 24 hours before it was reported. Um, but I don't have that top of okay. mind right now. Um, next question over here. We've got several over here. Oh, front right here. We can go to the back on the next one. Hi, uh, Anjali from YouTube. Um, I'm curious what problem areas, you know, especially related to short form video, 
um, keep you up at night. I know for streaming and short form both, there's a concern around child safety. We talked a lot about misinfo and taking clips out of context. Um, what would you say are like your top three, you know, wow, this keeps me up at night? Is this for me? I think it's for anyone. It's for anyone? Yeah. I'm going to defer because I took the first two. <laughs> I mean, I think it's the ones you mentioned, um, but I, I, they don't keep me up at night. I think it's just, it's part of my job um, to find those and to verify them. Um, yeah, so, but I think th that's probably a different, I different think way it's, of approaching I, it for you. In my mind, it used to be more subject matter, like issue areas, mm -hmm. and I think now it's more about scale for me, which is yeah. our systems that we put in place and we put a lot of energy in, ready for the amount of content that keeps coming through. So whether it is on the child safety or hate or violent extremist side, it is, is this machine that we built to, again, detect triage and when we can prevent actually working on all cylinders and also making sure that we have the foresight to look back and say, we'd love to do reviews and postmortems all the time, like when things might fall through. Are we incentivizing ourselves enough to do that as well? So just keeping up that spirit and resiliency is, is the thing that I don't sleep. So that keeps me up. In it's not spot. just you. I, I, yeah. I mean, I I, uh, I did a story about how some uh, the Facebook news feed uh, for six months they had a massive uh, internal failure where their integrity pass on ranking just broke and they couldn't figure out what was going wrong. Right. And they had a, a lot of people on it. It took them six months. And yeah. and uh, you're, you're not alone in that. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I think that's. I don't think I have anything to add really. Yeah. I, I would say I think about short form video and also just like the lack of context that people are able to add to it and the real world impact that that has. There's a great example of a video that recently went viral on TikTok. It had over two million views of a woman sitting in the subway in New York. She was filmed secretly and the caption, they just added a monkey and a question mark. So they implied that she had monkeypox. Um, she later found out because her sister called her and said, hey, I found this video of you, and her coworkers had seen it. Um, and so that woman's life was turned upside down, and she was receiving death threats. It turns out she had a rare genetic disease that causes tumors on her skin. And so I think about it really from the perspective of like real world harm. How is this impacting the people in these yeah. videos that go viral? Um, and what can we do at least from a journalist's point of view or media point of view to remedy that and to add context and to maybe shed some light on communities that, that are being affected or the people being affected by these, this, this un, she did not want to go viral and she hates fame. So, um, yeah. you know, how, how can we help? Yeah, that? we had a lot of hands back in this corner, um, whichever, yeah. Hi, Courtney Raj from UCLA Institute for Technology, Law and Policy. So there are, um, to, to Emmanuel's you know, question about the, these videos that keep like resurfacing, for example, we're talking about disinformation, the online harassment aspect. We are seeing hash databases used for um, cross-platform coordination, removal of CSAM material, and for terrorism and violent extremist material at the GIFCT, the Global Internet Forum for Counterterrorism. Um, do you think that that is a solution? I think a lot about the potential harms of that, but it's interesting to see that, you know, are companies thinking about doing that for disinformation, um, for these videos that keep re-popping up? Why and why not? And Renee, I'd also love to hear your thoughts on that. I think my very quick uh, response would be, um, I, I do really like that collaborative model. I've read the critiques of it. I understand where people are coming from, arguing that, you know, then it creates an environment in which there's like a perception of collusion or that all of the platforms are, are kind of coming together to create a um, kind of like a mass big tech, um, this is acceptable content, this is acceptable discourse kind of um, framework. Again, I think we were kind of chatting earlier today about this notion of harm and how we don't have particularly good rigorous models of, you know, the uh, kind of like the outcome and the, uh, and are there ways to create, GIFCT was created, and I'm sure you're, you know, you're familiar with the history here, a lot of the uh, work that it did was kind of post Christchurch call also where there was some real clear arguments like for um, particular manipulation that had gone, um, that had kind of come about as a result of that video as well. But previously, GIFCT had really been focused on a particular form of political terrorism. And so these questions of uh, what constitutes terrorism, what kinds of violence fall under these rubrics, how should we think about white supremacist violence, how should we think about domestic, um, you know, kind of extremism. And I think that th these are areas where um, 
beyond the technical solution to you know how should we hash this or you know come together around that, uh, there's a question of what are the high harm areas where we think these collaborations make sense, and that I think is um, kind of a a thing that is um, that is really worth kind of getting more into from a policy framework. I will say that one of the challenges is as we think about conceptualizations of harm, again we kind of go back to uh, our visibility as outside researchers is highly limited. And so our perception of harm, therefore, is shaped more almost by, at this point, things like leaked documents showing platform internal research quantifying harm, as opposed to things that were done uh, by research teams where we have our own conception of it. Anyone else have thoughts on that, or we move on? OK. Um, we have, yeah, either over here, where, is the, where's the mic at? Yeah, OK, over there. Hi, um, my name is Alex Reed. My question is for Eric. Um, emerging research is showing that more and more young people are using TikTok for search. How are you taking that into consideration in trust and safety with ranking of content a user is provided with their search, especially with mis disinformation in the upcoming election? And then off of that, you guys recently rolled out your new election center, which automatically tags election related videos and redirects to a source of truth, which TikTok has put together and includes government sources that are validated. Have you considered having the election center show up in the landing page of the search when someone searches for an election-related term? No, those, those are really great questions. So um, to your point, on uh, for folks that don't know, we have an elections hub on our product. So uh, for election-related terms like midterms, hashtag election, et cetera, our whole perspective is to make sure when you are searching for those things, you're getting authoritative information from authoritative sources. Um, and depending on who you are and what background you're coming from there, or what state you're in, you're getting that local resource there. So we want to make sure that we're providing uh, for that. I think to your, to your second question around like possibly making that more, more ubiquitous across platforms, uh, we work very closely with our product teams around like what is the right barrier, or not barrier, but entry point for folks and when they're the most likely going to look at it. Um, I don't have the, the research data top of mind internally, but I think there was, um, anecdotally, I oftentimes hear is like when you're too inundated by it, you're not actually going to engage with it, right? So how do you find places where people are actually, oh, there it is, here's a hashtag, midterms, elections, I'm going to go look for it. I think uh, the, the former part of your, your question in terms of just obviously, or, or just a broader idea of search, um, that's something I'm glad you brought up because not a lot of people actually bring up search as an entry point. Um, and we're hearing not just uh, our, our, our younger users, but just, in, I mean, my mom is now using TikTok for gardening videos, right? <laughs> just like, why is that? And I garden a lot too. But like, why, am I, why is my zone not show, showcasing the tomatoes I want? So we're very highly cognizant of that as well. I think from a trust and safety perspective, uh, and you can see this quite a bit, which is, for those high harm uh, se sever severity issues like violent extremism or mm -hmm. hate, if you right now search QAnon or 3 percenter, we'd loop you back to the community guidelines, right? We were, I think, one of the first platforms that took very hard stances with high harm search results to say, not just for younger users, but for everyone to say, hey, this is not appropriate for a platform, we're gonna reduce a discoverability for that. But I think your, your question is a pertinent one in the sense of we recognize this evolution. As I mentioned, anytime you see an evolution of such, it is appropriate and responsible for us to make sure that we are uh, evolving with it. Um, do we have any questions on this side of the room? You go right there. Right, sorry. Um, hi, Linda Rattery. Um, I, you talked a little bit about what does or doesn't keep you up right now. What do you think is gonna keep you up in five years? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we did just talk about the open, like, open AI and Dolly. I mean, right now, right, yeah, what we're seeing, crazy. I'm mostly seeing really funny memes on Twitter on it, and um, it's always how it starts, though. Exactly right. So I think I don't know if Dave Warner is in here. Shout out to Dave, but him like <laughs> he said OpenAI, and him and I talk about like, hey, in 2024, we're already starting to have those conversations, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know how conceptually it's going to look like yet, but with any new technology, we want to just be prepared for that. Anyone else have their five-year keep you up at night? Yeah, that's probably the same. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, go back over here. We had still a lot of questions over here. Yeah? Okay. Uh, hi, Alex Lovett from Meta Research. I wanted to bring it back to this question of harm. Uh, because we're at a research conference, there's a really interesting empirical question here about if these types of video formats actually change the way in which we empirically measure harm. And so I'm wondering, 
uh, for all of you, how you've thought more about that? And are there specific ways in which that's potentially impacted how you also think about policy and enforcement? I think that's a really great question, and we have a lot of conversations about it internally. Um, our projects are structured a little bit less around like what is this, you know, going deep dives into technology, like into this technology right now. It's it's been a little bit more how is it used in the context of, for example, election, uh, election related misinformation, particularly around not the substance of the claims, not so and so said a bad thing on video, but more, um, are, you know, how is it used in, in the context of incitement or in manipulating people. Um, such that, and like using the example that I gave in the beginning of the, the Floyd video, you know, these kinds of um, creating a sense that um, creating a sense of outrage that sort of drives people to take action is is one of the areas that we've been looking at it again in the context of the election project that we're doing. So I don't know that we have really a um, a particularly sophisticated rubric on just here are all of the different ways in which this technology, you know, the, like harms that are going to fall out of this technology and this policy, but I'd be kind of curious to hear what TikTok has to say on that one. Yeah, I think, and we were speaking a little bit about this and how to redefine harm in general right now, yeah. not even thinking about long form, but I think um, in my mind, and we've talked about this with, with my team and uh, other stakeholders as well, is um, take live or long, long form video, for example, uh, it is more important for us to have more context now because when, you, when it used to just be 15 seconds, and you only had 15 seconds to express yourself in that way, it is a truncated way to get your message across. Now that is more long form, it is more important to look at other behavioral signals and as well as like who the person is, right? What networks they belong to, things like that. I think those are the, that's the type of research, both internally and externally, around um, uh, network effects and communities of folks that might typically promote things like violent extremism or mis and disinformation. So those are the type of things that we're looking for as um, to reduce that harm. Uh, we need more signals that are associated with it. All right, well, I think we're out of time. Uh, thank you guys for the questions. This is a great panel. Uh, we have the happy hour behind you, uh, <laughs> so yay. And then if you go around to the right outside, there's the poster session, some really cool stuff over there. Check that out if you haven't already. Uh, but uh, yeah, go enjoy happy hour. Thanks. Thank you.